So, good morning for the colleagues uh, in Italy. Uh, good afternoon for friends in India, and good evening for colleagues in uh, Australia. So, welcome everyone for the minimally invasive head and neck continued online medical education series, the module one, which is on transoral laser microsurgery. So, this uh, meeting today is the second session. So, we had a very uh, very good session on the 28th of June with some wonderful lectures and surgical videos. Today, the first part of the session, we'll have uh, surgical videos, how, do, how I do it from the experts from across the globe. And the second part, we'll have didactic lectures uh, pertaining to transoral laser microsurgery. This event is done in collaboration with Academy of Head and Neck Oncology of Karnataka, Chris O'Brien Lifehouse Cancer Center, Sydney, and HCG Academics. We would like to thank our international faculty from two continents, the pioneer laser surgeon, Professor Giorgio Peretti, Dr. Francesco, and Professor Cesar Piazza, who was part of our meeting last, on the, uh, last Sunday. From Australia, we have my mentors, Professor Karsten Palm and Professor Farooq Rifat uh, from Sydney, and a renowned laryngologist, uh, Professor Daniel Novakovic from Sydney. So this meeting would have, wouldn't be possible with a wonderful organizing team which we have. My senior colleagues, Professor Ravi Nair and Professor Vishal Rao, who are always there uh, to support and encourage in these kind of activities. My mentor, Karsten Palm. My colleagues, Dr. Anand Subhash, Dr. Shalini Thakur and Dr. Bargav. We also wish to acknowledge our academic partners, Journal of Precision Oncology, and GHA. Our association manager, CIM Global, Ms. Anita, Priya, and team. Before I go on to the uh, current meeting, I would like to invite everyone on behalf of the academia for the module two on robotic surgery. So in this meeting, we have uh, speakers from across the globe to, uh, so we have divided this uh, robotic surgery module into two sessions. That is uh, just keeping in mind the time zone in mind. That is morning 10 to 12 and evening between 6 to 8 on the 19th of July and on the 26th of July, the two consecutive Sundays. So the international speakers, uh, we have Professor Tay and Professor Ko from South Korea. Professor Halsinger, Professor Scott Magnuson, Professor Duveri from uh, USA, Professor Ofo and Professor uh, Vinit Paleri from UK, and Professor Raymond from Hong Kong. In addition, from Australia, we have Professor Suren Krishnan and Professor Jonathan Clark, and from Canada, we have got Prof uh, Dr. John D. Almedia. I would like to acknowledge uh, my colleague, good friend, Dr. S. Vidyadharan from Apollo Proton Cancer Center, Chennai, who had helped us in a great way to planning this event along with our current uh, organizing team. In addition, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Surendra Dabbas and Dr. Raju Sharan uh, from India, who also helped us a great way in planning this event. Just a word about Academy of Head Neck Oncology of Karnataka. It's an association of oncologists, including head and neck surgeon, or radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, and reconstructive surgeons who deal with head and neck. And this <coughs> academia has got a lot of opportunities for members. In terms of education, we have access to certified courses on basic suturing skills, some understanding about laser surgery, robotic surgery. We have got the nature online master course, also, it gives an internship opportunities and training opportunities at head and neck centers uh, across Karnataka for young uh, budding head and neck surgeons. We have online training materials, didactic lectures, and video, uh, videos such as these uh, accessible in our uh, website. We have got international fellow opportunities. We have got special discounts for members in uh, local head and neck meets and conferences. In addition, we got financial benefits in the form of loans uh, to procure surgical instruments and loops and so on. Uh, for fellowship also in terms of golf, if no scores, uh, we do give some financial assistance. In addition, it's a wonderful opportunity 
to collaborate with both national and international organizations and we will have uh, uh, the the members will get speaker opportunities in state and district meets so before i hand over to dr apurva to uh, introduce the speakers of the day i would like to introduce mr ramachandra who is the head of global healthcare academy our academic uh, partners who has about two decades of experience in skill and internship development and he will just briefly tell us about the uh, global uh, healthcare academy over to you mr ramchandra thank you dr akshay uh, good evening good morning good afternoon and good evening to all uh, gha has been uh, pioneered started with uh, by dr b s ajay kumar chairperson of hcg with a very strong vision to fulfill the gap between the uh, college education university education and industry requirements as you know uh, all over the world we are facing a shortage of healthcare professionals across the cadres not only doctors but also nurses paramedics and so many in the value chain so we have uh, we are working towards fulfilling this gap so we do while on one hand we associate with uh, associations like ah and okay and do this uh, continuing medical education and all we also uh, are into paramedical training allied healthcare workers and i would take this opportunity to thank uh, ah and okay for giving this opportunity and just in 2 minutes i'll tell you about a unique program we have launched uh, since the pandemic and even before that there's a lot of negativity about joining hospitals getting uh, infected and putting your life at risk so we call upon doctors in india to mentor uh, you know people from uh, school background or college dropouts and encourage them to join this healthcare and uh, help them to uh, qualify in our courses and become paramedical allied healthcare nurses and so on so today we need a lot of motivation to get the young people into this sector and make them understand that this is a noble profession you will be serving people and also making a wonderful career and dispel this negativity so while we all continue to upgrade our skills and learn new uh, knowledge acquire new knowledge i also uh, take this opportunity to appeal to you all to encourage youngsters and directors to us and we will counsel them and try to get more people into this like you know in this pandemic india is facing shortage of even uh, people in the ambulances paramedics emergency technicians so we are desperately trying to respond to this challenge thank you for giving this opportunity and we look to a wonderful partnership with the hno okay. thank you over to you doctor yeah yeah so <clears throat> good morning good afternoon and uh, good evening to uh, uh, all the uh, doctors on uh, board now so i am dr apurva and i am a fellow in head and neck onco surgery in uh, department of hcg bangalore so i would like to start off by introducing our speakers for today so uh, <clears throat> dr deepak pare dr deepak pare has over 35 years of experience in surgical oncology and he has been the chairman of the medical board of uh, bombay city ambulance college he has special interests in uh, applications of laser surgery and photodynamic laser therapy in both early and advanced head and neck tumors uh, especially in the larynx he is also an active teacher in uh, the field of surgical oncology over the past 27 years he has uh, numerous uh, publications and uh, he is an invited speaker in more than 100 national and international conferences and he has received fellowship awards of many national and international societies and he is invited as a, a, a teaching faculty both in india and abroad in numerous laser op uh, operative workshops and training program coming to our next speaker professor giorgio piretti uh, he uh, was uh, sir was born in 1958 and is a full professor at the university of uh, genoa and uh, chief of the unit of otolaryngology head and neck surgery in ircs uh, hospital Poly <clears throat> policlino uh, san san martino genoa italy since december 2011 uh, coming to our next speaker of the day professor pratmesh pai Professor Pratmesh Pai is a professor and consultant surgeon, convener of Head and Neck Disease Management Group, Department of Head and Neck Surgical Oncology at Tata Memorial Centre, Mumbai, in India. Uh, our next speaker would be uh, Professor um, 
Farooq Rifat. Uh, he is a associate professor in clinical appointments at uh, Westmead Hospital, Nipian Hospital, and Chris O'Brien Lifehouse Cancer Center. Coming to our next speaker, Dr. Rakesh Srivastava. Dr. Rakesh Srivastava is a senior consultant laryngologist at Shushruth Institute of Plastic Surgery and Super Specialty Hospital at Lucknow. He is performing transoral laser surgeries and airway surgeries for the past 15 years. His main areas of interest are transoral laser surgery for malignancy of larynx and endoscopic or open airway reconstruction. Coming to our next speaker, Professor Karsten Palm. Professor Karsten Palm is Director of Head and Neck Surgery at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse Cancer Center and Clinic Professor in the University of Sydney. Um, he holds a, a clinic appointments at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and Westmead Hospital at Sydney. Our next speaker is Dr. Shamit Chopra. Dr. Shamit Chopra is a fellow American Head and Neck uh, uh, Society 2016, Chief of the Department of Head and Neck Surgery in Oral Cancer, Post Laryngectomy Rehabilitation, Microvascular Reconstruction, Transoral Robotic Surgery, and these are his uh, various areas of interest. Also, uh, he uh, uh, does a lot of research work in uh, remote access thyroid surgery, transoral laser microsurgery. Our next speaker for the day is uh, Dr. Devendra Chokar. Dr. Devendra Chokar is a professor and uh, uh, head of the Department of Surgical Oncology Services at Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai and in India. And uh, this is a, a advanced center for treatment, research and education uh, for cancer in India. And right now the Institute has expanded uh, across various centers in our uh, country like Vizag, Chandigarh, Sangdur, uh, etc. in addition to uh, the services at Mumbai. And uh, there has been a lot of activity apart from this, even at Peril as well, towards uh, their mission of providing the best cancer uh, center to all those who seek treatment at their hospital. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Deepak Balsubramaniam. Dr. Deepak Balsubramaniam currently serves as clinical associate professor in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery and Oncology. He completed his MBBS from Madras Medical College and uh, subsequently he did his uh, otolaryngology head and neck surgery training at Jipmer in Pondicherry. Following this residency, he undertook a three-year uh, subspecialty training in head and neck oncology, uh, which led to his MCH degree. He then completed a one-year advanced fellowship of head and neck reconstructive surgery at Sydney Head and Neck Cancer Institute, Australia, under Professor Jonathan Clark. After his fellowship, he returned to India and joined as a faculty in Amrita Hospital in 2014. Coming to our next speaker, Professor Daniel uh, Novakovic. Dr. Daniel Novakovic is an Australian trained ENT surgeon with international subspecialty training in the fields of laryngology, neurolaryngology and care of the uh, professional voice. He is head of the ENT department at Canterbury Hospital, Sydney, local health district and appointed as Associate Professor at Central Clinical School and Director of Dr. Liang Voice Program, Faculty of Medicine and Health University of Sydney. So we welcome all our uh, speakers and I now hand over to Dr. Anand Subhaj to further moderate the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Apurva. Thank you for introducing uh, all the speakers. Um, uh, very warm welcome uh, from me to all the participants and the faculty. So we would be starting uh, with the video surgical video session and uh, each session will be followed by a short uh, question and answer session uh, where we will be taking up the key questions and the later questions would be followed up with respective sessions as we proceed through the uh, you know, webinar. To start off, uh, I call, on, uh, call upon uh, Professor D.M. Parikh from the Asian Cancer Institute uh, to present videos on uh, the types of cordectomy, he would be covering the type 1 to type 3 cordectomies. Sir, over to you. Thank you for all the introduction and thank you for inviting me for this session. I think it's something new, a challenge of how to run a laser workshop and that to an operative one with videos on Zoom or any such application. So basically, what are the things that we need to look at as in when you consider getting onto lasers in vocal cord or in the larynx. I think the physics of the lasers has been covered adequately in the first session last Sunday. And so also certain areas like the instrumentation, but I'll just bring in the practical points and the practical implications of one, what one has to do. I think one of the most important parts, whenever you contemplate any conservative surgery or a trans-oral laser surgery, trans-laser 
surgeries is the clinical evaluation. I think this is one of the most important things which is very often missed and I shall elaborate a little on that. The investigative pitfalls that one faces when one undertakes this kind of surgery, the special instrumentation, briefly I shall mention, and more in detail of course is the surgical nuances that one has to understand when one is doing this kind of a surgical procedure. I think this is something which is very common used in most of the head neck OPDs anywhere across the world is the Hopkins telescope, whether it's a zero, 30 or a 70 degree. And of course the direct laryngoscope and attached and seen through with a microscope to give a better magnification. I think another additional point which one needs to look at is the fiber optic laryngoscopy, which is very often missed. Especially when you're considering the type one, type two type of chordectomies which is usually very, very small tumors. This assessment is something which is paramount. As you can see over here, one can never assess by any other method the cord mobility in its true sense. You can see the phonation gap here. You can see the lateral margin, which will not be picked up on any CT, MRI, or PET, any radiological testing. So it's important that this endoscopic procedure is done by the surgeon who is going to operate. I think... This is very, very essential and not rely on others. The other point that needs to be seen is the extension of the tumor in a little largest tumor like this is in the subglottic region going into the glottis over here at the free margin or actually at the anterior commissure level. And the best method to do that is by putting your fiber optic laryngoscope through the indoor, through the vocal cords into the trachea and just in the subglottic part of the trachea, as you withdraw, turning the scope upwards, you're able to see in this region as to whether the area is free of tumor or close to it. Here you can see it. It is just impinging, but the basic subglottic area is free. I think these are the important factors that we need to look at when one is contemplating any form of laser surgery. Another important instrument or tool, if I may call it, would be the vocal cord stroboscopic assessment and in which case, what one needs to see is the mobility of the vocal cord. Very well seen, the very, very stagnant cord, and obviously there's a tumor there. What does this tell us? This not only tells us about the mobility of the cord, but basically it gives a very good clue as to the type of chordectomy you're going to land up doing. Because based on this mobility, whether the just the mucosa is going to be excised, the epithelium or the ligament, or are you going to go deeper into the muscle? This becomes very important because this is something the speech therapist has to get involved from the beginning, counsel the patient about the quality of voice he or she is going to have at the end of the surgical procedure. So just the other assessment that requires and can be done is when one actually contemplates and does a microlaryngeal surgery, a microlaryngeal evaluation under anesthesia. A zero degree telescope as very well described in last Sunday's meeting through the suspension laryngoscopes gives a very good clear picture. In addition, it also gives us good photographic material for presentations and for record. But what is more important to be seen at that point is by taking any small instrument, microlaryngeal instrument to assess the mucosal involvement, the submucosal involvement or the muscular involvement. And this is done by using the tumor, using the instrument to move the tumor on the patient's vocal cord. How easily it moves, how in both directions, that is medial to lateral, lateral to medial, anterior to posterior, gives a good assessment of the involvement. And again, by everting the cord. And one of the simplest methods of everting the cord is to put your fine instrument like a fine tip suction or even a cord retractor into the lateral sinus of the vocal cord, push it downwards, it automatically everts the cord out and you're able to see the undersurface of the cord. This is of course what the main topic is for today. Of course there is a type 5 even which is very extensive but my domain has been today to talk on type 1, 2 and 3. And what is the description is subepithelial is type 1, ligamental is type 2 and transmuscular is type 3. So just for my junior colleagues, whoever are attending, this in this case, only the epithelium is removed. In the type two, it's the epithelium, Renke space, and the vocal ligament, partly or superficially. 
and transmuscular when all this in addition to a part of the vocalis muscle is excised. Instruments which has been again elaborated last Sunday, but just suffice to say, I think one of the two or the two most important parts is understanding the microscope and your instruments. You have a number of instruments available, which with the turning of these screws give a distension of the tips of the endoscope or the tips or at the base of the laryngoscope to give more excess and more field operators. I think one of the most important fallacies which happens and which I've seen people struggle when they start with laser surgery is to understand again, which was talked about last time, is that the laser CO2 laser beam goes in a very straight direction. There is no deviation of it. So when you are aligning your microscope to the target tissue of the vocal cord, and especially when you're talking of type one and type two excisions, you have to be sure that that alignment is perfect. Some of the tricks that I have learned is quite a few of the microscopes have a kind of an aperture by which you can is, uh, increase the diameter of the light or decrease it. Best is to decrease it to the point of the, to the width of your opening that you see. Secondly, the intensity has to be kept at about two thirds or three fourths of the part of the microscope, whichever one you're using, and to keep it in a zoomed out manner. When you have done that and adjusted the microscope, then gradually zoom in to see that in both the angles, whether it's zoomed in or zoomed out, you get the same focusing and you get the same intensity of light. This invariably means you have aligned it properly so that when your laser beam hits the target tissue, it is at right angles to it. So now coming to the type one type of cordectomy. Oh, sorry. So this is a cord lesion that you will see hardly discernible on a superficial examination. But now when you see it on the magnification under the microscope, you can make out the difference in the cord, which is on the left anterior half versus the right. So the first thing that is done is you mark out the line of excision. And what is the reason for this? Remember, if you cut and you have not marked it out, when you start the actual excision, the mucosa tends to start contracting. And then getting the free margins becomes a difficult proposition. The usual point is to do the excision from above, from below up. And the reason is very common sense, nothing technical about it. In case there's a spurter or a bleeder, or if the tissue is edematous, the fluid that will keep dripping down is going to moisten this field. And when it moisten this field, the CO2 laser stops working. So to make the operation easier for you and to get a clear view, it's best to start having marked out the entire excision margin to start from down. In any head neck surgery, we are always taught traction and counter traction. So here, when you're cutting, you need the counter traction to pull the mucosa up. As you can see, it's being done with a fine suction tip or a very fine instrument. Preferable, I prefer taking the suction tip because that causes less trauma on the margin, giving the pathologist the near normal mucosa on which he or she can comment. As you progress, make sure that you're in the same plane. Keep checking on the medial. This is the most important part. If I can just go back a little. Yeah. This is the most important part to notice because what happens is as you lift this tissue up, your excised tissue up, you tend to miss out on the lateral, on the medial margin, the free margin of the cord. And when that happens, there's bound to be raggedness at this margin, or you might go into the subglottic because of the traction that you apply. So this part of the excision, the free margin of the cord should also be marked out. And as you proceed, you keep twisting and turning the specimen to be able to be, to make sure that you're not over exceeding that margin. As, a, as you can see, it's go on doing that. And as you excise, then you come to the top part of it. And then the full excision is done. This is a defocus mode. Some of the bleeding spots which you feel might get a problem are coagulated, in which you defocus the microscope a little and you're able to do it. So this is a complete excision that is done. The tissue can be sent for frozen section if you are worried about the margins. But I, as a rule for the T type one, don't send it. And this is the results that you see. 
wherein there's a minimal phonation gap, but at five years, this is a complete fixation. Good speech therapy will rectify the defect that is seen over here. Coming to the next, this is a, in the same patient is a type two and a type three excision on the two sides because it was a bilateral cord lesion. And as you will see here again, the tissue is marked. What I have started doing is to get the margins, which the pathologists always crib about that when they get the block of tissue, they do not know which is the superior or inferior margin. I tend to make the superior margin a little more thicker as you see over here so that they have an idea that this is the more charred margin that they will get. Again, as I mentioned, you mark out the margin using a forceps of fine microlaryngeal forceps. You go from superior to lateral over here, I'm going just to show a difference in how it can be done. And you can see a little bit of tissue edema that comes out. This will be the problem if there is more, but you continue lifting it up and doing it. The only reason when you can, when you land up doing such a case where you have to do it from the anterior margin is when the lesion is very close to the anterior commissure. Because remember when you're doing it from inferior and going up and you come to the anterior commissure last, it tends to retract the whole specimen right up into the anterior commissure and might even go out of your field of view or laryngoscopy setting you have done. So at this point, I would excise this. As you can see, I've excised, cut it off. So I've got my anterior commissure area uh, close to that totally free. And I continued dissecting it out. The tissue, here you can see the edema and you can see. Now, one of the most important things in laser to understand is that there is no feel of your cut. Conventional surgeries, you have a knife, scissors, by which you feel the tissue. Here, it's totally on vision. As you visualize, you get the feel, you see how the tissue is peeling off from the base of your excision, gives you a good indication. That's the posterior margin that is marked out. So I'm approaching the posterior margin. And again, as you keep going down, you come to the posterior margin, you excise and peel it. Now here you have to confirm the medial margin. So here again, having lifted it, turn your forceps completely over onto the other side over here, as you'll see me doing shortly to see and make sure there and make sure that this, the tumor part is well encompassed with a good clear margin, a two to three millimeter margin adequate for microlaryngeal. And as I've already made the medial cuts over here earlier, I'm able to peel off the tissue over it part of the vo vocalist ligament can be seen over here and you continue moving upwards and excising the entire specimen. The CO2 laser, as we all know, does not work with fluids or blood. So hypotensive anesthesia, if it's feasible by the anesthetist, cotinoids of course are kept for prevention and protecting the Wet cotinoids are kept for protecting the cuff of the endotracheal tube, although you might have a fire. Remember the endotracheal tubes are laser fire resistant. They're not fire proof. So you have to still take precautions and make sure your temperatures within do not rise. Wet cotinoids kept over here. Methylene blue is injected in the cuff to warn you in case the cuff gives way. And the plume that you see has to be continuously sucked with filter vacuum. The regular vacuum usually should not be used because that will cause choking of the micro precipitates in the central system and your hospital vacuum system will eventually shut down. So here with the adequate margins, I'm able to excise it. The excision continues. And as you notice, the way it is peeling off gives a good indication that you have got a good clear zone with no tumor and the tumor is all within this specimen with a good amount of base of excision, even showing a free normal tissue. That's, that's the last bit. That's all. This same patient, as you can see, I'm everting. This is what I meant by everting the cord, you can see, which can also be done externally by your assistant, the third hand, as he presses at the larynx, he's able to evert the cord. But that does cause a movement of your entire laryngoscopy situation. 
This was a little thicker, deeper tissue. So here we had to do a type two resection. Again, marking out the excision. Line of excision is marked out. And as you proceed, going to the base and excising it. You are having excised the base. I'm lifting up the entire tissue. As you can see, a part of the vocalis muscle is also being cut and the entire tumor is removed. So here, if you will notice, the depth of excision is much more than what you saw on the left vocal cord, which I'll show you towards the end. Important point here is to put your dripping wet patties clear of all the carbon tissue, carbon areas that might be there, the charred areas, because there is a potential of these causing granulomas down the line. So although you might have excised the tumor, you land up with a laryngeal vocal cord granuloma, which in turn will cause bad scarring, bad healing, voice quality will reduce. And even if a granuloma itself forms, you might have to go down a second time to excise it. So what has changed over the last 30 years since I started lasers in 85? The balance was, the cure was up and the voice didn't matter. Today that no longer holds, both have to be balanced equally. So appropriate treatment methods have to be chosen so that in curing the patient, not only his voice is retained, but the quality of voice is also attempted at the maximum levels. In summation, what have we learned with lasers and what has changed in the physician's or the consultant's mind when doing it? Remember, you have to relearn your anatomy. All through our medical colleges, especially from first MBBS, we learned our anatomy that we had to take an incision outside and we learned the layers of the neck going up to your vocal cord. Here, your incision is the other way around. You're incising exactly on the mucosa and working your way backwards when you do a supraglottic or so. Again, open surgery, it's like a book which is wide open. In larynx, with laser surgery, it's a partial exposure. You are exposing partly and within which you have to work. The, there are no anatomical boundaries. These have been created. Like if you take the whole larynx and supraglottic region, you have the epiglottis, the glottis, the uh, periform fossa. But remember, the cancer goes in squamous carcinoma. It is a squamous epithelium. So when you take, undertake larger tumors, it transcends all these boundaries and your treatment changes depending on the nodal status. As far as lasers is concerned, it's not so much the T size as is defined in, in the AGCC classification, but what is more important is the third dimension of the tumor and the location of the tumor, especially for the vocal cord. A small lesion in the anterior commissure can be very difficult to do with laser versus a three times or four times lesion in the mid cord, which is easily exposed. And that's where the anatomical deterrence come for the laryngeal exposure. So which I think was also talked about in detail last Sunday, the teeth structure, the mouth opening, the position of the larynx, the approach to the larynx, how narrow is it? All this will determine as to how easily a laser surgery can be performed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for the uh, wonderful video session. Now, uh, we have a question. So uh, how do you, so uh, generally uh, we say that the margin should be about one to two millimeter. So how do you uh, make this, you know, margin? How do you measure the margin when you're working under the microscope? And, uh, and right. what so happens when you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The learning curve is always there, of course. But when I started, what I used to do was I used to mark it on a piece of paper, the tumor, measure the one or two millimeters and see under the microscope what that distance meant. So with that same setting, then you know exactly what you're dealing with when you're doing it live on the patient. Right. 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 Did yeah. I understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sir, also you uh, uh, did show up videos on type 1, type 2, type 3. Where would you choo choose uh, which particular type of cordectomy? How do you determine what are the factors that you look in at the tumor? So, so that, that is what I said, mentioned when I said about the assessment, clinical assessment. 
today, today's times, I have got patients coming straight with CT scans, MRIs, or PET scans. And the first thing I do is I put that aside. I just don't look at it. Don't bias your mind with those scans. Put in a Hopkins in your ENT OPD, fiber optic laryngoscopy if you have one over there. Assess the patient properly yourself. I think that is of paramount importance. At certain difficult cases, you might have to assess on the table under anesthesia, as I mentioned, in the mobility of the lesion over the muscle, or is it easily movable? You assess that, and you're able to judge as to whether it's going to be a type 1, type 2, or a type 3. It's only the type 4 where you're doing a radical. It doesn't really matter, because there, there you will need the assessment of the radiological to know the paraglottic spread, etc. Right, sir. Uh, also, uh, so just adding to a point, like what we do at our center when it comes to the measurement uh, is that we use the aiming beam as well to calculate the rough distance of about setting it at 1.5 millimeters and uh, 2 millimeters to mark a rough idea, as you said, and then they assess it when change the aiming beam to see the distance to measure it as well. Right, right. Uh, Sir, for anterior commissures tumor, how do you decide uh, which extent is sufficient? Say, for example, when you do an extensive type 5A type, where do you stop? Sir? So that was a question. Yeah. Uh, if I mistake not, there is somebody else talking on that. If I mistake not, I don't mind answering. Maybe I'll come. I'll come when that session is on. Right, sir. Sure. Yeah, because it, I don't know what he's talking on. I might uh, preempt his lecture. Right, right, sir. Okay, um, so, so we then move on to the next video. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so next, uh, we have uh, Professor Peretti uh, speaking on uh, TLM for uh, hypopharyngeal tumors. Uh, Professor Peretti, over to you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me and uh, give me the possibility to share uh, with you the experience, my experience uh, uh, and uh, of my team about uh, this kind of surgery. When we are dealing uh, with uh, piriform sinus uh, uh, cancer, the, the key of success uh, is the selection of the patient. So uh, when you decide uh, to, to employ TLM, uh, of course, uh, you have to limit the, the, the indication to early stage cancer uh, without uh, impairment uh, or fixation of the arytenoid. So we have to focus on, on uh, superficial lesion without uh, uh, deep invasion. This is a case, uh, T2 uh, cancer uh, for superficial spreading without the fixation of the arytenoid. The lesion involved the medial um, uh, wall of the piriform sinus without extension to the uh, um, uh, cricoarytenoid muscle. Uh, as you can see in the beginning, you have to outline uh, the lesion extending to the lateral wall of the piriform sinus, they do they do dating the cartilage, as you can see here, the thyroid cartilage, and you stay in the superchondrial plane just to have a wider margin of the resection. Here you uh, remove uh, the mucosa of the middle wall, taking care to uh, spare the muscle in the deep layer to avoid uh, any fibrosis, uh, iatrogenic fibrosis uh, of the uh, um, uh, lateral cricoarytenoid muscle. In this case, I prefer to cut in the middle the lesion just to control the inferior extension toward the apex of the uh, lesion. So sometimes uh, I prefer to use, as in this case, the transtumoral trans uh, approach. As you can see, you can see some char due to the uh, tumoral tissue. And in this way, I can control very well the, the superior margin 
leaving the inferior part for a second stage, as you can see in the very soon. So my first goal is to have a wide margin in the superior part. Now you can see I removed the upper part and now I try to control the inferior margin of the lesion. You can see I leave a wide margin because uh, we are facing with a piriform sinus tumor is not uh, as in larynx. So the lateral limit is the wall of the thyroid cartilage. I, I reach the apex of the piriform sinus in the inferior part. I denudate it uh, all the, the muscle. It's important to, to keep in mind that uh, this is the branch of the uh, superior laryngeal artery. Uh, at the, in this point, uh, there is uh, also some branch for the inferior laryngeal uh, um, artery. So when you uh, you are treating uh, a piriform sinus, uh, the bleeding uh, is not always uh, easy to control with the laser CO2 laser, because as you know. Uh, the CO laser have the possibility just to coagulate a vessel with a diameter um, less than 0 0.5 millimeter. So you need a bipolar or monopolar just to control the bleeding in this case. You can see here the, the uh, lateral wall completely denudate and the um, medial wall. And now I take other adjunctive uh, uh, margin just to, to, uh, to be safe because, uh, of course, in the piriform sinus, uh, you need a wide margin to avoid any adjunctive therapy in this case. So the goal is to, to have a unimodal treatment uh, at mean uh, just for the T. Uh, if you have a node metastasis, is another toe. In any case, uh, you can see the tube, you can see the arytenoid. So I, I make a wider resection in the anterior part just to, to be safe. In this case, I use a, a very, very low power, no more than three watts in uh, ultra pulse, uh, another example of bleeding due to the, the vessel with diameter more than 0 0.5 millimeters. And this is the final results. The, the, and then I, I move it to the another case. Okay, this is another case. No, first okay. okay, now this is the control after uh, two years and a half. Of course, the piriform sinus uh, is uh, obliterated from the scar tissue and the, the arytenoid is uh, a little... Okay. Okay. Uh, a new idea how to treat uh, some uh, some uh, selected cases. Uh, in this case, we don't use uh, the microscope, but we use an uh, azoscope, and uh, we can uh, uh, make uh, a kind of mixed surgery between TLM and TORT. Uh, it's important to, to fix that uh, we use the same uh, suspension system and uh, we have a tower 3D 4K screen and uh, a new conception of older than fix the, and, uh, the azoscope in the right position. And uh, we have uh, the possibility also to use a, a zero or 30 degree 3D endoscope in the special cases. 
This is the setting, and you can see the surgeon can, uh, can see very well in detail uh, the, the glottis, the larynx. This is the older, this is a prototype uh, just to adjust uh, the direction of the older, and it's important to, to note that the older is uh, coupled with the macro, micro um, uh, manipulator. So you can uh, use uh, with the isoscope uh, the, the CO2 laser, or in selected cases, a fiber laser. This is some detail about the prototype. This is the micro manipulator coupled with the azoscope. And this is another detail of the prototype and the holder just to fix the, the azoscope outside the larynx. And this is the setting, and you can see I can make the operation without the microscope, and we can perform a forehand. Uh, surgery, your assistant can help you and can follow the, uh, the operation in the same wave uh, with uh, uh, 3D glasses. And in this case, uh, I use a CO2 laser, as uh, you can see, because the micro manipulator is fixed to the, the azoscope. And in these cases, uh, with the same setting, I can use uh, the endoscope and the fiber uh, diode tulial laser. So two possibility with the same setting. This uh, may uh, give us uh, many advantages. Uh, first of all, uh, no microscope uh, encumbrance. We have a very good opportunity for didactic purposes. You have a better visualization, uh, very higher definition. You can uh, work with uh, 4K and 3D, so you don't lose the three-dimensional aspect of the, uh, the procedure. And uh, very important, uh, that your assistant is very active uh, position in the procedure and uh, can uh, help you in very active uh, way. This is very uh, interesting cases is a transoral partial op, uh, hypopharyngectomy with uh, a fiber diode tulio laser and uh, azoscope. This is a synov synovial sarcoma uh, involving uh, the uh, parapharyngeal space with this uh, submucosal bulging of the uh, left uh, wall of the hypopharynx. There is uh, some impairment uh, due to the mass uh, of the lesion of the arytenoid, but uh, the arytenoid is still mobile. Sempre qua. Another screen. This is the imaging showing uh, the, the lesion involving uh, the, the lateral wall and the paralaryngeal pharyngeal tissue in very close uh, uh, relationship with the vessel of the uh, neck. This is the uh, coronal vision and then is the sagittal uh, visualization. This is the operation. So I use the in a laryngoscope, B valve laryngoscope that allow you to have a very good visualization. And you can see with the diode laser, I can control much better the bleeding because in this area, the vessels are not are wider than 0 0.5 millimeters. So I can dissect uh, the lesion uh, from the, uh, the, again, uh, from the piriform sinus and uh, uh, from the cartilage of the thyroid, uh, you can see here, okay. Uh, with the dial laser, I, I try to dissect uh, without bleeding the lesion. You have to remember that this lesion is very close to the vessel of the neck. 
jugular vein and carotid artery. So I removed the first part. Then still remain some uh, uh, part of the tumor here that I grasp again. And I push medially just to, to find the, the, the plane between the vessel and the lesion. And very carefully, I dissect it with the laser, the lesion again from the arytenoid and from the constrictor muscle on the left. Okay, this is the last part. You can see the muscle here. And of course, I, I suture the mucosa just to protect the vessel and to avoid any leakage uh, between the neck and the hypopharynx. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Peretti. So we have three questions. Uh, so firstly, uh, what is the choice of your laryngoscope for exposure uh, when you attempt uh, transferral laser microsurgeries with the hypopharynx? For hypopharynx, uh, I prefer to use uh, usually any uh, laryngoscope that is the, the Lidom laryngoscope modified by Dr. Rini from the Mayo Clinic that uh, give uh, you the possibility to make a wider opening because a B valve um, a laryngoscope. So you can uh, uh, make a good exposure uh, of the hypopharynx uh, with a good control of the lateral and medial wall, even the posterior wall of the uh, hypopharynx. So, so in a, a it's easier to have a, a good exposure with a, a piriform sinus compared to the larynx because when you are working on the larynx, you are obliged to use a, a narrow laryngoscope because you have to expose the anterior commissure on the posterior paraglottic space. By contrast, when you, you face with a piriform sinus, you have a wider field, so you can use also wider laryngoscope and make you more possibility to control all the margin of the lesion. So definitely the wider laryngoscope you have is better to control the hypopharynx. But of course you have to face with the anatomical structure of the patient so again, the exposure is the key of the success to treat this kind of patient. So uh, do you consider addressing the neck uh, at the same setting or do you wait uh, or do you do it before and then do the primary? How, how, do, you, uh, how do you proceed addressing uh, the neck? Usually in piriform sinus, I make a simultaneous treatment of the neck for sure. If you have a N positive, but even if you have a N negative, I prefer to make in the same procedure, even the neck dissection. Just to have a final, final histology uh, for deciding if you need some adjunctive therapy uh, for a, a problem related to the neck or for a, uh, risk factor that you can find uh, in the osteological report. And of course, the main goal is to have a wider resection of the T, just to avoid the need to chemo radiation for positive margin. Uh, also, so what is the margin that you aim at, uh, mucosal margin and uh, the margin at the depth? three-dimensional margin? Uh, for hypo hypopharynx, you have to, to reach the wider margin you can. So 
at the least uh, four or five millimeters. This is the reason because uh, I, as I show you, I take a jumping margin after the resection. Uh, talking about superficial margin. About the deep margin, you have to select cases with a superficial spreading without uh, uh, infiltration of the muscle, of the cricoid, or again of the cricoarytrone joint. Uh, so you, you, you reach the, the perichondrium of the uh, lateral wall of the piriform sinus, uh, reaching the superchondria plane of the thyroid cartilage. And uh, in the medial aspect, uh, you have to denudate completely the uh, um, cricoarytenoid lateral uh, LPC, uh, lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, and uh, sometimes a part of the arytenoid, but uh, without uh, violating the uh, muscular process. Uh, also, uh, why do you use a diode laser for oropharynx and supraglottis? Is it because it has better the hemodynamic control and better control at the depth? Yes, uh, I started to use this the kind of laser for uh, base of the tongue and uh, sometime for uh, supraglottic laryngectomy. The, the, the main indication for the torso, I mean, because uh, you can have uh, much better control uh, compared to the CO2 laser. I reserve a CO2 laser for a small lesion, superficial lesion, of course, for the larynx uh, where uh, uh, the CO2 laser is the laser of choice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Peretti. Uh, uh, we would uh, now move on to the next uh, video that is CLM for supraglottic lesions. Uh, um, and I call on uh, Professor Pratmesh Pai to take it forward from here. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Anand, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm just now making it full screen. Yeah. So the following with up uh, with uh, the hypopharyngeal cancers, the similar kind of concept is there for supraglottic cancers. We need wider margins in comparison to the glottic cancers, and we need to have a good control on the bleeding. So what are the indications for uh, malignancy of the supraglottis? So we would involve uh, the transoral laser surgery for resecting lesions like T1 involving a single cord, a single site with cords mobile. Uh, they would preferentially be the marginal zone cancers. So you can see this beautiful image from the Ken Hub. And you can see that this forms the marginal zone. And this is very common in our country and in the Indian subcontinent because of the predominant chewing habit of tobacco along with alcohol. So you would have the pharyngoepiglottic fold, the aeriepiglottic fold, the free border of the epiglottis. These are the lesions that we will come across. In a T2 lesion, it would involve preferentially one of the supraglottic structures along with or without the glottic, stru glottic structures. And you might have some infrahyoid epiglottic lesions which involve the preepiglottic space, which are amenable to a transoral laser resection. Preferentially, you should have cords mobile in these cases. Now, when we say amenable for conservation surgery, it has to be anatomically amenable as well as medically. So we have to select out, and this paper from Heinemann beautifully pointed out how they divided these cases into three groups. One which was suitable for the conservation surgery, one which was suitable anatomically, but not medically suitable, wherein the patient's age would be higher or they would have a poor lung function because you might cause aspiration following your resection. 
and we as we heard in last week the anatomical unsuitability uh, by way of the position the teeth the cervical spine and in supraglottis preferentially if it is coming on to the arytenoid wherein you would resect the entire arytenoid or there is a gross preepiglottic space involvement or if there's a fixed cord involvement of the cricoarytenoid unit these are con uh, contraindications for a transverse laser surgery as professor peretti elegantly pointed out this has to be suitable for a single modality treatment it doesn't serve our purpose if you're going to resect it partly and then give radiation to mop up your disease now you have the primary site and you can see that suprahyoid infrahyoid false cord aryepiglottic fold arytenoid and pharyngoepiglottic fold the t1 t2 lesions have very good local control and the complications are very minimal now we need to focus on um, typing your uh, surgery and the european laryngology society has elegantly divided it into type four types the type one is a limited excision small size superficial lesions of the free edge of the epiglottis area epiglottic fold arytenoid or ventricular fold the type 2 is divided into type 2a where you do a superior hemiglottectomy without the preepiglottic space resection so it means removing the free border of the epiglottis above the level of the hyoid and the 2b where you remove the total epi epiglottis the type 3 is again divided into type 3a and b the medial supraglottic resection without ventricular fold and type 3b is with the ventricular fold so these are infrahyoid lesions wherein you would resect the preepiglottic space with or without the ventricular fold and the type 4 is a lateral supraglottic resection so now you have the lesions which form uh, come on to the ventricular fold coming on to the medial wall of the piriform or coming on to the arytenoid posteriorly so this is a lateral supraglottic laryngectomy a little bit about the equipment uh, because this is very important uh, when you do minimal access surgery your access has to be critical so we use the vida laryngoscope which gives us a distension of the blades and gives us a very good visualization of the supraglottic structures you can also use the sinus uh, distending laryngoscopes which have got another blade which actually covers the uh, sides and doesn't allow the tongue to fall in and what we use is these grasping forceps wherein you have a suction attached to it which actually aids in your extraction of the plume giving you a better visualization now critical in this is to control the bleeding and these suction um, coagulators are the ones the 2 mm and 3 mm are the ones that are critical so you need to have at least uh, two suctions one is your regular suction tip one is your suction coagulator and these have to be kept ready along along with your plume extractor now how do you go about it so we all follow the multi step resection or the sequential resection and and these are the steps which were described by professor steiner the valicular incision for the superior delineation followed by a sagittal splitting of the epiglottis in midline then the removal of both the halves of the suprahyoid epiglottis now you get a better visualization below and then you do a removal of the two infrahyoid parts and then removal of the preepiglottic compartment the fat pad if you have infrahyoid epiglottic involvement you should preferentially remove the complete preepiglottic fat because as you seen from various reports especially coming from zytel's group whenever you have the preepiglottic fat whenever the infrahyoid epiglottis is involved the preepiglottic fat is involved because of the natural uh, passages through the cartilage a little bit about the blood supply because this is very critical to your supraglottic resection this is a very elegant paper which all of you should read from piazza's group in milan 
wherein they did a, a whole organ uh, evaluation of injection of the vessels with dye and they went on to show how do you have the superior laryngeal artery which comes at the three uh, thyrohyoid membrane and then divides into the epiglottic artery the antero inferior artery which comes anteriorly and you have a posterior inferior artery now both of these vessels then join with the paracamisher branch of the cricothyroid which penetrates at the cricothyroid membrane so you can see how this entire two branches form a plexus around the supraglottis and remember the main diameter median diameter of these vessels is 1.4 to 1.6 mm which is more than our, what a laser can control so as you heard professor pereti mention you would need other adjunctive methods like either a clip or you require a suction coagulator to take care of these vessels so this is how you would see your endolaryngeal view and this is the vessel that is coming at the crico at the thyrohyoid membrane and as you can see this is the at the level of the aryepiglottic fold and the pharyngoepiglottic fold junction so as you are resecting the epiglottis remember you will come across these vessels and you should be prepared to tackle this so this is a type 1 uh, resection this is a very easy lesion which is a pedunculated growth arising on the free border of epiglottis you can see that the pharyngoepiglottic fold uh is completely free and you can get a good margin and after the section this is how you would get a very good control and a good healing following your section now coming to lesions which are bigger and coming on to the infrahyoid epiglottis so you can first do a complete endoscopic evaluation after intubation you need to focus on the valvula the pharyngoepiglottic fold the aryepiglottic fold and the pyriform and because you want to know where your margins are going to be also try and visualize how deep is the lesion has it involving the false cords coming on to the true cords and is there any uh, lesion coming downwards so you can see that this is a, a t1 lesion um is not involving is preferentially in the suprahyoid epiglottis the pharyngeal epiglottic fold is free so how do you proceed with this sorry yeah so once you have evaluated the lesion uh, i prefer to infiltrate with saline adrenaline and i will infiltrate at the pharyngoepiglottic fold and aryepiglottic fold junction so because i get a good understanding of the lesion i will be able to control the small capillaries and then instead of starting anteriorly i will start laterally because i would like to control the blood vessels first so you can cut the pharyngoepiglottic fold and as you divide it you will come across the vessels and you should be at this point ready with your uh, suction coagulators or the vascular clips that if you are using them in order to control the bleeding so we use a super pulse board and we use it in a continuous fashion and now with the advent of the acublate technology we have the acublate which gives us a better control on the depth of resection as well as it gives us an ability to cut the tissue in a faster faster plane so you you proceed with this tackle the vessels as they come along remember you get a warning hemorrhage and you can see the vessels well use a suction coagulator and achieve a good hemostasis and then proceed anteriorly towards the valvula delineate the valvula from the base tongue the more deeper you go anteriorly you will end up with a base tongue resection which is not required 
So you can see that you're getting a good complete exposure and now you're entering into the pre-epiglottic space. This has to be done on both the sides. As you can see, we are uh, attempting a R block resection here. If you feel diffident, it is not unsafe to do a complete bihalving of this lesion and removing it in two parts. So as you go on to the other side, the similar thing is done. You will control the bleeding. You can see that there was a hematoma formation due to our infiltration here. And once you have divided it and taken control of the blood vessel, the inferior resection becomes very easy. When you come across the transverse uh, communicating vessels at the critical thyroid, that's where you will see another spot of bleeding. But the major blood supply comes from the superior laryngeal artery, which can be controlled at this point while resecting the epiglottic fold and the pharyngoepiglottic fold junction. So that's it. Once you have taken care of the blood vessels, it is just a, a, a matter of time. It needs patience because you have a no-touch technique. You are dependent on a proper focus. At right angles, as uh, Professor Deepak Parikh mentioned, you need to go at right angles to the tissue for the laser to cut well. So all along, you will plod along, cut the tissue, um, and at, at, at the point when you are reached at the pharyngoepiglottic fold and epiglottic fold junction, you will then come on to the false cord. You can see now as you are this, uh, separating out the epiglottis from the valicular, you will come across the epiglottic fold in the, I mean the median glossed epiglottic fold. and that is entering the false cord area. And that's a complete resection. So you do again an examination, and then as uh, Professor Parik mentioned, use a wet cotton patty and clear all the carbon from this. So you can see that uh, when you compare the complications of radiotherapies, open supraglottic to transoral laser resection, the number of complications are extremely low in a transoral laser surgery. And when you look at what is the outcomes, this is a meta-analysis of early stage supraglottic lesions where they compared primary surgery to primary radiotherapy. So when you specifically look at disease specific mort mortality, it is very significantly lower in the surgery group. And when you look at the overall mortality, you again have it being lower in the surgery group. So this is not a small number of patients. There are over 2,500 patients in each of these groups. Thank you very much for the very patient listening. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question. Uh, so do you consider doing an elective tracheostomy after uh, such resection? And how do these patients do postoperatively? Uh, like there is a aspiration, are they on uh, NG feeds? Oh, how is it? Sir? So you would preferentially not do a tracheostomy because that defeats the very purpose of a transoral laser surgery. You want to get a good AV access. You want to keep your resection minimum. And you, ex you will be doing a, uh, a less morbid procedure because you're doing from mediate from midline laterally. You're not damaging the nerves. You're not damaging the ves large vessels. As I said, uh, your main concern of doing a tracheostomy is to if you're worried about bleeding. Now all these patients will go on a nasogastric tube, which will be kept for a few days, and once the patient is uh, uh, is having no bleed and has uh, the pain reduces, we will initiate the swallow with the uh, dietitians and it, we try to remove the nasogastric tube as soon as possible. So I do not consider an elective tracheostomy after this resection. 
Uh, sir, uh, say uh, in centers that have uh, both uh, the access to robotics as well as to laser, uh, when would you decide which would be uh, the better choice to address such lesions? Now, if you have both the choices, I would still consider doing a laser resection because you have a very precise control. Whether you use robotic or laser, you do not have a tactile feedback. So what I, I truly believe the only advantage of the TORS was a complete arm block resection. And as you can see with the transoral laser resection, you can do the same. You can control the vessels as well. And even in the TORS, you're going to use a hemostasis, hemostasis with the electrocautery. So if you are going to use the same devices and you're getting a similar access and a better visualization with the, with the microscope, I don't see any, why you should use a robotic uh, resection. The only advantage which is touted is the speed and the ability to control the bleeding. I don't think speed is of, of essence here, is of essence is to prevent the lateral thermal damage and the less you use these electrocautery devices, the lesser thermal damage you'll have. Yeah. Uh, so thank uh, you. Can, uh, can I just come in, come make a comment? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Pratamesh, a good video, well done. Uh, basically, I'd agree with you that I think the only probably advantage for a robotic would be is that you get the third dimensional, it's a 3D view that you get. So probably for those who are starting off, it's a little easier to learn and pick up on robotic rather than laser. And in the laser, the exposure is the main thing, which becomes a little differentiation from a robotic. Right. But at the end, when you compare it, and if you have done equally both cases, equal number of in both, you'll find the effects and the recovery process, the healing process with laser is far, far superior than robotic. Absolutely. Especially, sir. especially the swallowing and the, recovery of the patient, it becomes much, much quicker. I have uh, trained in robotic surgery at Tata Hospital. We have been doing it routinely. Right. And as we started doing it, of course, we were uh, like uh, uh, having a new toy at our disposal and we wanted to use it. And we realized that it was giving us a very good access. We were able to see better because it was binocular vision and magnification. Uh, but in microscope also we had the binocular vision, but the only difference was we didn't get that angulation. Right. Now, the advantage with the robot I feel was the ability to resect it faster. Because it, of course you're using a electrocautery device and you're cutting it. But then at the end of the surgery, when we realized the amount of charring that was there and the amount of uh, lateral damage that we encountered, we didn't feel it was any way comparable to the laser resection. And we found the laser resection so far, uh, so, so much better and so much cleaner. So I, I don't think there's any comparison. I think the best person to tell us would be the pathologist when they get the specimen. Absolutely. And they see the margins which are destroyed with robotic and which are not destroyed with laser. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, sir. Th thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh for the comments and uh, thank you, uh, Pfizer. Uh, we now move on to the next uh, surgical video session. So uh, this would be on uh, TLM for benign upper aerodigestive lesions and airway stenosis by uh, Associate Professor Farooq Rifat uh, from Australia. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Farooq. Thank you, thank you, Anand. Thank you, uh, Akshay, for inviting me again. Um, I won't repeat um, some of the stuff that we already covered last week. Uh, okay. All right. So, uh, you know, I have uh, the actual program had me speaking for 10 minutes on quite a big topic, which is basically benign lesions and airway stenosis. So to try and do it justice, I thought I'd quickly talk about without, um, I think uh, Professor Pai has covered some of these techniques and, and uh, Professor Parikh did the same, but I think you need to decide the anesthetic technique. We talked about this in our talk a week ago on multidisciplinary um, arrangements in laser surgery. So whatever anesthetic method you use, just make sure that both you and your anesthetist are familiar with it, uh, that 
it gives you adequate access to the lesion that you want to uh, that you're trying to get to and the anesthetic does not impede on your surgical technique for phonosurgery which is what uh, my talk is about for the next 10 minutes uh, this is none of that um heavy stuff that you've heard in the previous three talks. The previous three talks were all on malignant disease. The concept in managing malignancies, as Professor Parikh said, you do need to think about voice outcomes and, and more and more uh, our patients are focusing on it as uh, alternative options uh, aside from CO2 laser become available for them to treat their cancers. But in phonosurgery, which is what we're dealing with, these patients predominantly have a voice problem. And so what you don't want to do is leave them with the worst phonatory outcome. This is not about margins. Uh, this is not about cancer cure. These are uh, purely uh, phonological symptoms. So hydrodecept, uh, I use one in 80,000 adrenaline, which I, which I actually self-make uh, using a one is to eight dilution of one in 10,000 adrenaline. Try and preserve the mucosa. Uh, think about all the atraumatic techniques, the way you grasp the tissue, the way you insert your laryngoscope uh, in order to try and minimize secondary damage from your procedure itself. Always try and remember for each of these uh, uh, slides that I'm going to work through in the next few minutes, remember there are often conservative options, so you don't have to operate. I know that this is a surgical uh, seminar, and so we're all uh, showing operative videos, but unlike like the previous speakers, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you doesn't actually need surgery. So remember to consider non-surgical treatment options, but also non-laser treatment options. Once again, I know that this is a talk on uh, lasers and predominantly CO2 laser, as I told you last week. I uh, have very little experience with photoangiolytic lasers, but one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Daniel Novakovic, who's going to speak to you later on, uh, he has quite a lot of expertise in photoangiolytic lasers, but I use the CO2 routinely, but remember that for a lot of these lesions, you don't actually uh, need laser surgery at all. So um, we will work through the first one, which is a benign mucosal polyp. Now, I won't talk to you about the etiology of these lesions. A lot of this happened essentially from a combination of inflammation, which is multifactorial, uh, or trauma, which can be phonotrauma, intubation trauma. But, but we're not going to go through the specifics on the pathogenesis. We're going to focus on the surgery itself. So this is a focal cord polyp. It's classically unilateral uh, and, and often causes breathy dysphonia due to glottic insufficiency. You see some of the principles that you're going to see repeatedly. I use the triangulated atraumatic graspers. I insert a wet ribbon gauze on top of the cuff of the entretracheal tube, uh, and that's in order to keep the area nice and moist. And again, this is been emphasized to you earlier by Professor Parikh, you want to maintain moisture over the operative site. Um, and you can see these longitudinal vascular ectasias, which you commonly see in patients with uh, uh, phonotraumatic histories. And so grasp the lesion. I set the acupulse laser on superpulse continuous mode. I use a horizontal, uh, so a vertical beam, but sometimes I just use a microspot. I set it at about 1.5 to two uh, wattage, so very low wattage. And I just use a tap, let go, tap, let go, tap, let go, and reassess, maintaining, again, as the previous speakers mentioned to you, a constant traction, counter traction. You want to stay well away from the vocal ligament. You want to prevent a secondary sulcus formation. And you want to gently, gently peel off the mucosa at the point of attachment of this polyp. Um, and the treatment of vocal cord polyps are surgical. This is one of the phonosurgical lesions which are better managed with surgery because until you can you can improve mucosal glottic contact you'll not improve the voice regardless of how much voice therapy you give them slightly different to vocal cord nodules but again that's not the uh, purpose of this talk uh, Reinke's edema again another very common uh, uh, vocal cord lesion you often see this in um, in uh, heavy smokers results in a masculinization of the female voice. Here I've made a longitude, oh, sorry, hang on. 
um, so make a longitudinal incision over the uh, lateral surface of the cord, almost like raising a micro flap, suction out all the gelatinous debris uh, that's that's present within the mucosa or within within Reinke space. I mean, you see here uh, that once you do that you have quite a bit of redundant mucosa that's left over. And essentially the purpose of the laser here is just to trim the excess off. Now, again, you need to be open to non-laser techniques. I think in Reinke's edema, to be honest, the micro debrider is excellent uh, uh, and, and I've used it with good effect. I think cold steel excisions can be done and again, uh, will produce just as good an outcome. And nowadays, even the code later. So I've used all of them and I'm not sure if one is any superior to the other. The techniques are pretty much exactly the same. Um, uh, vocal cord nodules, I would advise you as much as possible not to operate. Um, a lot of these patients need voice therapy, uh, deconstriction for their muscle tension, uh, give them more voice therapy and really exhaust the non-surgical options before you consider surgery. This is predominantly a medical disease rather than a surgical disease. Um, but if you do have to operate on them, once again, remember that cold steel, micro debrider, coplater, or for this purpose, CO2 laser, photoangiolytic lasers, they pretty much, if you look at the literature, there is not much of a difference between one technique and the other. So hydrodissect, create the plane, uh, um, with the nodules itself, again, look, people talk about doing a micro flap, uh, getting submucosal, getting onto the hardened callus, which is what the nodule is. I think that's incredibly difficult, and I don't think that deals with the mucosal thickening uh, that you actually get on the uh, mucosal surface as well. This is essentially a form of hyperkeratosis. It's a callus on the vocal cords at the point of maximum friction. So a conservative, a very conservative mucosal excision uh, works as well. One of my uh, previous teachers uh, in London, Guri Sandhu, he actually does a technique where he essentially uh, aims the beam distally beyond the nodule and just tries to skim uh, or slice the nodule off the surface. Um, some people have used slightly defocused laser beams to, to uh, vaporize the lesion. Again, I think there's no one technique. I'm just showing you what uh, one of the ways of doing it are. Um, intracordal cysts, look, I think uh, laser in this is essentially a form of making a mucosal incision. Uh, with an intracordal cyst, as you see here, this is a sub-epithelial lesion. You do not want to disrupt the mucosa. So, so once you have infiltrated the, uh, in Reinke space, the only role I see of the CO2 laser here is to make your lateral microflap incision. Once you've made the microflap incision, grasp as atraumatically as possible onto the flap. And if you've blown up a nice uh, hydrodissected plane, uh, to be honest, these intracordal cysts should just uh, uh, roll out. Uh, you use a combination of spatulas and your alligator forceps to gently dissect them off. Um, and they come off quite nicely. Sometimes the sac does rupture as you're doing it. It's important to make sure that if that has happened, that you don't leave any residual sac behind because that can lead to recurrences of this lesion. Um, but preserve the superficial epithelium. Uh, so moving on to stenotic lesions, we're going to talk briefly about glottic stenosis and subglottic stenosis, glottic stenosis being bilateral vocal cord palsy or posterior glottic stenosis and subglottic stenosis. Uh, and I won't talk to you about the role for open versus endoscopic because clearly different units use different criteria um, uh, about what is considered to be failed endoscopic surgery. But I will uh, discuss something when I come to subglottic stenosis. So this is one of my patients. Uh, he's got severe bilateral glottic stenosis, uh, sorry, severe glottic stenosis from bilateral, essentially cricoarotino joint fixation from uh, prolonged intubation. He has a tracheostomy in place, uh, and this is a process of decannulating his tracheostomy. There's a little bit of suprastomal granulation here, which I removed with the micro debrider. Um, and essentially for this, and again, there's no one correct way. I perform bilateral uh, traditional uh, horizontal laser cordotomies. We had some Oops, sorry, hang on a sec. 
Uh, okay, sorry about that. So we performed bilateral horizontal laser cordotomies. Then I used a, a, a dilator, our balloon. And now I routinely use a balloon dilator, but at that particular point, we had to use a Chevalier Jackson. Uh, the balloons were not available. Uh, and then um, we inject uh, steroids. I use Triumph Cinolone um, in order to uh, reduce rescarring and, and granuloma formation. Um, and uh, subsequently, we decannulated this tracheostomy. You'll we'll see that shortly. And this is his follow up. Um, and remember that the anterior glottis, the anterior two thirds, is the fenatory part of the vocal cords. You still see quite a lot of fixation anteriorly, and the posterior glottis is the airway. So, so that's really where we need to improve patency if we have to decannulate patients with this. Uh, well, this is one option uh, in which uh, in trying to decannulate this tracheostomy. Now, naturally, uh, there are uh, issues with dealing with chronic aspiration, the role of Botox, the role of cricopharyngeal myotomy in assisting in secretion clearance, but that's beyond the, uh, beyond the role of this talk. Um, this is uh, posterior glottic stenosis, uh, and here we're going to perform a partial arytenoidectomy in addition to a unilateral transverse chordotomy. So you see a mucosal arc lesion that we draw up. Uh, you can do a more radical arytenoidectomy. For that, you need to move more posteriorly with your mucosal flap. Uh, there is a blood vessel that you will need to coagulate, but uh, we, which you, you saw nicely on the anatomical slide earlier. Um, uh, from, our, from uh, Professor Pai, but with this, this is a subtotal arytenoidectomy. We are really uh, removing the vocal process uh, in addition to the posterior part of the vocal cord. And this is often adequate in the vast majority of patients to provide them an adequate airway and a balance against uh, protection against aspiration. It's very, very important uh, to realize that a lot of these patients will chronically aspirate to a degree um, so they need to have the lung capacity, the FEV1 or FVC, and all the pulmonary factors that you look for uh, in order to ensure that their postoperative cough reflex is adequate. They're going to have some chest physiotherapy uh, and just uh, do a proper swallow assessment. If needed, you can do an endoscopic uh, swallow assessment, a fee study, to just ensure that their postoperative aspiration is tolerable, is manageable, uh, can be compensated for. Uh, before discharging them home. Um, there was uh, an unfortunate incident when I was a fellow where one of the patients had a very aggressive bilateral cordoarytenoidectomies and essentially died three days after surgery as a result of uncontrolled aspiration, had a bad pneumonia, it was an elderly patient. So it's often multiple factors, but um, I think these things can be predicted. Uh, you can get your speech and language therapist to work on swallow techniques that compensate against it together with your dietitians to assist with things like thickening their feeds uh, and improving compensatory techniques uh, in assisting against chronic aspiration. So again, um, uh, uh, keep the cords under tension and uh, progressively work your way across. Once you've incised the cord, work your way across, come around the vocal process of the arytenoid, and I use suction monopolar diathermy in order to achieve hemostasis um, of the arterial branch as it comes up behind the arytenoid. So that just continues. So the next one is subglottic stenosis. Um, this is a little bit more of an interesting condition. As you all know, this is a uh, fibro uh, inflammatory condition in the subglottis. Uh, it is virtually uh, uniquely female, especially the idiopathic variant of subglottic stenosis. One of the things I, may, I should mention is that I routinely use the DDO laryngoscope. I think the DDO uh, gives you great endolaryngeal exposure uh, into the airway. And of course, in the subglottis, you can push it down here. You see a grade one subglottic stenosis, largely mucosal, of course, you go through the process initially at the examination under anesthetic of obtaining accurate dimensions because at the back of your mind, you need to think about tracheal or cricotracheal resection as an option for these patients. But uh, for endoscopic uh, CO2 laser-based techniques, 
you make the uh, incisions, uh, radial incisions, you can do three or four. I use a microdebrider to remove that redundant mucosa. I don't always do this. If there is a lot of redundant mucosa, uh, then I do use the microdebrider to clean up the mucosal edges, uh, but you don't have to. Um, it's the radial cuts uh, that break apart the concentric scar rings in subglottic stenosis. Um, and here we're just obtaining some hemostasis. And I routinely use the balloon dilator. I use the CRE balloon um, uh, in order to uh, do three or four insufflations uh, in order to achieve adequate uh, luminal patency. So um, again, you know, there are, there are a whole heap of, of uh, different phonosurgical and airway stenotic lesions, but I thought in 10 minutes, uh, leaves a bit of time for discussion um, if we um, go through some of the main ones. So thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, Zenkas. Zenk I don't know if we have time to do Zenkas. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do we have time to do Zenkas? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just added Zenkas in. I know this is from in the piriform fossa. This is not strictly in the larynx. Um, again, uh, I routinely, if I'm to do them endoscopically nowadays, I use the stapler. I have used the laparoscopic harmonic scalpel to do it as well. I think you do get a little bit of thermal damage, but if you can get good exposure with the weirder diverticular scope, I think this gives you a very nice cricopharyngeal myotomy for a grade one Zenkers. So anything larger than that, I don't think this is suitable for uh, because you have the risk of perforating the sac causing infections in the neck or worse still, mediastinitis. So um, I would veer away from using this, except where the pouch is small, so a grade one pouch, less than one vertebral body, where the predominant problem is the upper esophageal sphincter hyperton hypertonicity. Uh, and all you essentially want to do is an endoscopic uh, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a laser myotomy in order to alleviate the cervical dysphagia um, where the sac is not the predominant problem, the muscle is the predominant problem. The issue with the small pouches, as those of us who staple or use the laparoscopic harmonic uh, scalpel know, is that the stapler requires about 12 millimeters of the pouch itself in order to engage. So in a very small pouch, you can't actually effectively staple it. Um, so this was my last one. Uh, so I'll end the stop share so that uh, I can answer any questions. Sorry, that was uh, very rapid. I had to bounce through topic to topic, but you know that's that's the that's the topic I got given. So, yeah. uh, thanks, thanks, Doctor Sarum. You've done a nice, good job, wonderful job. Uh, as you know, a lot of our audience are residents and trainees, and then we have a mixed bag of senior consultants as well as the you know the regular consultants. So there is one question. I think we should take it and answer this. So. Why do you why do we prefer uh, you know carbon dioxide laser uh, for benign lesions over the conventional cold steel techniques? I think it has been covered in the previous the last uh, you know session, but still uh, you know I think uh, it's time we answer this question here again. Look, I think I think as as Professor Parikh and and Pratimesh told you earlier, I think look the reasons we use CO two, whether it's a benign lesion or a malignant lesion, is universal. There are three things. One is anatomical precision, a small microspot. You get very little. If you do it well, uh, you get very little collateral damage. Um, I think uh, uh, it's it's precise. You get a degree of hemostasis. You get beautiful magnification. Um, and uh, I just think, um, yeah, why over cold steel? Uh, I mean, I, I th like I said earlier, I think you can use cold steel if you, if you like it. If you have uh, no access to CO2 laser, I don't think there's anything wrong in, in using cold steel excisions. I think you can use the cold blader. I think you can use the microdebrider. I think it's whatever you do, you should do all the time. There's no one perfect method for these. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I think I would agree with that. I think what one is experienced with is what one should use. Yeah. Especially for exactly. a benign, benign lesions like you just demonstrated the vocal nodules and polyps. I would prefer a guy taking a cold steel instrument and doing it properly rather than butchering up, if I may use the word, the vocal cord with a CO2 laser. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I think remember that, that as I mentioned at the first slide, these patients have benign disease, they have a quality of life problem. What you don't want to do is make them worse uh, and cause iatrogenic trauma to the vocal cords. We see a lot of patients who even have prolonged dysphonia, as we talked about last week, from a simple, you know, a so-called simple smash and grab laryngeal biopsy performed by a lot of our colleagues where they just grab the mucosa with the largest possible forcep and strip the vocal cord off. And that causes a very significant scar, a, a sulcus formation between the ligament and the epithelial surface that reduces the vibration of the vocal cords and gives you a very poor quality voice. So remember these patients have benign problems, don't make them worse, they don't have a cancer, they're not going to be thankful to you if you do aggressive surgery or over aggressive surgery and leave them worse than they started. I, I would just like to add that, on that, uh, that sorry, you I, need to actually have very delicate movements when you're doing the resections which are benign. And as he showed that beautiful resection of the of the uh, of the nodule, um, you uh, of the uh, you need to get into that submucosal space. So when you're using a laser, it it just gives you a very precise cut, and you can actually elevate the micro flap so well. So I don't think that there is a doubt that laser scores because it takes away your tremors. It, it gives you a very precision. It gives you good precision. And with the AccuBlade technology, I feel that has really taken my surgery to another level. Yeah, I think I agree. I use the AccuBlade in order to shape the beam. I think it's fantastic. You know, uh, you can put the low wattage, shape your beam. And as, as Pradamesh told you earlier, I think hydrodissection is very, very useful. Um, you really uh, see the planes a lot better. You preserve the mucosa a lot better and you actually get hemostasis from your infiltration. And even with the hydrodissection, the fluid that remains protects the underlying tissue that you're bonding mm. to preserve. The heat- Correct. Uh, the, other point I, yeah, the other point Sorry. I'd like to just emphasize on, especially for the younger colleagues who are attending, unlike the cautery where you increase the part to make it work better, please, please do not do that with the laser. Just because you change it from a 2 watt to a 6 watt, you are actually causing much more damage than any benefit as far as the resection is concerned. So correct, please correct. the minimal appropriate wattage so that you do the least of the thermal damage, especially when you're looking at the vocal cord. And as we tell our registrars all the time, if the laser is not cutting through the tissue, the, 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 the answer is not to raise the wattage. You've probably got the focal length wrong. Your laser is out of focus. Your spot size is not fine enough. So what you're getting is tissue desiccation as opposed, as opposed to cutting. Exactly. So you get this on, under the microscope. You see this focal area of tissue shrinkage and desiccation, you're not getting it to cut. And that's, so adjust those settings, don't turn up the wattage. Right. Uh, any experience uh, with post-radiotherapy, posterior glottic stenosis? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, it doesn't matter. Look, to be honest with you, it doesn't, for those fibroinflammatory causes, I think the etiology affects the prognosis, not the technique. Um, so patients with, with fibroinflammatory things like Wegener's granulomatosis, uh, they have an underlying pro-inflammatory process that can affect their outcome. It doesn't really change your technique of what you do that much. So with post-radio, look, I think post radioglottic stenosis often is done better alone, uh, open uh, rather than um, endoscopically, because endoscopically, your options are pretty much, for most glottic stenosis, a combination of chordotomies, arytenoidectomies. You can do mucosal flaps from the postcricoid space once you divide the scar. Uh, in order, the, the important thing is to create a bridge. And, and again, this is quite a complex topic, but the, the important thing is to create a mucosal bridge between two raw surfaces. If you're talking about pure posterior glottic stenosis, as opposed to cricoarytenoid joint fixation, as opposed to bilateral vocal cord palsy, they all look the same endoscopically but the pathogenesis and the behavior of the disease is very different. So in pure posterior glottic stenosis, uh, where, where there is actually a posterior fibrous scar, uh, if you just divide it, it will definitely recur again. Gosh. Because of, yeah, exactly, because of two raw surfaces. Now you can either put a rib graft in between, uh, you can flip uh, post cricoid mucosa, like a mucosal flap. You need something to break that scar band 
um, if you are going to divide posterior glottic stenosis. Now, if you guys are talking about uh, 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 stenosis in the posterior region of the larynx, then you can use arytenoidectomy, subtotal, total, transverse uh, chordotomies, you know, uh, or various combinations of them. So uh, I want to add one more point, Dr. Akshay, uh, regarding, uh, hello? Yeah, yes, yeah. Sir, go yes, 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 yeah, yes. I have a series of six cases of post-RT fixation, uh, post-radiotherapy. So uh, I have a success of 75%. Uh, the only issue uh, which I have faced a failure in post-radiation fixation of cord is the dysphagia is one of the important factors. Uh, the other thing is the site of the primary for which patient has been irritated. Like if the post prequired growth is there, so later on, because these most of these patients, they present after almost five years of radiation or seven years of radiation, like that. So they present with the respiratory distress and then the patient go for the. So most of my cases, I have done it's a partial retinoidectomy with posterior chordotomy. So, but the only issue was uh, initially for three weeks, there was dysphagia was the main issue, aspiration and other things. So it took a mm -hmm. lot of time. One patient lasted for almost three months to decalibrate, but most of them, they decalibrated within three weeks time. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what I was saying. It's a combination of chordotomies, arytenoidectomies, unilateral, bilateral. Um, so th those are the options. Um, so when it comes to uh, vocal cord palsy, uh, palsy uh, when do you decide to do a unilateral or a bilateral uh, posterior transverse chordotomy uh, for a glottic stenotic lesion or any such condition? And what is the extent of uh, you know the posterior cord that you would resect? Do you go beyond the conventional Dennis Kashima procedure, uh, what do you do? No, no, I don't go beyond. Look, again, it depends on the cause. So if it's a neurological palsy, you don't actually need to be that aggressive because again, that's not a fibroinflammatory scar. Um, so if you talk about bilateral, see bilateral vocal cord immobility is the condition. That can be caused by a neurological palsy, that can be caused by joint fixation, that can be caused by scar. And I think what you do is very, very different. So if you're talking about a neurological palsy, I usually just do unilateral um, uh, for them. And often the airway, look, the nice thing about benign disease is you can always go back in and do more. Okay, so it start low, and look, reassess the need. So do a unilateral. So I usually do a unilateral. And if you can get some sort of a history, try and do the side that you think has definite long-term palsy. You know, like if a patient has had thyroidectomy like 17 years ago on the right-hand side, hemithyroidectomy. So that's likely to be the old palsy. Um, so do that side and, and um, assess uh, their response in their airway, in their activities of daily living, and see if you need to do more. If you need to do more, then I would do that arytenoid on the same side first, and then reassess, and then go to the other side. So, so you can start that way, and, and you can just work your way around. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farooq. Uh, uh, thank thank you. you for that. Uh, Thanks, so Anand. Moving on. So moving on, uh, the next session uh, would be on intraoperative maneuvers for difficult laryngeal exposure. Uh, and uh, I call on uh, Dr. Rakesh Srivatsava to uh, you know present the surgical video. Yeah, can you see the share? Yes, sir. Can you see the, yeah. Uh, uh, we have a wonderful session, uh, lovely videos from uh, previous speakers. So, but the success of transoral laser surgery lies on two important things, that is uh, uh, evaluation of the patient, and secondly, the exposure during the time of surgery. So, what the great Chevalier has, Chevalier Jackson has said, there is no instrument made that will do away with the necessity for a correct position of the patient. So, my talk will cover on uh, difficult laryngeal exposure and how you can make it easier and this is directly directed mostly to the, uh, the PGs and how we can make uh, the things easier because most of the time they are not able to see the larynx or uh, there is a complete failure. 
So coming to the incidence of uh, difficult laryngeal exposure varies from 1.5 to 8.5 percent, and that is by <clears throat> the article which has been published by Cesara Piazza in 2014. And I hope that most of you must be aware of what are the class, what are the different class of exposures. So class three and class four, that is once you are able to see the larynx with a narrow bore laryngoscope with a flexion flexion position of the patient. And class four is once you are not able to see the, uh, uh, the larynx. So whenever we talk of a difficult laryngeal exposure, we always talk in, in terms of anterior commissure. So good laryngeal exposure may become a difficult laryngeal exposure if you're not aware of. So what I'm going to tell about how to make a difficult, uh, difficult laryngeal exposure to make it a good laryngeal exposure. So we have to know about the laryngo score. And this is a 11 point score, which has been introduced by uh, Professor Pariti and Piazza on uh, various factors which decide about the, uh, how you have to assess, pre-evaluate the patient for a uh, difficult laryngeal exposure. So whenever we talk of TLE, it is always anterior commission. So why anterior commission is a diff different entity? It's a small area, it's a heterogeneous group of tumors. It's a difficult anatomy because both the cords are coming at one side. Exposure. So exposure, I'm going to touch upon exposure. Assessment methods are there. Staging is different for anterior commissure. It may be T1, look like T1, but it, may, it might be T3. And management is different. It may be TLM, it may be open partial, or it may be uh, total laryngectomy. So what are the factors which decide about the uh, difficult laryngeal exposure and how you can make it easy to make it a good laryngeal exposure? Positioning of the head, neck, and shoulder of the patient, choice of the laryngoscope. We had already talked about various laryngoscopes. Choice of laryngoscopic fixation device. I have seen it because initial of my career for first six years, I was using a Levy chest support. Now I use a... Uh, Yellows one, so I found it different in uh, Levy chest support as compared to the position of the upper edge of the distal end of the laryngoscope. So you have to adjust the laryngoscope so that you will have a good exposure and you'll be able to see the anterior extent of the tumor. External counter pressure, we all know about. That is how the third end will be used, how the strapping, neck like strapping has been done. So external counter pressure, it may be directly vertically directed, or it may be sideways also, like lateral pressures. So if you are operating on right cord, you may need a good exposure of the lateral side of the tumor. Then uh, your assistant should know that where he has to show it. Readjustment of laryngoscope and suspension system during the various phase of surgery. Suppose if the tumor is extensive tumor, a bulky tumor, and you have to excise it first the anterior part, then you have to come to the posterior part then you have to adjust the suspension system or you are removing the tumor in a piecemeal for a relatively large size tumor. So routine laryngoscopy is performed in a sniffing position that has been described by Chevalier Jacksons and the, uh, that is known as a boy's position. So flexion at 35 degree on the chest, that is uh, neck on the chest and extension at the atlanto-occipital joint. And the height of the your uh, neck to the, the occiput should be more than 15 centimeter. And this is an extension at the atlanto occipital joint. And there's a wonderful article which has been written by Zytels. What are the force factors, the, how you have to insert the laryngoscope in the, uh, for the exposure? So force vector should be directed ventral and caudal direction towards the glottis, away from the upper teeth. Like if you see the anesthetist, how they lift the the airway, the more of the pressure is directed towards the mandible part rather than on the maxilla. So energy of force should come not from the hand, it should come from the muscles of the leg. So you just have to lift it like this. Coming to the holders, so we all know about the Levy chest support and this one is a, where the force vector is directed towards the, towards the upper teeth. 
while in gallows type the the force vector is directed more towards the lower jaw so if you look at the position the head is elevated at almost 15 degrees to the horizontal now i am not going to cover various types of laryngoscope because this has already been covered but i will highlight one of them that is dido is uh, the workhorse for uh, most of the laryngeal surgery professor previous speaker has already highlighted about dido laryngoscope what i have using more frequently is a lend down for the supraglottic work because it gives a more panoramic view uh, for most of the pediatric airway or the adult airway surgeries uh, steiner we have already discussed so narrow bore what i have added in my uh, kit is i am using a fenestrate laryngoscope for thrai so i'm doing lot of airway surgery and i found this as a useful tool for most of my airway work which i am doing under total intravenous anesthesia without using a relaxant so i can prolong the surgery for 45 minutes maybe one hour without uh, with blocking the lar the laryngeal inlet so that i can continue with a high flow oxygen and easily do all the uh, procedures with if i am using a coblator or laser but the important factor if you are using a thai you have to know about the depth of anesthesia and if you are working on the posterior part of the cord you should have a good exposure of the posterior cord using a vocal fold retractors so um, i think that most of uh, last time i attended most of the australian group they don't agree that you should not use a laser so but uh, i have a series of more than 60 cases i don't have any accident and uh, the more main thing we decide is the depth of anesthesia should be important because patient should not move at the time of surgery so coming to the exposure so this is the ideal position the ideal position you get is a good exposure is the anterior commissure mid cord and the part of the posterior cord is involved this is the ideal exposure you get it and one should be not hesitate to use a rigid scope to see the different zero degree telescope because zero degree will tell you exactly that how much you will able to see on a microscopic vision then second part of the uh, surgery is adjusting the laryngoscope with rigid scope so i usually do is adjust it with the one hand on the uh, left hand on the with the rigid scope and then i adjust the that how much it is whether it is deep inside in the laryngoscopic blade is deep in, into it or we i have to withdraw a little bit so that i can adjust it so that i will have a panoramic view of the growth and i'll able to see that at least uh, uh one centimeter uh, not one centimeter it's almost 5 uh, mm from the uh, margin of the growth and how much false cord i have to excise is how much ventriculectomy i have to do it now coming to the third end so this is a revision case of anterior commissure growth so i am doing it but this patient was having a difficult laryngeal exposure but here if you look at the my i'm just going to the anterior commissure and elevating it with a with a suction once my assistant withdraws a third hand just show you just make it fast forward you see that it is very difficult because that much exposure my assistant has gave me with the third hand technique using a uh, pressing over the neck now anterior commissure dissection as we all know we the anterior paraglottic space is a important uh, area because of the chances of recurrence are higher on this side and we all know about the isoprognostic zone that article which has been published by professor pareti and piazza in uh, frontiers in uh, oncology so this highlights about the anterior paraglottic space the pressure is coming from the right side so that i'll get a good exposure of the anterior paraglottic space and
and this is like adjusting with the laryngoscope blade on a huge growth. So this will this will tell about the lateral extent of the tumor because here I can't see the lateral extent of the tumor even after putting the laryngoscope deep inside it. So what I did, I just withdraw the laryngoscope blade and then I resected the false cord. Just move it fast. So there are two ways you can resect the false focal cord. You, either you can use a scanner in a fast mode or one can use a blade also to excise the false cord. So here again, I am reaching up to the anterior paraglottic space after, and then I'll know that uh, I'm away from the tumor and then this is my safe margin for the excision. I'm just moving it fast because there are many videos are there. So like posterior commissure dissection, this is a huge growth, which is extending from anterior commissure to going up to the uh, vocal process of the retinoid. So this area is a difficult area, which has to be excised only after removing the tube. So after resecting it from the anterior part, the growth comes down because uh, the, the tissue contracts. So it is always be easier to bring it down and then take out the tube and then you can do the dissection after taking out the endotracheal tube and doing the, or either you can do it using a tube in tube out technique. So once uh, I've removed the first part of it, so I can, I'm reassessing it. So I can see there is a growth is there and I can see the vocal process of the retinoid. So taking out the tube and then doing the rest of the dissection. This is again, uh, if you look at the blade of the, the superior edge of the blade of the laryngoscope, it is more on the right false cord. And now I'm adjusting the edge of the, because this is my area of interest. Readjusted it. Because here also I cannot see the, the whether the tumor is involving the, the ventricular fold or paraglottic space. The important, the other important part is adjustment and changing the laryngoscope. If you are not able to see the anterior commissure, then you can try other laryngoscope in your uh, set. You can use anterior commissure laryngoscope. There are good, well-made anterior commissure laryngoscope which are available in India. So those uh, anterior commissure laryngoscope, you can use it and readjust it so that you will have a, so here the problem was I am dissecting it from from back to anterior, but what happened it, it has, the, the tumor has detected more anteriorly. So now I've changed it to a black finish anterior commissure laryngoscope, and now I'm able to see the, so rest of the dissection has been done, removing the part of the ventricular fold. Now coming to the other difficult area, which is known as supracommissural growth. This was a patient with presented last year only, and it, it has got a growth on the uh, left vocal fold. This is NBI image. And you can see it is going into the supracommissural area. There's a little bit area is also there of the growth, the same uh, on uh, March. And then again, I followed this patient. Uh, after one month, I could not see any growth on the white light endoscopy. But again, when I saw it on the NBI, there is a residual, I could see it on the supracommissural area. So near endoscopy with using NBI, I could able to see the, the residual is there. So then I took the patient again for the second, uh, uh, thinking about the difficult laryngeal exposure. So this was uh, endoscopy after almost three months of the surgery. And then this, this was after one year of it. I'll just show you the brief video of how uh, supracommissural uh, uh, so the dissection has been done. 
But here again, if you see that I am not able to exactly see where is the residual is there. So what I followed is a type six type of uh, chord FP, exposing the false chord like this. And then I could able to see the entire extent of my tumor, which is just above the, but it is not uh, exactly hindering or not affecting the function of the petiole. So the final, uh, this I'm removing the false chord. Even with the third end technique, I was not able to see exactly. So intermittently, uh, I'm using a telescope, 30 degree telescope to look at the anterior, uh, the supracommissorial area. Now you can see that this tumor is partly involving the anterior part, superficial extent. So removing a part of the uh, ventricular fold gives a good exposure. And these are the difficult areas because of the anatomy, because of, uh, and especially in patient with the anteriorly placed larynx, or if you don't have a proper laryngoscope to look into this difficult area. So final look, I'll just show you. Without breaking the, so this broils has gone, but I was able to preserve the, uh, the petiole of the epiglottis. Now coming to the uh, supraglottic tumor like this one, where we don't know the exactly the origin of the tumor. This was of ossifying fibroma. But with the CT, you can assess it that this tumor was arising from the lateral uh, pharyngeal wall. So, it was done with the laser. But it was a quite a difficult exposure. And one person was, uh, I was detecting on the left hand and other, uh, with the other hand, I was using the laser. So, it was done with the It was end block removal. It was a very rare tumor for uh, ossifying fibroma to be to be seen in from the uh, arising from the lateral pharyngeal wall. So once I got into the lateral, uh, the exposure is good. Then uh, I could see the lateral part of it. And then I changed it to the blade. With the blade, I was able to excise the rest of the tumor. So this type of uh, superglottic, the choice of laryngoscope for me is Lindom because Lindom gives a good panoramic view it snugly fits into the pre-epiglottic space and vellicula. So other thing which uh, recently has come up is the anterior commission exposure. So here uh, for anterior commission exposure, uh, it has uh, uh, recently been published from Italy only that uh, one can do type three thyroplasty. I think most of the ENT surgeons, they are aware of what is type three thyroplasty. It is basically uh, used for to convert a female voice in a male patient to a male voice. So you have to reduce the pitch of the patient. And this is uh, done with the giving a transverse neck incision at the between the uh, notch of the thyroid and the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage. And once you expose the thyroid cartilage, three millimeter or four millimeter from either side, you give a vertical incision, taking care of not to damage the inner pericondrium. And this part, you press it 
medially so that you will have a good exposure of the anterior commissure. And uh, recently it has been published by uh, last year only, it's a modified approach of anterior commissure for transoral cordectomy in case of difficult laryngeal exposure, especially for malignancies of the anterior commissure. And this is only the two cases series. And I think I finish off. Thank you very much. And this is Professor Pareti under whom I did uh, work. And here we are in Goa. And what Professor Pareti is telling me, not about transoral laser surgery, he's telling me about Rakesh, keep your glass back. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, so, uh, so in cases uh, wherein you have uh, or you anticipate difficult airway, uh, difficult exposures, uh, and you do a surgery, uh, do you change your uh, protocols of how you would follow up the patient beyond getting a conventional endoscopy at fixed time intervals? Do you change that or does that remain the same? No, it does remain the same. It's remain the same. Right. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we uh, would now move on to the next session. So we would uh, switch yeah. to the didactic lectures now. Uh, so the so we have uh, Dr. Deepak Balasubramaniam uh, to deliver the lecture on uh, surgical versus non-surgical organ preservation uh, strategies for early release. Anand, it's uh, Professor Pareti now. Deepak will join a bit later. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so I would then call on uh, Professor Pareti uh, to look at the role of open partial laryngectomy in the era of uh, transoral laser microsurgery. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can. Yes, sir. So now we are moving from a transoral approach to open neck approach, but we remain the field of conservative surgery. So even in this kind of procedure, the selection of the patient is very important to achieve a very good results. Uh, Sorry. Okay. So again, the ELS classified the, the uh, conservative laryngeal surgery in three types uh, according to the level of the uh, cut and uh, according to the structure that you are to spare. So type one means uh, that uh, the, the resection is above the glottic plane, sparing uh, both the vocal cord and arytenoid. Type two, the resection uh, is done uh, at the superior level of the cricoid. Uh, of course, uh, you have to remove the glottic plane. Uh, you can extend the resection superiorly to the preepiglottic space, if you, if you are dealing with supraglottic tumor extended to the supraglottic. Here you can modulate it because if the lesion is limited to the glottic pain, a plane, you can spare also the supra ioid epiglottics. And finally, the more extreme conservative resection is represented by type three or supratracheal resection that is indicated for a glottic tumor extending subglottically to the cricoid. So in this case, you remove all the, the arch of the cricoid or even alpha of the um, uh, plate of the cricoid, but it's important to spare at least one cricoarytenoid joint. The, the skin excision is the uh, classical cocker uh, um, incision. And uh, 
these are uh, different uh, picture on the cadaver just to show you exactly the different step of the lesion. Of course, uh, you have uh, to cut the strap muscle. It's important to perform the cut one centimeter below the higher bone, just to spare the superior part uh, of the strap muscle to avoid uh, the devascularization of the hyoid bone. It's very important to recognize uh, the vascular pedicle, the superior laryngeal uh, um, artery, and uh, also it is extremely important to recognize uh, the innervation, so the, the superior laryngeal nerve with the external branch going to the cricothyroid muscle. So you have to spare the inner branch and the external branch, of course. And of course, also the recurrent nerve. So here is important to recognize that this is a very important landmark. This is the inferior corner of the thyroid cartilage. It's important to know that the recurrent nerve go around the joint and go inside the larynx behind the uh, thyrocricothyroid joint. So this is a very important landmark to individualize the right uh, recurrent nerve and to spare it. Uh, before starting uh, the, the uh, approach to the conservative surgery, you have to uh, prepare uh, the framework. And the first step is uh, cut the um, constrictor muscle and to freeze the piriform sinus. Of course, uh, when you are dealing with the type one supra uh, glottic laryngectomy, you have to cut only the superior part of the uh, um, uh, constrictor muscle because you don't remove the uh, inferior part of the cartilage. By contrast, when you are dealing with the uh, supracrico, supratracular injectomy, you have to cut the uh, entire muscle and you, are, you have to freeze completely the piriform sinus. This uh, is the maneuver to cut the inferior uh, corner of the thyroid. And if you remember the slide that, that I show you about the landmark, this is very important maneuver to spare uh, the nerve because you don't risk to damage the nerve because you cut the corner superiorly and you don't disarticulate the corner. So this is very important to protect, to spare the recurrent nerve. That is very important because without, if you damage, the, the nerve, of course, uh, you lose the uh, function of the cricoarytenoid joint. That uh, is very important for the sphincteric and phonatory function of the larynx, of the remaining larynx. So the, the surgical key points very important to keep in mind is the, the respect uh, of the superior and inferior laryngeal nerve. Uh, when uh, you uh, cut uh, the constrictor muscle, and uh, I, I suggest uh, non disarticulating the corner, but uh, just uh, cut the corner superiorly and uh, spare the joint, uh, as I showed you before. Um, and of course, uh, you have to, to uh, spare completely the, the joint to, to uh, um, achieve a complete mobility of the remaining arytenoid. So you have to prepare the superior part. So you isolate it completely the pre-epiglottis place. The approach to the pharynx is the same for all 
or PGL, so you open the pharynx, uh, isolating the, the cartilage, the pre-epiglottic space uh, is included in the specimen, of course, so you have to denudate completely the thyrohyoid membrane that you open uh, with this maneuver. So you grasp the epiglottic and you start the resection of the supraglottis following the ARI epiglottic fold. When you uh, are performing the type one supraglottic laryngectomy, it is important to keep in mind that the, the cut of the cartilage must be done in the midline because in the midline you find the anterior commissure. So if you want to spare completely the glottic plane, the, the vocal cord, you have to cut the cartilage above this line for type one uh, OPCL. So you prepare the cartilage in this way, denudating the external uh, perichondrium, and you cut at the level of the anterior curvature. In the specimen, you can include, of course, uh, you have to include all the pre-epiglottic space and the epiglottis. When you open the, the, the larynx, you have to crack the, the thyroid just to open the, the, the larynx as a book. And uh, from the uninvolved side, you can figure out uh, the tumor in the opposite side, uh, like here on the left part. You have to figure out the tumor here. And you can expose very well the anterior curvature, the contralateral vocal cord, the false cord, the ventricle, and the uh, glottic plane. And I'll close it for the supraglottic. Now you have to, to, uh, to figure out two types of cut. If you perform a type one, you have to cut the false cord and you have to run on the floor of the ventricle, sparing the vocal cord. By contrast, when you perform a supracricle type two, you have to cut the vocal cord in front of the vocal process, sparing the uh, arytenoid, but removing completely the glottic plane. So you have a two different plane according to the type of the resection you, you have to plane. So uh, you, you run on the uh, floor of the ventricle in case of OPCL type one, you have to cut the vocal cord in front of the vocal process when you perform a type two. As you will see in the, the type three, you have to cut also the arch of the cricoid. So you have to modulate the, um, the level of the resection in order uh, according to the type of the resection you have to plane to down. This is the results of a type one supraglottic laryngectomy. As you can see, the glottic plane is completely spared. By contrast, the pre-epiglottic, the supraglottic larynx, including the pre-epiglottic space, is completely removed. And this is the type of the PESI that you have to, to do. In, uh, between the cricoid and the inferior part of the thyroid, you have to take a submucosary base of the tongue, going around the higher bone and fix with three stitches the, the remaining thyroid with the uh, higher bone. Okay, when you move to the type two supracricoid laryngectomy, you have two types of uh, OPCL. You can spare the supraioid epiglottis, as in this case, 
and you have to cut the epiglottis at the level of the superior part of the thyroid cartilage. So you can leave the pre-epiglottis place, you can leave the, sup the suprahyoid epiglottis because this kind of uh, uh, resection is indicated for a tumor uh, located to the glottic plane without extension to the supraglottis. By contrast, when you face uh, with glottic tumor extended to the supraglottics uh, and to the preglottic -pre space, you have to perform the same approach uh, as type one. So uh, that means to dissect completely the epiglottis and the pre epiglottic space. Now uh, I show you some detail about how to fix uh, the remaining arytenoid to the cricoid. Usually I perform this kind of uh, uh, suture just to uh, put uh, the uh, arytenoid in the physiological position. So with this gentry traction, you, uh, uh, you put uh, forward a little bit the uh, arytenoid. Otherwise, uh, after cutting the, the muscle, the, the arytenoid uh, go down uh, against the uh, posterior wall of the pharynx. By contrast, uh, you have to push a little forward the arytenoid in a more physiological position. When uh, you spare both uh, uh, arytenoid, you have to fix uh, uh, in this way, uh, both the vocal process uh, in the anterior branch, uh, and you can see the difference uh, between uh, this arytenoid and the other one. When you tie a little bit the suture, you can see that uh, the arytenoid move a little bit forward, just to make uh, a more physiological position. By contrast, when you spare only one arytenoid, because for oncological reason, you have to remove the opposite uh, arytenoid, the stitcher is put uh, contralaterally just to optimize uh, the sphincteric uh, function and the phonatory function of the remaining of the single uh, arytenoid. So you, you put a little bit toward the opposite side, just to uh, uh, make a, a closer resection of the posterior part of the uh, larynx. So the final result is this. You have not to tie very strongly, just to, to push a little bit the arytenoid in the original position, because when you cut the muscle, the, the arytenoid go uh, uh, behind. So uh, you have to uh, put the arytenoid in the physiological position. Um, and when uh, one important thing, uh, sorry, when uh, you remove uh, one arytenoid, uh, it's important to, to spare a bulky flap of mucosa of the piriform sinus just to recreate a mass in, uh, in order to replace a little bit of volume in the posterior part of the larynx where, where you have already removed the cartilage. About the PESI, the PESI in the type two is uh, between the cricoid you have to take submucosally the supraioid uh, epiglottis, then you go deeply in, uh, in the base of the tongue and you go around uh, the eye bone. So you go through the cricotrachea space, the, the space between the cricoid, the, the first uh, ring of the trachea. Again, you go submucosally to the epiglottis, just to fix the, epiglot the remaining epiglottis to the cricoid, and uh, you go in the base of the tongue and around the, the eye. And this is the final result. You see, I use uh, only three stitches 
one centimeter uh, one from the other one, just to, to leave uh, the base of the tongue not really fixed, uh, because this is important uh, uh, for the swallowing uh, uh, function. And this is uh, the results of the Supra type two OPCL with uh, both uh, arytenoid spare and the supra ioid epiglottis. This is the closure, complete closure during the sw uh, swallowing, just to confirm the, that uh, the spinteric uh, function is completely spare. As you can see, the glottic plane is completely removed. When uh, you uh, remove also the epiglottis, so you perform a type uh, 2B, the cricoioid pessi must be done between the cricoid and the hyoid bone pass through the base of the tongue because uh, you have no more epiglottis to, to fix. A one trick, important trick, is just to put some stitch in the uh, mucosa of the pharynx, just to make uh, uh, narrow the, the additus of the larynx. And this is very useful, again, for the swallowing function. So I prefer just to make uh, a little narrow this, uh, this part, putting some stitches in the uh, mucosa of the pharynx, just to before uh, starting with the pest. So this is the preparation, just two stitches, and then you go for the pexy. Again, only three stitches. And this is the result of uh, uh, type uh, to be without epiglottis, uh, sparing both uh, arytenoid, so for uh, anterior commissure tumor extending to the supraglottis uh, with minimal extension to the subglottis. And you can see, even in this case, uh, a very good closure between the arytenoid and the base of the tongue. And this is the new glottis uh, for phonation and also for swallowing. Again, one detail about the pexy between the cricoid, base of the tongue, and uh, hyoid bone. And just to reduce uh, the tension of the pexy, I suggest to you just to release a little bit the trachea. Uh, it's important to perform a, a blunt finger dissection al along the anterior wall. Don't go laterally because if you go laterally, you can compromise the vascularization of the tracheal stamp. So when you make a release with the finger, you stay always in the anterior part just to reduce the tension of the trachea. And also the uh, superior flap must be prepared two centimeters above the hyoid bone again to uh, reduce the tension place. And uh, one important thing is that uh, when I, you put the stitches just to, to, to make uh, the arytenoid in the physiological position. And you have to um, uh, perform three, three uh, suture for the PESI, um, exactly one centimeter apart. More suture reduce, if you put more suture like five, six, uh, uh, you reduce the efficiency of the tongue at the time of swallowing. And also, if you go laterally, you, you take a risk to damage the uh, uh, lingual artery that uh, is behind the lateral part of the hyoid bone. So you have to, to remain in the central compartment uh, 
with uh, only three stitches in the anterior part of the criper. Uh, finally, when you face uh, with tumor extended to the subglottis or extending the, to the posterior paraglottic space, just the selected cases, you can extend your resection to the first ring, uh, ring of the trachea. And also, you can remove half of the plate of the cricoid, removing all uh, uh, the cricoarytenoid uh, unit uh, involved by the tumor, but uh, it's very important to keep uh, at least uh, one cricoarytenoid joint intact. That means uh, the arytenoid, the innervation, and the vascularization of the side uninvolved by the tumor. So when we talk about a cricoarytenoid joint, we mean that uh, you have prepared not only the arytenoid, but also the muscular, the, muscular, the, the cricoarytenoid muscle, lateral posterior, the innervation and the vascularization. This is an example for the indication when you have a tumor extended below the glottic plane reaching the cricoid, of course, you have to cut uh, start the section from the space between the first ring and the cricoid, including all the arc of the cricoid in the specimen. I, I, I want to underline this kind of uh, uh, um, laryngectomy is very, very extreme. It must be done only in selected cases uh, with a very good general condition because the rehabilitation of this patient takes a long time and uh, is uh, very difficult. Of course, uh, when you remove uh, one cricoarytenoid joint, you have to reconstruct the piriform sinus. You use, as in total laryngectomy, the remaining mucosa of the piriform sinus to, to refill this gap. So you suture the mucosa to the remaining plate of the cricoid just to recreate the piriform sinus with this kind of uh, reconstruction. This uh, is very important, uh, of course, uh, for swallowing uh, rehabilitation. You can uh, use a 3040 suture. I go a little faster just to show you the final results. Again, you have to reduce uh, at maximum the tension to avoid any deficiency of the suture. So here there is the, the piriform sinus, and uh, this uh, is the cricoarytenoid joint spare. It is very important that this uh, is a completely functional. Regarding the suture, the PESI, the PESI must be done between the uh, trachea and the remaining epiglottis of the hyoid. Keep in mind that uh, if you face uh, with transcommissural lesion going from the supraglottis to the subglottis, the gap to refill is uh, uh, very high, at least uh, two, three centimeters. So in this case, it's very, very important to release a little bit of trachea just to avoid any tension uh, to the PESI. Uh, you have to keep uh, at least two ring to avoid the rupture of the ring. And I suggest uh, uh, to make uh, the suture in different level, not uh, as in this uh, uh, feed, uh, picture. Maybe you put one stitch 
at the level, the second stitch uh, uh, a level below, and you return uh, and the uh, first level um, uh, with the third. Just to um, um, not to put the, the tension at the same level. So remember, the, the PESI is between the trachea and the hyoid bone, but it's important to, to go deeply in the base of the tongue. And in these cases, it's very important to release the trachea and a little bit the hyoid bone to uh, make uh, very easy the, uh, the PESI. In this case, uh, I keep also the, the head of the patient a little flex for a few days, putting uh, two sutures uh, between the chin and the thorax. Um, as uh, we, we do routinely when I perform a critical tract resection from a stenosis or neoplasma of the juncture. So this is the final result. You have to, to fix the suture in the same time. And uh, again, you can cover the, 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 the PESI with the thyroid glands, the remaining thyroid glands on uh, uh, the remaining strap muscle. And of course, uh, the, trache the tracheotomy must be done uh, few um, uh, rings uh, below the PESI just to avoid any uh, damage to the PESI for infection related to the tracheotomy. You cover the PESI just to protect uh, in the, the PESI in the rehabilitation. You perform below the tracheotomy. This is some uh, results, uh, post-operative results. This is a patient with uh, just uh, one uh, cricoaditinoid joint and uh, a superior uh, epiglottis. The, this uh, visualization is from below, from the tracheotomy. Okay, this is the uh, remaining mucosa of the contralateral sides. And this uh, is another post-operative uh, evaluation of the same patient. You see the base of the tongue, the remaining cricoid joint, and the remaining epiglottis. You have a good uh, uh, sphincteric uh, uh, function. Sometimes you can have uh, some uh, narrow space, uh, some uh, mild dysplasia. So the main problem of this patient uh, is, uh, 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 for instance, the uh, um, um, breathing and not to the swallowing. They can speak uh, pretty well. They can swallow very well. Sometimes they have uh, some fatigue uh, uh, if they make uh, some effort, physical effort. But, uh, most of the time you can decanulate it successfully all the patients. But uh, underline, please uh, take uh, this uh, option in alternative to total laryngectomy or non-organ preservation treatment only in very, very selective cases. And never for salva surgery after uh, mm -hmm after radiation or chemo radiation failure. I'd like to thank you again, uh, all my team that helped me to, to make uh, all this video and uh, to collect uh, all these cases. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Peretti. Uh, take some quick questions. Uh, so, uh, for the pexies, uh, what is the kind of suture that you use? Uh, uh, do you use absorbable sutures, non-absorbable? Uh, what is the needle that you would use? For the pexy? Yeah. Yes, I use uh, Vicryl, reassortable. Uh, one 
or two, okay? The very, very uh, strong uh, suture. And uh, uh, I put usually in the midline a double suture. So mm -hmm. I pass the, the needle with a double suture. So in the midline, I use two sutures parallel and uh, the other suture one centimeter apart from the midline. Uh, so following uh, these open partial laryngectomies, uh, when do you usually start your patients on rehabilitation, the oral swallow, etc.? I start uh, as soon as possible. Uh, that means uh, after uh, four or five days, uh, if the edema is reduced, uh, I plug immediately the uh, tracheotomy. Uh, I use a small cannula, number four, and plug, plug it as soon as possible. And uh, I start the rehabilitation uh, after one week. When I start the rehabilitation, I remove the tracheotomy and I put, uh, I plug the tracheotomy just to, to avoid any trauma or any fixation related to the cannula. So the message is try to remove the tracheo as soon as possible. And before remove, plug it as soon as possible. So the patient starts to breathing uh, from the natural, uh, uh, from, from naturally, and uh, start to make uh, some phonation and start uh, the uh, swelling process uh, with the saliva. If uh, you keep uh, the tracker in place, uh, it is more difficult for the patient to uh, start to uh, rehabilitate uh, uh, quickly. And never, never use the calf cannula. I remove the calf a few hours after the procedure. And I substitute the calf with a very small tracheotomy, a very small cannula, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so, Professor, uh, for somebody like you who has an expertise both with the open surgeries as well as with uh, transoral laser microsurgeries, some of these procedures can be done with, uh, you know, TLM as well. When do you choose uh, open partial laryngectomy over TLM? I use uh, open partial laryngectomy first of all when I have no adequate exposure. If I have a good, uh, bad exposure, I take a risk uh, to have um, a very high uh, rate of recurrence. So in this case, I prefer a, a open approach. Then, of course, uh, when I have a transcommissural lesion going from supraglottis to the subglottis, uh, I feel more confident to perform open approach. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, you have extension to the posterior paraglottic space uh, with the impairment of mobility or in selective fixation of the arytenoid, I prefer to perform open because it allows me to resect completely all the arytenoid or the crico uh, unit uh, with the muscle with the nerve, with the uh, artery, that I cannot do in uh, transorally, because uh, transorally I can dissect uh, the paraglottic space, uh, but uh, remain a gate for the escape of the tumor posteriorly. So I had uh, a very high uh, rate of recurrence in case of fixation of the arytenoid transorally, so for me, but also for other authors, uh, the fixation, the arytenoid is an absolute contraindication for TLM. And the transcommissural lesion, in, uh, uh, including supraglottic, glottis, subglottis, uh, are also very high risk uh, lesion for transoral approach. And of course, if you have uh, some erosion of the laryngeal framework, because uh, uh, if I have uh, a doubt or a macroscopical evidence of the erosion of the thyrocartilage, 
I prefer to perform uh, OPCL type 2 and remove all the cartilage uh, um, during the resection. That I cannot do it. I don't like to perform uh, some uh, mix uh, technique, like perform uh, some windows uh, in the, the lamina, because uh, the main goal uh, of the transoral approach uh, is to keep the box of the larynx intact, just to, to keep uh, uh, all the recurrence inside the, the ligand. This is the most important advantage of transoral approach. Limited the escape outside the box. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Thank you. So, next. Yeah. So, uh, next, uh, we move on uh, to the talk on uh, outcomes of upper aerodigestive tract malignancies treated with uh, transoral laser microsurgery by Professor Karsten Palm from Australia. Can you hear me? I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah. Can you see yeah. the idiot or? Yeah, I see you. Why, why can't I see my screen? Oh, you can see my screen, great. All right, can you see my slides? Yeah. Great. So look, uh, thanks again, uh, everybody, for, uh, for just a, a wonderful session. Um, I'm really just going to focus on basically some outcome factors of transoral laser surgery for uh, early glottic cancer. A lot of what I'm going to say has, has been uh, uh, already discussed in, in part. So I just want to bear with you uh, and I'll show you some videos just seeing how things can heal. We all know that uh, larynx cancer is not uh, uh, that common. Certainly in our world, we've seen a significant reduction in laryngeal, oops, in laryngeal uh, cancers. And, and certainly we, we we fortunately or don't have the sort of numbers and the, the amazing experience of, of Dr. Paredes. Um, fortunately, glottic cancer is uh, uh, diagnosed at an early stage, and there are a number of treatment options uh, that we've all seen uh, being discussed. Foremost, transoral laser surgery, or as Professor Paredes just showed elegantly, uh, open partial laryngectomy. Fortunately, uh, and interestingly, surgery and radiation outcomes have been sort of reported to be uh, uh, equal, although I think there are some differences which we'll uh, allude to shortly. When we choose a modality, clearly we need to choose a modality based on the oncologic results. But if there is equipoise, then we can start thinking about how the treatment impacts at the upper air digestive tract function, quality of life, patient factors, Certainly, surgeon factors come into play, institutional philosophies, resource availability, and certainly costs, not just to the patient, but society as a whole. So focusing on transoral laser surgery, this has been a very well published modality since Jaco on Strong, and this is Jaco here in 1971, first coupled the laser to the microscope. And when you look at the outcomes for early glottic cancer, they're uh, overall uh, very good. Recurrence rates uh, in the vicinity of 10 to 15%. They're very excellent disease specific and, and overall survival. And here you can see some of the, the real powerhouses, uh, Professor Steiner, Ambrosch, and certainly Professor Paredes group uh, showing all these excellent results. But there are other factors uh, when we're looking at outcomes from treatment and certainly uh, uh, upper air digestive tract function is incredibly important and we tend to uh, focus on voice and I think that is quite a controversial topic. When you're uh, uh, comparing transoral laser surgery to radiation, you know, there, there, there is a number of, uh, of controversies and debate to which is the superior modality. And one of the real big problems is, is that voice is really a multi-dimensional product and it's very difficult to, uh, to measure it according to a certain standard. And a lot of the evidence uh, results uh, uh, based on small heterogeneous uh, uh, series. So I think this is a real issue. I think in terms of swallow results, I think it is pretty obvious and well accepted that transoral laser surgery is, is associated with very good swallow function. 
the next important uh, outcome measure is quality of life. And that's probably the best, uh, the best uh, uh, thing uh, uh, that we can use to compare and, and look at our results. But again, there is a challenge. There is a significant amount of heterogeneity and subjectivity. But overall, I think in the end, we are treating patients to make them better and improve the quality of life. So uh, aside from the, uh, the physiologic factors of voice and swallow, quality of life is probably one of the most important uh, outcome measures that we need to look at uh, in transoral laser surgery. And when you look at the data uh, on transoral laser surgery, it is universally associated with excellent quality of life. Healthcare economics is clearly playing an increasing greater role uh, around the world. And clearly there are both direct and indirect costs to these patients. And when you look at uh, some of the numbers of how much uh, transoral laser surgery costs versus radiation, both in the US, Canada, and in Australia, uh, transoral laser surgery is far more cost effective than radiation. But interestingly, when you look at uh, a series from Belgium, uh, there seems to be uh, uh, an equal uh, uh, cost in terms of both radiation and transoral laser surgery. But there are other things such as indirect costs in terms of carers, time uh, uh, away from, from, uh, from employment, and also travel costs that need to be factored in. And certainly they tend to be in the favor of uh, a day surgery, which can often, uh, which, uh, which transoral laser surgery can often be done at uh, versus you know, five to six weeks uh, 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 daily courses of radiation. When you compare uh, the outcomes of radiation versus transoral laser surgery, there was an excellent systematic review by John Yu uh, in, in Canada who looked at uh, a number of studies and really found that survival and recurrence, there appeared to be no difference between uh, laser surgery and radiation. Larynx preservation will get in, uh, onto uh, a little bit later on. Uh, and again, it was a real challenge trying to uh, make sense of the outcomes in terms of voice. And, 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 and when he looked at some clinician and patient uh, observed uh, outcomes, really uh, there wasn't a whole lot of difference uh, between both radiation and transoral laser surgery. Larynx preservation, this is clearly very, very important. Uh, when you look at comparing radiation versus transoral laser surgery, there is no doubt that ultimate larynx preservation is far greater in those patients who undergo transoral laser surgery as their primary treatment. When you look at uh, uh, radiation failures, although we do talk about performing salvage surgery, uh, uh, salvage partial laryngectomy, in reality, three quarters of the patients who fail radiation end up uh, with, with a total laryngectomy. So clearly, uh, when you look at all the reports and certainly our series, larynx preservation is much higher in transoral laser surgery. When you look at our experience, uh, I, uh, we started our endoscopic laser service uh, at Westmead Hospital in Sydney in 2004 after I returned from fellowship. And initially it was quite a challenge establishing such a service within a unit where laser surgery was really not offered. And really across Australia, the primary treatment really was external beam radiation. Nevertheless, we've accrued a reasonable amount of, uh, of patients. Certainly, I'm always a little bit embarrassed when, uh, when I'm presenting when Professor Peretti is around because his numbers are, are clearly way off the charts. So, so when you look at our series, we recently looked at 129 cases of uh, in situ and T1 cancers. And we found that our disease-free survival, certainly within two years, uh, were excellent at 95%. And it did drop off, interestingly, at, uh, at five years. And I must say, this always relates to carcinoma in situ. Those patients tend to always come back and you do need to spend quite a bit of time uh, operating on them. Overall survival, it was excellent, uh, both at two and five year levels. And as I've just mentioned, uh, our larynx preservation rate was very acceptable at 96%. We looked at our complication rates and one of our formal fellows published uh, our data and found that uh, uh, we had very few major complications. We certainly didn't have any airway fires. 
Interestingly, we did have a number of minor complications, uh, such as granuloma formation. And, and I must say, uh, I remember Petra Umbrosch telling me that they're not really complications, they're really uh, 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 normal healing. And I guess I was just being uh, too, too honest, potentially. But overall, to say that it is a very safe procedure, and it was been a very safe procedure in our hands. One of the things that I learned uh, when I started doing transoral laser surgery was the concept that uh, a patient who went on to have a biopsy, uh, cancer was diagnosed, and then went on to have treatment. And certainly when they, on, when, when they on, went on and had surgical treatment, there are a number of patients ha who had no further cancer left uh, in the operative specimen. And interestingly, when I looked at the Steiner series, uh, when I spent some time with him, you know, he had quite a high rate of negative resection. And then when I looked at the literature, there were a number of patients who underwent open partial surgery who had negative resections. And lo and behold, if you look at some series, certainly one from Italy as well, you know, the, the negative resection rate was somewhere between 10 uh, and 30 uh, percent um, um, uh, uh, in, in these uh, patients undergoing laser surgery. So that made me, made me think, and, uh, and when you think about it, 10 to 30% of patients presenting to a head and neck MDT with a biopsy proven early glottic carcinoma no longer have any active disease present after uh, uh, their initial biopsy. So really that makes you think. It makes you think that all these excellent series uh, reporting uh, good outcomes of radiation for early glottic cancer will potentially contain up to 30% of patients with no active malignancy present. And, and really when, when you, you see that radiation and transoral laser surgery outcomes are equal, you know, it really begs the question, are they truly equal? And certainly this is something when I was training, uh, nobody really talked about uh, significantly. And I think this is something we really need to disclose to our patients, particularly when we are dealing with very small uh, and early invasive carcinoma. Oops, hang on. Now, just looking at uh, 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 some, of, uh, some of our cases, this is a, a very early cancer in a right vocal cord. In fact, in one of my anesthetic uh, uh, colleagues, you can see I like doing uh, in-office rigid laryngoscopy with a 70 degree scope. It, it really gives you a wonderful view and it allows you uh, to perform video stroboscopy. This is uh, uh, the intubation of the patient using the CMAX Stortz uh, endoscope and you can see the ET tube being guided in nicely. This is uh, the microscopic and endoscopic view of this very early T1A lesion, which is really ideal for, for both um, uh, uh, excision biopsy and cure with uh, trans or laser surgery. This is the fairly standard um, uh, approach. And uh, as my colleague said before, the DDO has really become the workhorse and an excellent uh, 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 laryngoscope for exposure. When you are performing this surgery, you can hydrodissect. I think a really important thing when you are performing surgery is to palpate the lesion and get a sense, <clears throat> excuse me, of, uh, of the degree of invasion and stiffness of the vocal fold. I think you can uh, hydrodissect, there's no doubt. Uh, as uh, Dr. Parikh said, I think you need to absolutely reduce the power of the laser and make sure it is uh, uh, focus so you have a nice crisp spot and you reduce the charring and the collateral damage and you can really truly perform microsurgery uh, uh, within the, 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 the larynx. I think uh, uh, the whole discussions about what type of resection, whether it's type one, type two, type three, uh, clearly you need to cut the cancer out so it's gone. Uh, the, the European classification is a great guide, but I think it's a great guide in comparing what we have done retrospectively uh, and after the fact. Uh, when you are performing surgery, you've really got to stick to the Halstedian principle of getting clear margins. So you can just see how we can just remove this lesion uh, and it's pretty well much in real time. One of the key things is, is to do a post-op endoscopy and you can see uh, you can see here how we pin the specimen and I think actually I talked about this uh, at, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, first, uh, first lecture. 
Now, this is, a, this is one of the first cases I did when I came back from overseas in 2004 and who really taught me a lot about uh, a laser surgery. This was a woman in her 80s who had a very uh, 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 a bulky, uh, possibly T2 lesion. I performed quite an extended uh, uh, cordectomy. And then when, when I scoped her postoperatively after a period of a couple of years, this is, I, I, I uh, beg your uh, pardon with the, uh, the, the image. I mean, this was old endoscopy material. Now we're much better, but you can see how the, 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 the cord has healed unbelievably well. And there's just a tiny little web. And, and this woman really taught me a lot about the healing power of the larynx and has really encouraged me to proceed with this kind of technique uh, for, all, uh, for a lot of my patients. This woman has very, uh, uh, very uh, um, uh, significant constriction of a false cord as a compensatory measure. And I'm sure Dan will talk a little bit more about how we can manage these patients. But this woman had one treatment and she really uh, 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 was disease free right to the point of discharge at five years. Um, this is uh, uh, another patient uh, who had quite a, a uh, bilateral or T1B lesion and really just to show this was a, a smoker who just did not want to have any radiation so we performed quite uh, extensive sur bilateral surgery from one uh, uh, vocal uh, process to the next right down into the subglottis and again uh, this guy had one treatment this is again a, a, a lesion I excised over 10 years ago and again you look at the power of how he's healed and you can just see you know, he's got amazingly uh, well healed vocal folds, but quite significant uh, compensatory superglottic uh, uh, constriction. And again, at two years, you can see uh, he remains disease free and he has a, a small little web, which is you expect, but he is very happy with his phonatory outcomes. He continued to smoke and after five or six years, he developed lung cancer and unfortunately succumbed uh, uh, to that. This, uh, this uh, uh, person uh, had a very extensive cancer of the, uh, the, the right vocal fold and, uh, and we performed uh, quite an extensive resection. I mean, you could probably upstage this guy to a T3 lesion because uh, uh, the, the mobility was somewhat reduced. But again, this, this showed me how these people heal. So this was a very extended uh, type six uh, 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 resection. You can see the post-operative appearance. You know, these people heal so well. They don't aspirate. Uh, they recover very nicely. And I took them back to the operating theater and you can see this amazing scar band uh, that is feel, uh, uh, formed and created a neocord. And when you look at his uh, stroboscopy at two years, you can see this excellent preserved wave on the contralateral side with uh, the right side as a nice buttress. And he had a very acceptable uh, and excellent and voice. So when you look at the outcome and prognosis uh, in patients after transoral laser surgery, I mean, they are conveniently divided into patient tumor, surgeon and institution factors. I mean, patient factors foremost, I always think are the anatomy of the patient and in terms of the access to the tumor, because as we've heard, if you cannot see the tumor uh, through various issues, then you're not going to be able to resect it. Other factors that are important are patient expectations and their performance status, and also how good their lung function is because occasionally patients will aspirate for a little bit and they need to be, be able to cope with that. Clearly, tumor factors rest on, on the stage and the extent of tumor, but there are certain biologies, tumor biologies, that we still cannot predict. And unfortunately, we only retrospectively find out whether the tumor uh, was very aggressive or not. And, and I think that is one of, the, uh, one of the factors why we do occasionally see patients do very poorly, no matter what we do. I think importantly, surgeon and institution factors play a role, and importantly, it's surgeon uh, training, experience, and, and volume. So when you look at uh, uh, transoral laser surgery, I think it is an excellent technique for early glottic cancer. It has been proven. You can perform it in an outpatient setting. 
Uh, it is quite site specific and pathology directed. You can monitor these patients very easily and you avoid having a lot of the edema that you may see after radiation. You can clearly repeat it and you have pathology for evaluation and research purposes. I think it has uh, minimal morbidity and excellent preserved upper air digestive tract function and quality of life. I think it is extremely cost and time effective and it can be part of any therapeutic uh, philosophy. And importantly, keeping radiation uh, up your sleeve for later, because we do know that 15 to 20% of these people recur. And we also know that 15 to 20% of patients with one head and neck cancer will get another head and neck cancer. So it's very important to keep all your armamentarium up your sleeve. So with this, I wanna thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Palm. <clears throat> uh, just probably a, a, a question. So uh, it's quite clear that T1 uh, lesions are better suited for surgery. T2 is when, uh, you know, these tumors gain access to another subsite of the larynx, probably the supraglottis or the subglottis, and where the lymphatic, uh, you know, extent uh, is a possibility. Well, that's where a lot of radial, uh, radio, radiation oncologists suggest uh, you know you sh that that should be the better treatment modality as compared to TLM. Any thoughts on that? Um, look, I think uh, 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 so. You're talking about T2 lesions or T1? Yeah, T T2. 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 Look, I yeah. think there's no doubt that the ideal lesion for laser is a T1A mid cord. But I think, uh, 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 you know, if you're a skilled trans or a laser surgeon and you work within a good team, I think you can pretty well tackle any stage one tumors. I think T2 are a very heterogeneous group, right? And, and, and you know, they range from very bulky tumors with a bit of minimal super or subglottic extension to those which are very bulky and actually have reduced mobility. So, so, you know, the, the earlier ones tend to behave more like a T, a T1 and the, the later ones tend to behave more like a, a T3. And the other important thing is you don't know what the tumor host uh, uh, interface is like in those patients. Like you saw that very bulky T2 lesion that I did. You know, I really did not think that it was amenable to laser surgery. But when we when we started removing the tumor, it became very clear that the tumor host interface was a pushing border and not an infiltrating border. So we could actually get very good oncologic margins and there were no negative factors such as lymphovascular perineural invasion. So I think the key point really here is, is T2, yes, I, I think they are uh, uh, clearly far more challenging, but I think you need to individualize your treatment and you really need to look at all those factors. So I, I, I would agree, but it, this is why we need to practice within a multidisciplinary team uh, uh, setting. Uh, everyone, the surgeon, the radiation oncologist has to discuss the issues with the patient. And then based on the comfort of the surgeon, you know, you can either uh, uh, choose to have a go and it also depends on the patient. You know. Carson, this is Deepak. Just say hi to you. Hi. Yeah, mate. Hi. How's it been? Yeah, good. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, mate. Are there any other questions? Hello. Oh, uh, sorry, I had some problems with my connectivity. Um, Hello? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Pam. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next session now uh, by Dr. Shamit Chopra. Sir, uh, over to you. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. And, uh, and you have the slide as well, right? Yes. Perfect. So good afternoon to everyone. And depending upon whatever part of the world you're in, I was just hearing Professor Peretti's and Dr. Carsten's talks. And, uh, and it's again been great that the stage is set for us to talk about not just technical perspectives, but also evidence. Special thanks to the HCG team, uh, especially Vishal, Akshay, uh, Anand, Bhargav and, and their dynamic team for really taking the initiative time after again to make sure that all of us learn as a, as a means of these international activities. So we will talk, of course, about uh, lesions mandating bilateral resection. So it's nice to pick up from where Carsten left off. 
but we start off with the with the basis which started the whole thing in terms of uh, henry hoffman's paper which made us think that non surgical organ preservation and the adherence to it all across the world might have been a factor which which decreased survival among our patients now that might be true for more stage 3 and stage 4 disease but it is a good uh, uh, setup for us to discuss how important multidisciplinary care is it is a system i'm borrowing the words from devita it's a system of care developed by the entire team so so we were just talking about multidisciplinary team inputs and it's important the ability to introduce salient points that are not being considered till this point and of course that's by means of a multidisciplinary team meeting as well and of course collaborative decision making so that to us uh, encompasses the essence of multidisciplinary care which we were just talking about and of course it's important to also know that this was the meta analysis that got all of us thinking as to whether non surgical organ preservation was actually the best option in laryngeal cancer and this should set the stage for us to talk about extended resections which we now do for routinely for at least t2 tumors so for the most part this uh, uh, graph on the top indicates the current scope of endoscopic treatment transoral approaches in the management of these three sites but in this presentation we'll be talking primarily about glottis t1b and t2 tumors we'll talk uh, briefly about extended glottic resections and maybe take forward what has been talked so far and at the end then of course through the course of this presentation we'll talk about evidence as has been available over the last decade because we want to be contemporary and we want to select correctly for our patients so we'll not be touching about older data we'll talk about 2010 onwards and what's its current quality and clinical applicability we do know that laser surgery has a role in uh, early glottic cancer uh, we know that we aim for a margin of about a millimeter or so we believe that it has immense potential for single day cost effective therapy in a country like india where treatment for early glottic cancer is driven by cost compliance commute treatment time to the nearest radiation treatment facility and a couple of other factors and of course we know that it reserves radiation for the sandwich setting i'm just going to glean over these very very quickly and in case any trainee especially is interested i'll be happy to mail the pdf to them at the end of this webinar but there are some technical prerequisites that that need to be kept in mind most importantly the point that's pointed out on the right where uh, once you're committed to endoscopic laser treatment we know that radiation oncology is an important part of armamentarium but we have to choose correctly so a resection should not be ruled out we also need to know that if you're treating early cancer you can't really do multimodality treatment on that unless the tumor has bad biological behavior and that's also something we need to understand consenting in these patients and this is a basket list of the things that we always can consent our patients for remember procedure specific consenting and patient counseling is the norm also for the trainees you will if not all but you'll need most of these tools in your armamentarium in case you are going to develop a practice of transoral laser microsurgery for for cancer and of course what guides us is the original ELS classifications and its subsequent modifications thereof which really tell us uh, define our anatomical limits for when to resect and what to resect and therein help us make the right choice moving on to the core topic uh, glottic resection a uh, couple of points that that would be important to the trainee as well as the early practicing oncologist we always rule out radiological upstaging prior to proceeding uh, whenever we do an eua prior to the resection be it initially or be it at the same sitting uh, we always palpate especially the medial and the lateral extent to make sure that we will be able to get away with a margin negative resection because that is the end point of this we are wary of supra and infra commissural extension uh it's in, and uh, professor peretti's group has done some uh, uh, very nice elegant work recently on horizontal versus vertical anterior commissural extension the vertical one is the one that you need to be especially aware of and we'll talk about it later as well we map with endoscopes very carefully and those include angled endoscopes that go intraglottic and help you map the subglottic extension and it's always helpful to have a dedicated anterior commissural endoscope we use the havas but the rudert is used by enough proponents as well we'll divide our glottic resections into till type 3 and type 4 and beyond so up till a type 3 for the most part our institutional philosophy is to resect on block uh sectioning whenever feasible but for the most part our type 3s will typically get a non block uh, it just helps our pathologist a little bit more and it also uh is in broad continuation of our philosophy about being able to offer that treatment uh which would be uh sufficiently uh encompassing oncologically will also be able to functionally rehabilitate these patients one important thing that we've realized during our journey so far is a higher magnification during muscle sectioning in type 3 cordectomies you have to watch for what we call the muscle emboli 
uh, and you really have to make sure that you get that one or two millimeter margin. I would typically aim at a two to three millimeter margin uh, because there is going to be ex vivo shrinkage. And prior to your specimen orientation, you need to keep that in mind. Again, these perspectives are only relevant to uh, type one to type three cortectomy. Specimen handling is important. Uh, we talked about aiming for those margins. Uh, we ink or orient as feasible. Uh, we could normally use just colored pens on a, on a cardboard. Some people use inks. If we are concerned about the deep margin, I use only one colored ink, and that's usually India ink at the deep aspect. And the specimen should be ideally evaluated the same day, which is by and large possible in most of our patients the same day as well. And we freeze from the tumor bed, and we have our pathologists submit the entire specimen for evaluation so that they can get true margins as opposed to trying for frozen from the patient cell. <clears throat> what does data tell us about the T1A lesion, which typically would be amenable to an early cordectomy? These are all case series and uh, by and large indicate that the laser is here to stay in the management of, as uh, Dr. Karsten was talking about, the early glottic cancer. The early glottic cancer, of course, is amenable to up till a type 3 cordectomy, uh, the, that classic T1A lesion. And for the most part, we can say that in view of all the issues that we've discussed so far, uh, it would be considered the standard of care. If we look at meta-analysis for early lesions, again, for the most part, T1A, yes, there are some T2 sprinkled over here and a few T1Bs, but for the most part, this is T1A data. And we know that voice handicap indices, again, is not very high quality data, but we know that there's no significant difference in voice outcomes uh, up till a level three cordectomy, and this is long-term, of course. The cost of a laser, at least uh, in our country, is lower than the average cost of radiation therapy. I work in a private institution where a patient either has to get his treatment subsidized partially or has to do self-pay. So it forms an important consideration in a country like ours. So as far as T1A is concerned, by early, I mean very early in T1A, the laser is probably the standard of care, barring other considerations, of course. The evidence is replete, but remember that it is conflicting. By and large, we can divide the evidence into oncological and voice outcomes. These are a few meta-analysis for T1 disease of TLM versus radiation therapy. Of late, as mentioned, there's been a trend towards improved laryngeal preservation and local control if we, if we resect for the laser. And there are questionably better voice outcomes with radiation, but remember that only applies to patients with the large volume T1 disease, or to the, so to speak, the endophytic T1 disease, which would typically have deeper extension and thus would get more than a type three cordectomy. Moving on to anterior commissure involvement. Uh, alluding to a paper by, by Cesar and his team, uh, anterior commissure involvement, as all of us know by now, and that's pretty much across the board, that all of us believe that involvement of the anterior commissure will decrease survival. In this paper, it decreased it manifold up to five to nine times on univariate as well as multivariate analysis to the extent that the authors actually proposed an independent T category for anterior commissure extension. I believe this has been discussed in various laryngeal oncology meetings as well, and maybe a few years down the line, because all of us believe that anterior commissure involvement is not only a, a determinant for uh, extent of surgery, but also for the eventual choice of treatment modality that we believe that that day is not far away. And also there are certain considerations that we have to keep in mind. So when we talk about resecting the anterior commissure, which is going to form about 50% of our talk, uh, we need to know first which cases not to proceed with. In our practice, at least access issues uh, pretty much form a contraindication if you, if your vestibular otomies and if your external pressures and your positioning maneuvers and uh, table positioning and everything are not able to solve the problem, then if you are not able to encompass the lesion in all dimensions, uh, that would typically be a contraindication to endoscopic laser treatment. Cartilage erosion and membranous extralaryngeal spread. Uh, there are some authors who, who push the envelope in that direction, but we don't. We believe that there are better options for those patients therapeutically because oncological outcomes would be paramount. Gross pre-epiglottic space and paraglottic space invasion, not just an immobile cord, but also an retinoid typically indicates uh, fixation of the joint, uh, not just a mechanical effect on the cord, and that would be a contraindication. Uh, and a PFS involvement beyond the lateral wall would also be a contraindication. Again, in the hands of experienced operators, I believe Professor Peretti in the morning talked about hypopharyngeal disease and how it extrapolates into TLM being a, being a viable option for them. But we only resect minimal hypopharynx uh, with, the, with, the, with the CO2 laser or with the robot in supraglottic disease for that matter. But extensive involvement would typically be a contraindication at our institution. Of course, the images that you see radiologically would all be uh, corroborative of this. 
And of course, the picture that you see would also be corroborated. This is a lesion that you will not take up. Uh, to summarize the contraindications, uh, we look at a series of radiological images that would, that would help us decide as to what cases uh, to take up in terms of uh, offering endoscopic laser treatment. Of course, the one on the right is a no-no. It's straight dependence and extra laryngeal spread. On the picture in the middle, on the video in the middle, you have uh, gross cartilage erosion, and that's also a contraindication. And on the left, you have hypopharyngeal extension, which is also a contraindication as per our institution philosophy. So once you've ruled out what patients you're going to subject an extended glottic resection to, uh, you want to uh, ascertain certain other factors. And of course, we encapsulated these in this slide. We want to carefully re review radiology to a certain surgical candidacy. In each and every case, be it an early glottic cancer or a very early glottic cancer, you want to counsel about radiation therapy as an alternative. Typically, a radiation oncology appointment every single time would be the norm. Uh, we'll talk about patient preferences shortly, but uh, what we have realized as part of our institutional practice is that most patients would elect the laser for the reasons that we've already talked about. Remember now that when we go past uh, type 3 cordectomy, section resections are commonplace to be able to ensure the oncological efficacy. A second look procedure we'll talk about briefly afterwards, and, and I hope it's been talked about during the course of the webinar, but that really divides all of us. A lot of us think that, uh, that there's no therapeutic benefit, that we can follow these patients with routine endoscopic assessment and radiology. And some of us believe that if you have margin positive T1B or T2 disease, uh, you might want to consider taking these patients up and doing a map and biopsy. We have specific indications for that, and we believe the Italian groups have specific indications for that as well but we'll talk about that. But do remember, don't take it off the table completely. It might be beneficial in very select circumstances. The last two points, I, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, this is actually something that we changed in our practice in the last four years after some extensive discussions with some pioneers. Uh, remember Professor Ramikul in particular, we had a long discussion about using PPIs for three months in the sections that are subperichondrial because at the end of the day, you don't really want granulomas anteriorly. Not every single time will you get the nice result that uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Carsten showed us, in which you don't really have granulomas anteriorly, which make you think in a margin positive and a negative second local section that you're potentially dealing with recurrence. So we now cover them with proton pump inhibitors for three months, and perichondritis needs to be covered for as well with a short-term fluoroquinolone. Uh, these points uh, would by and large cover uh, the points that are necessary before we embark on extended glottic resections. What do we know about anterior commissure involvement? Some case series, again, to start off with by the pioneer of us all. Uh, this is a review of T1B disease, uh, 51 odd cases. Surgical complications are minimal, but as you would expect from literature from that time, there's no reporting on voice sequelae or on swallowing, something that needs to be rectified. This is the way a cord looks like after uh, a resection incorporating a, a 5A cordectomy, and this is a short-term result, about one to two months post. Also do remember before you start uh, considering an extended glottic resection, that there is something that I call uh, the inflammatory component of the tumor. Uh, just like there's a biological heterogeneity in all internet cancers, even glottic cancer uh, has a component of that. And we'll talk about that shortly as well in terms of the markers that are, that are exciting new markers that are really coming in. Uh, there is a biological heterogeneity. So for the initial EUA in this patient on the left picture, you really find something which would be amenable only to a type 5A, but it looks more granular and does not really give the appearance of all of it being tumor. So take these patients uh, back after a couple of weeks, and this is the picture that you get eventually, and this patient gets a type 2 product. So it's important that you, that you know that some of these patients are going to have an inflammatory component, especially because the part of the country that I practice in has a very high incidence of laryngopharyngeal reflux disease. So you'll typically get these angry looking larynges, you'll get concomitant LPR, and uh, we really found it very beneficial. And that's about 10 or 15 odd patients. So we will able to downstage the resection and eventually still be margin negative by making sure that we paid heed to the inflammatory component. There's also one more aspect that I'd like to put, uh, take your attention to is the exophytic versus the endophytic disease. So the picture in the middle indicates that it could potentially be early disease. The picture on the left indicates that it might be a little bit more with the leukoplakia extending up to the anterior commissure, but eventually, the picture in the middle ends up getting a bigger resection because there is more endophytic disease. And that's where clinical radiological evaluation really becomes so important. That's where your palpation uh, uh, intraoperatively before circumscribing the tumor, as well as your radiological imaging uh, really forms such a big role. For the most part, 
all your patients should get cross-sectional radiology because that really helps you rule out the endophytic disease and helps you counsel your patient about voice outcomes accordingly. So what else does literature tell us about uh, anterior commissure involvement? This is a sobering paper. Uh, it showed modest five-year DFS and a local control rate, albeit the laryngeal preservation rate was high, which means that these patients had to be salvaged either by an open partial laryngectomy, a repeat laser resection, or for the most part, radiation therapy. Uh, the picture on the right uh, indicates how the perichondrium looks like after it has that neopericondrium coming on top of it. And that would be an acceptable outcome for a patient who's had a type 5 avaricondectomy. So what do we do then? Uh, if getting a, a low local control rate or, or low DFS is a concern, why not consider radiation therapy for all of these comers? <clears throat> Because besides the facts that we talked about, the cost, the compliance, the commute time, and general patient preference, it's also important to know that you will still have lesions like the ones that we're seeing in this picture, where encompassing the lesion and still doing a type 5A cordectomy would be very oncologically feasible. Also, it will be a single day treatment. We know based on this study, it's a Canadian multi-center study, that oncological outcomes were similar and VHI scores were similar as well. Having said that, we do get our fair share of patients who get some webbing at the anterior commissure, but there are ways to avoid that, like we talked about earlier. There is more elegant data on voice outcomes following advanced cordectomy. And again, these are type four and higher, in which uh, after doing a cordectomy, the VHI scores were improved serially. So if you observe these patients over a period of three to six months, the voice and handicap indices really improved. However, it was a, it's again worth noting that the maximum phonation time was permanently decreased in some subsets, especially the patients in whom the anterior commissure was completely receptive. And also it was notable as a result of the study that a significant minority need vocal intervention. And uh, trust me when I say that, because of my background in otolaryngology, our team really tries to rehabilitate these patients post-extended cordectomy and vocal fold injection and medialization laryngoplasty don't really work as well. Essentially, it ends up being uh, a combination of speech therapy, about swallowing uh, therapy, about making sure that you're covered with PPIs, and really hope for the best possible outcome, which is why initial patient outcome becomes so, uh, selection becomes so important. One aspect in extended glottic resections that had not been paid too much heed to, like in this tumor that you're seeing in the left picture, is the need for tissue removal just for access, not just incorporating for oncology. This paper is the only one uh, I came across which actually uh, covers that. A significant proportion of these patients, about 20% of these patients needed a partial epiglottectomy. And this is again for patients who had early stage glottic squamous cell car carcinoma, all comers, but with significant anterior commercial involvement in a lot of these. About 30 to 40% of patients required a partial or a total vestibulectomy. And of course, external pressure, which all of us rely on, tricoid pressure, continuous or intermittent, is something which of course is not function preserving, but there's no data currently that we have, and hopefully some of it is in the offing, which will tell us whether or not removal of those uh, ancillary structures, the vestibular fold, were associated with any poor outcomes. Because a lot of us as laryngeal cancer surgeons rely on that falsetto voice produced by vestibular fold approximation to give these patients a good vocal outcome. It's important, of course, that uh, prior to proceeding, we use uh, an exposure predictor. We had Cesar over at our institution in 2014, where he gave us a sneak peek of the Laringo score. And it took us a couple of years to get used to using it. But since 2017, we've been using the Laringo score as standard. And if Cesar is listening to this, he'll be happy to know that we've seen it so far to extrapolate fairly equally to Indian patients as he would have seen to his Italian patients. So, well, how, do we, how do we conclude our literature review on T1B glottic squamous post laser treatment? This is the largest systematic review that I came across, more than 2000 patients. And again, it was sobering that even though the overall survival was similar, there was a higher recurrence rate with TLM compared with radiation therapy, as well as with open partial laryngectomy. We'll talk about OPL in a second, but it's important to know that as we take our discussion onward into T2, uh, we need to know that T1B, again, is only for the experienced operators, the kind of operators that have been speaking at this wonderful webinar. Uh, there is a learning curve, of course, which is, supposed to, which is supposed to go over. We became a laser institution in 2012. It was not till early 2014 when we really started doing extended resections because we wanted to be comfortable with the data set that we had for our initial patients 
our margin positivity, our functional rehabilitation, so to speak. So with this in mind, let's move on to T2 and talk a little bit about radiation as we go along. This is the largest study, the one on the right that's been quoted. It's uh, a largest single series, I would say. 390, almost 400 patients in which T2 and T3 have been resected uh, with TLM. The series on the left also have reasonably okay outcomes for T2 disease. Remember, we've shifted gears from T1B to T2 now. And some data incorporating T2 lesions is again highlighted in the table over here. It's again notable that the eventual laryngeal preservation rate over the study period in all of these studies was more than 90%. And that of course is reassuring, which means that you can potentially extrapolate laser surgery to a significant proportion of these patients. As you can see, the tumor stage in all of these is T2, and some of them have been selected to just include T2A and T2B, and again, that's something we'll talk about. The local control rates compare, uh, if not favorably, at least equally with historical radiation reported outcomes. So we know that T2 is also a patient subset where we can take our laser and, and again, after the necessary expertise, extrapolate it to our patients. Uh, this, again, is the largest systematic review that we found for T2 glottic squamous, a uh, large number of patients, more than 1,000 transoral laser uh, surgeries, more than 3,000 XRT. Uh, again, heartening that five-year local control rates were similar. Uh, there was a higher local failure once you, once you take that T2A versus T2B. So maybe to take what we took forward from our Italian friends, there might be a case in point for really restaging not just the T1B disease, but also to resegregate what T2A and T2B means. And that's something that's good for that. So when you talk about T2B disease, again, another study which compared T2A versus T2B retrospectively, but, uh, but kind of in a head-to-head -head basis, the five-year local control rate was significantly different with the laser. Uh, the T2A disease had about 70% and T2B had 57%, statistically significant. Also, as we anticipated, what we know from our European friends is that the voice handicap indices improved significantly over time once you resect, but it did not improve significantly for T2B patients post laser resection. So as an institution, we are still in two minds whether we should be doing laser for T2B disease. And there's another couple of perspectives that probably form that basis. So for a large verucoid lesion like this, this would still be the patient that we would address with laser. As far as uh, doing uh, a laser resection for, uh, for T2B disease. Otherwise, I would be concerned. It's something that we, that we tend to take on a very individual basis because literature is not really very clear on T2A versus T2B. This patient has had a laser resection, as you can see in the right picture, where the margin negative resection, and eventually he'll receive a tracheotomy as well as a keel insertion. So the proponents of radiation therapy would advocate, given what we discussed, uh, about pushing radiation therapy for all T2B patients. However, there is another important element that we haven't kept in mind, and that is the patient factor. Interesting study, this is non-T-specific counseling of patients, 64 patients who were counseled for all three modalities, uh, the laser, open partial laryngectomy, as well as external beam radiation therapy, all chose laser treatment. Case in point for laser, of course, for the cost and compliance uh, reason, single day treatment that we talked about, patients tend to think more in terms of laser, uh, so the, it behooves us clinicians to make sure that we use whatever is at our disposal, clinical, radiological, and functional, to make sure that we're able to really rehabilitate our patients better and by offering them the correct modality of treatment. Is there anything else that can help predict response in the T2 subset? Uh, because we're only focusing our attention to that right now. Very interesting, promising markers. There's uh, the RAP53 beta cytoplasmic staining uh, in this study uh, from, uh, from Scandinavia was indicative of a worse five-year DFS. Uh, there's another marker called Survivin, which had a better five-year DFS if there was nuclear staining positive in these patients. And P16 positivity, as you would imagine, extrapolating from oropharyngeal or laryngeal primaries will have a better DFS. So again, there, is things on, there are things on the horizon which will probably help us decide whether or not radiation needs to be offered to this patient subset. Of course, keeping in mind patient factors and tumor factors. A couple of other points before, uh, before we start winding this up. It is important that if you're committed to doing a bilateral glottic, glottic resection, like in this case, fairly superficial disease. However, we do know that we'll have to incorporate the anterior commissure uh, because it seems to be contiguous with the disease. Either we, but again, this happens to be uh, a case in which there is normal intervening mucosa so you would be able to get a margin negative resection, 
essentially the trade off in this case would be staging versus stenting which means if you stage the tumor then you can let the the vocal fold heal adequately and prevent back formation and subsequent sanike by taking up the, the the other tumor later of course that's dependent on patient compliance so in our indian populations it becomes a relatively easy question we uh, presented on oral cancer compliance in a data set of more than 400 patients recently at new orleans and the findings were sobering as you would imagine most of our indian counterparts would have populations that have variable rates of compliance and they're driven by a lot of things including social economy but at our institution we take a decision between uh, putting in a keel if you're doing a single stage resection if there are compliance issues and of course a tracheotomy which actually is a functional correlate versus a second stage if the patient is compliant and again it depends on institutional philosophy couple of points because a lot of these patients will have t2 blotters especially will have scant subglottic extension a uh, couple of points that are that are noted down here which might be helpful in case you have minimal subglottic extension and you still want to take these patients up um, and again like i said for the trainees i'd be happy to mail the pdf in case someone is interested last point which we'll cover before uh, before uh, ending the conversation on t2 are margins remember that uh, when you start pushing that envelope that we've been talking about type 4 or higher cordectomies the incidence of positive margins will increase this study uh, had a 22% margin positivity all type 5a cordectomies and again subcategorization of anterior commissural involvement was recommended fairly recent study which again our european counterparts have done uh, if not currently published but at least uh, explained or presented to us so that all of us have a slightly easier path as we go on and of course these patients would also be potential candidates for what we call a second look procedure also to reduce margin positivity it's important that your specimen handling and processing becomes important so section resections are commonplace your vestibular fold might get resected separately for access or for other issues and this is the kind of uh, tumor in which you'd want to go to the grossing room not just rely on them to send you the frozen but also to ink the tumor to mark the tumor and to orient it so that you get a comprehensive report and you really Uh, a little more at ease at the end of the histopathology which corroborates your clinical uh, judgment that the tumor resection has been truly complete so a second look procedure according to us should be ad lib and we currently do it only for t1b or t2 resections which had at least one margin positive even if the final margin uh, were eventually returned negative our margin positivity for these patient subsets is 11% correct what about follow up uh, you can choose endoscopic surveillance if you have nbi or you could choose radiological surveillance barring this the few candidates that are candidates for second look most people would choose a combination of both of these and adhere to nccn guidelines or anything that you believe uh, offers your patients the right kind of follow up protocol so for the first uh, four and a half years of our experience we did 142 uh, co2 laser resections for cancer this constituted a little more than one fourth of our laser census as you would imagine glottic resections con contributed the majority T1 contributed a slight majority at a median follow up of 36 months this was data presented at the Indian Cancer Congress in 2017 we had local control rate which we should have imagined from uh, a relatively short term follow up where the predominant pattern of failure is not local uh, we should have also imagined this local control rate given the fact that most of the tumors that we tackled were T1 one of our patients needed a laryngectomy eventually due to due to a recurrence a multifocal recurrence of the anterior commissure and we had one treatment associated mortality since that time we've uh, we've also collated our data on extended resections which we've defined as greater than or equal to type 4 cordectomies which is 4 5 and 6 over a 6 year period we've done 72 and that data will be sharing with you very soon also remember that all of these patients are not just candidates for laser or radiation therapy some of them are actually candidates for an open partial laryngectomy and you have to select very carefully we currently use an open partial laryngectomy where after initial screening with a ct and problem solving using usually becker's criteria with an mr we still end up having a cartilage that looks a little bit suspicious so that is one candidate for an open partial laryngectomy in our book a uh, very select salvage cases get open partial laryngectomy but that's always has to be after a functional assessment the paper that's listed at the bottom is a very elegant paper that actually helps you select uh, what kind of open partial laryngectomy you're going to choose but that's another topic and another day of course I'll skip over this, but uh, just to just to reiterate the point that for T2 or higher disease, we always do a functional assessment at our institution, and of course, salvage rates are limited by 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 what we have over here. Couple of papers on that. 
all patients get a functional assessment to decide the extent of resection, whether laser is an option. And of course, every single patient has to be, have a discussion of all modalities. So ending and encapsulating the management as we have at our institution and based on our understanding of T1B and T2 glottic squamous, remember a multidisciplinary approach. We've been talking about it at the outset. All of our esteemed speakers have been talking about it. The correct selection of treatment modality between surgery and radiation and within the subset of surgery between laser, extended laser, uh, between uh, uh, open partial laryngectomy will be key to optimal treatment outcomes and not just treatment outcome because for the most part, these patients have great prognosis, but also obviate toxicity, which is essentially voice outcomes, which we need to keep in mind. If we individualize our treatment based on a selection of uh, uh, the appropriate modality, we can truly ensure a functionally out optimized outcome. And rehabilitation, largely voiced to some extent solving for T2 or higher tumors uh, in these patient subsets can manifest, uh, can mitigate manifest mobility. And at the end, as we mentioned, there are future developments and hopefully we can reverse the adverse trends in survival, really take our local control rates up higher, really take the laryngeal preservation rate close to that 100% which we aim for. And, and truly that would be the synopsis of, uh, of management of early glottic cancer the way I see it. Leaving you with a few pictures of our laryngectomy club. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shamit. It was an excellent talk, uh, quite a comprehensive one. Uh, I think one of the important points that you had brought in, especially for the youngsters, is the heterogeneity within the tumor, uh, which, you know, probably uh, there has been a lot of... Uh, you know, thoughts are uh, being put by the radiation oncologist also looking at the tumor biology, which could be a reason why, you know, standard doses uh, would not result in effective treatment. And uh, that's why probably TLM fares better. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we'll uh, uh, go to the next uh, talk. Sure. Uh, the next talk... Uh, uh, the next talk uh, is by Professor Devinder Chokar on the anatomical perspectives and classifications in TLM. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me or see me? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, we had great talks. I'll try to make it full screen. Uh, is it full screen? Yeah, lovely. So we had great talks on um, extent of uh, surgery, some... Uh, uh, great uh, wide excisions of uh, trans lasers, uh, surgery, extensive excisions, uh, type 6 cordectomies uh, going right up to the thyroid cartilage. Uh, but it's good to have some anatomical perspectives and know uh, about the anatomy before we venture into uh, these uh, extensive resections because the anatomy uh, while doing laser endoscopic surgery is a little different uh, from what we normally encounter uh, when we do a laryngectomy or for that matter, a conservative laryngeal surgery. So proper understanding uh, of the anatomy is extremely important uh, to plan uh, surgery. And in laser, you need to know the anatomy in reverse. Uh, you're going from the mucosa outwards. You need to know where the vessels enter. You need to know what uh, structures lie beyond what you're excising because going from outside in, you always uh, encounter these vessels uh, uh, first and you can ligate them. But when you're doing laser or endoscopic surgery, uh, you will encounter them later in your course. So uh, during my talk, I'm not going to talk about uh, routine anatomy that is made up of three, uh, three paired and three unpaired cartilages and so on and so forth. You can read that from textbooks. Uh, RJ Last gives a lovely version uh, or detailed anatomy uh, or any other textbook. But I'm going to talk uh, uh, more uh, relevant anatomy uh, when you do for laser, for doing laser surgery. And uh, before we go to anatomy, uh, you have to know embryology. And as you all know, the Glottis is uh, derived from uh, the buccopharyngeal analyze. The supraglottis comes from the buccopharyngeal analyze three and four, while the uh, glottis is derived from the tracheobronchial analyze. And because of this uh, embryological development, there are two distinct compartments uh, which are bounded by ligaments and perichondria. And because they're distinct compartments, uh, a tumor, and this was done by dye studies earlier, that when they injected dye in one of the uh, one of the subsites, it, it, it was retained there for a long time before it spread to the other region. And this is exactly what happens in, in cancer, that cancers of a particular site remains there in the early stages, unless it, it becomes advanced and breaches the barriers, and then it, it spreads to the other side. What you must know about the anatomy is that the histological spread, histological studies have shown that tumor spread occurs along collagen bundles, and where the connective tissue membrane attaches to the cartilage, 
there are chances of tumor involvement. Uh, so as the tumor extends, as the tumor in, uh, uh, expands, the collagen bundles also expand, resulting in direct spread in the pericondrium. Three important spaces when you are doing laser surgery. Uh, the first is the Renke space. Uh, this is very important when you're dealing with superficial tumors and a lot of uh, uh, surgeons have the, uh, uh, do what is called as hydro dissection. They inject uh, uh, saline adrenaline into the space and uh, see if the tumor lifts off. If it lifts off, it is thought to be superficial. If it doesn't lift off, it is thought to be adhered to deeper structures. But nowadays we don't need to do this because we have better anatomical imaging. And sometimes by doing this, you may lift off tumor and part of the tumor can be left behind. So an important space, uh, it's, it's a space that is just between the squamous epithelium and above uh, the lamina propria or the vocal ligament. The pre-epiglottic pre space uh, is important. Uh, it lies uh, in front of the thyroid membrane uh, bounded by the epiglottis and the thyroid cartilage uh, and the thyroid membrane. Two important things that you must remember. Uh, one, it is rich in lymphatics. So the spread uh, of, uh, to the nodes is high if the pre-epiglottic space tumor is involved, space is involved. And the blood supply is poor, so it is radio-resistant. Uh, these tumors are radio-resistant. Also, an uh, important point is that it is continuous with the paraglottic space, so you must look for tumor spread from the pre-epiglottic space to the paraglottic space. Of course, uh, tumors that are in the pre-epiglottis are stage T3. And finally, the paraglottic space, which uh, lies uh, uh, along your thyroid, which contains the thyroid muscle, actually, uh, is important space. Again, these tumors are uh, stage ST3. Uh, again, this tumor, as I said earlier, uh, uh, this space is linked with the preepiglottic space, and tumors can go from one place to the other. I'll cover uh, anatomy. Uh, when you look at anatomy, there are certain points that you need to remember uh, when you do laser surgery. And, and uh, that is what will tell you what is the extent and whether to do surgery or not to do surgery. So you must remember that the glottis has paucity of lymphatics. There are very few lymphatics in the glottis and hence that allows the nodal metastasis rate is much lower in the glottis and that allows you, uh, or glottis, glottic disease is a forgiving disease and that allows you to take close margins, which uh, uh, gives you a good uh, functional outcome at, as was uh, uh, told uh, to us by the previous speaker. Remember, the subglottis is uh, lymphatic rich. There are a lot of lymphatics in the subglottis. And uh, when you are treating subglottic tumor, just because you have a laser, just don't go in and hack out the tumor. When you're treating subglottis, the treatment is dictated by lymphatic metastasis. So the lymph node management is important when you're treating subglottis. And that is an anat anatomical difference uh, between the glottis and the subglottis. Also, uh, we can, uh, you, know, you just heard great talks on open partial laryngectomy and that is, you can do this because the lymphatics are distinct above and below the cords. But once the tumor breaches these boundaries and becomes transglottic, so if a glottic tumor is involving the supraglottic or goes to the subglottis, uh, or, or a tumor that trans, transcends the uh, uh, ventricle, it's called a transglottic tumor, these tumors have, have a high incidence of extralaryngeal spread. So when you see a tumor like this, uh, uh, beware, look at your imaging very carefully and don't rush in with a laser because these tumors tend to be extensive and tend to be uh, uh, tend to have a higher lymph node metastasis and extra laryngeal spread. Hypopharynx, uh, very few surgeons will venture into the hypopharyngeal area with a laser for two reasons. One, the exposure is not great uh, unless it is a posterior pharyngeal wall lesion, but more importantly, hypopharynx is, is distinct from larynx. It, it, there is a tendency for submucosal spread and you may get positive margins uh, because you will not be able to assess submucosal spread because of the absence of tactile uh, stimulus. Uh, there is a high incidence of nodal metastasis just like the supraglottis. It is a lymphatic rich area and uh, you will uh, have to tackle the lymphatic uh, metastasis uh, when, you, when you are looking at the treatment as a whole for hypopharyngeal cancer. Uh, so these are the two important uh, uh, anatomical points. And, and the third is when you have posterior pharyngeal wall growth, don't miss the retropharyngeal nodal involvement. A couple of slides on the anterior commissure. As you know, that the cartilage gets involved uh, where there is uh, attachment, uh, muscular attachment uh, uh, on the cartilage. And uh, there is a lack of perichondrium there. There is a direct tumor involvement. And the second point you need to remember is that tumor preferentially uh, gets uh, uh, involved with ossified part of the cartilage than non-ossified part. A lot of uh, discussion was uh, on, on the anterior commissure and Shamit just showed us how you have uh, poorer control rates and or our need of second surgery or need for 
um, salvage surgeries uh, when you have um, uh, anterior commercial involvement, and that is because the Broyles ligament, which is a dense con connective tissue at the anterior commissure, uh, links directly to the uh, thyroid cartilage. There is no perichondria. So the, it is continuous with the intermediate lamina of the thyroid cartilage, and it extends just above the glottic plane. And this is a vulnerable area because tumors uh, can directly uh, involve uh, the, the cartilage, uh, and that can be a subtle involvement, and you may miss this involvement, uh, hence uh, uh, causing understaging and uh, having a tumor positive without uh, you realizing that. So an important area when you're doing laser surgery. Besides what I just told you, uh, uh, involvement of the cartilage, another important uh, peculiarity of the anterior commissure anatomically is it is very close to the supraglottis and the subglottis. The subglottis, glottis, and subglottis are within two to four millimeters of anterior commissure. And I told you how these tumors behave radically differently. So if you have a tumor which is in the supraglottis, the incidence of lymphatic metastasis increases, um, and, and, so, and so do the lymphatic metastasis increase if you have a subglottic tumor. Also, if you have a subglottic extension, then you need to know whether it is going uh, close to the cricoid cartilage or not, because then you may have to convert this into uh, what Dr. Peretti showed us as a, as a open partial laryngectomy rather than doing an endoscopic excision, which may, which may not be feasible, at least for people who are just starting out their practice. Another important uh, point is it's a very narrow field, the anterior commissure, and sometimes visualization may be difficult. Anatomical visualiz visualization of tumors may be difficult. And this is an important point, and talk about it a little later when I talk about the control rates or, or anatomical constraints which uh, hamper uh, control rates in laryngeal surgery. An important point when you're doing laser surgery or any endoscopic surgery is to know your vascular anatomy. Uh, as you know, when we do open surgery, it is very easy. The vessels are in front of you and you can get these vessels. When you're doing uh, mucosa out, the vessels will come as, as you go digging into the mucosa and the submucosa and the muscle. So you must know where these vessels lie, which vessels to clip and which ones to coagulate. As you know, the CO2 laser coagulates vessels up to 0.5 millimeter in thickness. So anything about that, uh, you need to be careful. Uh, there is a risk of uh, uh, reaction bleeding, so you need to clip these vessels. If you look at the anatomy, the uh, branch of the superior laryngeal artery, so the larynx, as you know, is, uh, uh, is supplied by the superior and the inferior laryngeal artery. The superior laryngeal artery uh, uh, is uh, divides into the epiglottic artery, which supplies the A fold and the PE fold. Um, uh, and then there is a branch which divides further into the anterior inferior artery, uh, anteriorly, which goes anteriorly, and there's a posterior inferior artery, which again divides into a posterior division and an anterior division, which goes up along the vocal cords. I'll show this to you in a, in a, in a better diagram. So this is the epiglottic artery. Uh, this is the artery that you need to, uh, the EA that is labeled. This is the artery which normally comes in your way when you're doing either robotic surgery and you take your PE fold cut or laser surgery, and this bleeds torrentially. So you must look out for this artery and clip this artery uh, when you're doing uh, an endoscopic surgery. Another important artery are the anterior, inferior, and the posterior artery. Uh, they form uh, what is called as the, uh, they, they are in the paraglottic space and you can hold them with the forceps and cauterize these. These are not very large arteries. The dimension of these, this artery here is about 2.4. As it goes up, it is, it is still more than 0.5 millimeters. But here, the, 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 uh, the uh, anastomoting are quite thin and you can hold them with the, with the forceps and, and coagulate them. So these are the anastomotic branches between the posterior uh, inferior or posterior branch of the posterior inferior artery and the uh, paracommissural uh, branch of the cricothyroid artery. The, these various anastomotic uh, branches are there. Uh, one in the paraglottis, so as you uh, cut your uh, cord and uh, get it to the paraglottic space, you'll encounter bleeding, uh, but you can uh, 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 you don't need to clip that, you can uh, easily coagulate that. So an important uh, vascular anatomy must be kept in mind as you're treating these tubers. So two uh, important systems uh, which you need to uh, look out is the anterior commissure uh, branch, uh, where it branches into the anterior inferior and the posterior uh, paracommissural artery, and the vocal process where the terminal branch is anastomous uh, with each other. So vascular anatomy is very important uh, when you're doing endoscopic uh, uh, laser surgery or endoscopic, even for that matter, even robotic surgery. Right, so we've learned about the anatomy, the vascular anatomy a bit. Now let's look at what happens. What are the factors that predict and Shamit has spoken about this, but I'll put it in an anatomical perspective. Uh, the first is difficult laryngeal exposure and Shamit alluded to this. Uh, look at the five-year control rate. It, it drops down significantly uh, when you don't have, have exposure. So if you're not getting good exposure, 
Uh, so if you have limited mouth opening, a receding jaw jawline, patient is obese, has a large tongue, with the tongue fall, uh, better uh, to abandon uh, laser surgery and go for other means, either radiation or open partial laryngectomy. We spoke about anterior commissure, uh, the, the, the importance of uh, uh, staging it properly because of the cartilage invasion and also uh, assessing the tumor with a zero degree endoscope to see for uh, extent into the, either the subglottis or the supraglottis. Anterior commissure is an area where you will normally fail uh, and the rate control rates are inferior uh, if the tumor is situated in the, in the anterior commissure. And that is why uh, assessment of anterior commissure with respect to spread and superiorly or inferiorly is extremely important. Paraglottis, well, anterior paraglottic involvement is not so much of a problem. It's a relative uh, contraindication, but you saw extended resections uh, by the masters uh, where you have uh, extensive resections of the is going right up to the uh, thyroid cartilage. And we'll talk about the classification of uh, uh, lasers uh, in the next couple of slides. But anterior paraglottic space, but be careful of posterior paraglottic space involvement because this space is close to the cricoarytenoid joint. So the moment your tumors come into the posterior uh, uh, paraglottic space, be very careful uh, of assessing these tumors and going in with a transoral laser microscopic surgery, laser surgery. And finally, arytenoid excision, you saw uh, uh, open surgery being, uh, you could excise the aret one arytenoid cartilage and all you need for any conservative laryngeal surgery is only one a functioning crico arytenoid joint. But as, doc, as uh, they mentioned, Dr. Perenti mentioned that you have to do it in very specific uh, indications and very specific patients. And we normally don't uh, uh, do these extended dissections because aspiration is a big problem uh, and local control rates are also a problem as soon as you have extension to the arytenoid cartilage. And lastly, we heard Shamit talking about resurgery, but uh, when, you, when you're assessing for laser, uh, Keep in mind all the anatomical points I've told you about. And if you think you cannot get negative margins, please do not go ahead. Please do not fall back on second surgery or lasers or radiotherapy uh, and use your laser as a mean of debulking the tumor. It has extremely poor local control rates and high failure rates. So do not do laser surgery if you're going to get positive margins, either because of poor anatomical constraints or because of extensive tumor, which is involving the posterior paraglottic space or close to the retinoid or anterior commission involvement where you cannot uh, get good margin. So be, be careful in these anatomical areas as you, as you go on uh, in, in your journey with uh, laser surgery. Finally, let's come to the uh, classification. Uh, so you, as all of you must have read, there are uh, six types now. This is the earlier classification, which uh, looked at five types of uh, uh, chordectomies. And you, you need this classification. I urge all of you to uh, do your laser surgeries and record what type of cordectomy because it helps us keep our record better. It helps us uh, share our results and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, know what complications occur with what extent of surgery. So you have a type one surgery, which is uh, just superficial excision. You can see the ligament there uh, intact, uh, ex excellent voice outcomes and, and must be the uh, modality of choice. Uh, if you ask me, this is the absolute indication for laser surgery. I would never give this patient uh, radiation therapy. It's absolutely an overkill. As you go deeper, uh, you go th uh, to the ligament and uh, you can see the muscle there. So this is uh, type 2 cordectomy. Uh, type 3 goes transmuscular where you take a part, bit of the muscle out. Type 4 will go right up to the thyroid cartilage where the entire muscle uh, is, is resected. And type 5 is divided into A, B, C, D depending on how much you resect of the either in the anterior commissure, so you go to the opposite cord, or you come back and dissect the arytenoid, that's 4B or 5B. If you go into supraglottis uh, uh, encompassing ventricular fold, then it is uh, type C. And if you go into the subglottis, it is type D. Now, as we heard from the previous speakers, anterior commissure is, a, is an area by itself, uh, which um, pertains to poorer survival, um, uh, anatomical uh, suspension is different, and, and the outcomes are completely different than uh, the tumors that we just spoke about. So if you have a just superficial lesion, which is crossing to the opposite side, you do a type 5A resection, that is different from doing a complete anterior commercial resection. And that is why uh, this was recognized. And now your uh, uh, anterior commercial uh, excision is called as a type 6 protective. Coming to the supraglottis, yes, there is a classification um, uh, by the European uh, uh, organization. Again, uh, as they did it for the glottis, they also did it for the supraglottis. But again, the point I'm telling you, is to remember, do not forget to address the lymph node in the supraglottic tumor. 
So we have uh, uh, four classifications of supraglottic tumors. The type one is superficial tumors of the epiglottis, AE fold ventricle, requiring limited excisions of these tumors. So small tumors, type one excision. Type two is called as the medial supraglottic laryngectomy, uh, where you do not excise, you just get into the epiglottic space, but do not clear the periepiglottic space. So tumor of the superhyoid epiglottis, uh, wide excision done with just getting into the preepiglottic space. Uh, type 2B is uh, medial supraglottic uh, with complete epiglottic excision. So these are infrahyoid tumors where you need to excise the entire epiglottis, but these are early tumors, and hence you do not require to excise the entire preepiglottic space. The moment you have to go right up to the thyroid, come down along the thyrohyoid membrane into the thyroid cartilage and take the entire uh, preepiglottic space, it becomes a type 3A chordectomy for an infrahyoid epiglottic tumor. It's called the medial supraglottic laryngectomy in the dissection of the preepiglottic space. When, when you um, include the ventricle for such a tumor, a slightly larger tumor, where the excision is the same, but you include the ventricle, uh, it is called as a type 3B, uh, uh, called uh, supraglottic laryngectomy. Type 4 uh, is uh, 4AB uh, lateral. It is called the lateral supraglottic laryngectomy. And now, including the three folds areas, three folds meaning the free edge of the epiglottis, the B fold, or the A fold. So, you say one of these areas it uh, is type 4A uh, lateral supraglottic laryngectomy. Uh, and if you involve the arytenoid in this excision, it becomes type 4B. So, you have a classification. So, we've, we've talked about the anatomy. Uh, the constraints of the anatomy and how you select your patients depending on the anatomy uh, for laser surgery and, and when you will select radiotherapy or uh, open partial laryngectomy depending on the anatomical constraints. So in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, knowledge of anatomy and biology is paramount for laser surgery. Just because you have a laser, don't rush in and you see a small tumor or tumor sitting there where you think you can excise it, don't rush it with the laser. You must know anatomy, you must know your biology well and you must know how to give the treatment as a package and not only excision of the tumor. Exposure is the key. Adequate training in laser surgery is a must. That is That holds true for any surgery, in fact, but, but more so for endoscopic surgery because the anatomy is a little, a little different. And uh, we need to uh, always record our excisions uh, depending on the uh, European classification that is told to us. It will help us uh, come out with uh, our, our results in, in a better way and, and to uh, calculate our complications uh, in a better way. So thank you so much. Uh, glad if there are any questions. Otherwise, we can move on to the next topic. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, we will take the questions to the end because uh, sure. uh, we're overshooting the time as well. And yeah. uh, you put it up very comprehensively as well, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, so the next talk uh, would be by Dr. Deepak Balasubramanyam, who will be talking on surgical versus non-surgical organ preservation strategies for early laryngeal cancer. Uh, is the screen, uh, the PowerPoint visible to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. So at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers to, um, for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. And I must say that uh, Prof. Peretti, uh, uh, Karsten, and Shramit have actually done a lot of what I should be doing. And it's really difficult to assert them, uh, their presentations. But I would try to repeat the, the data from a, a different point of view. Uh, so that you might take the message. Uh, repetition is always good for us to remember. So the topic that I was given was surgical versus non-surgical organ preservation strategies for early laryngeal cancers. What are the limitations and potentials? Now, the, uh, the initial, uh, the whole thought process of treating a laryngeal cancer, there's dogma and there's dilemma. The dogma was the traditional T1 and T2 laryngeal cancers were managed with EBRT with excellent results, you know control rates of more than 95%. And uh, we, the vertical and horizontal dimensions of radiation are very precise now. Uh, the patients don't have that many radiation related side effects because most of the radiation is narrow field radiation. And in the era of open partial laryngectomies, radiotherapy gave better voice results. And there was always an availability of trained radiation oncologists and facilities, which drove patients more uh, towards radiation for T1, T2 laryngeal tumors. But the dilemma is that in the last two decades, there are huge improvements in instrumentation and understanding you know, the, the, the laser, the, how it works, understanding of the, the prognostic uh, factors in laryngeal carcinomas. And there are several issues that are to be contested. 
So the issues are, does surgery compromise outcomes? Does surgery compromise voice? Does RT compromise outcomes? And do we have head-to-head -head comparisons? And how robust is meta-analysis data or systematic review data that has been published so far? So the important thing that I want all the trainees to remember is that we as surgeons must rely on the critical appraisal of non-randomized studies with variable patient populations, cancer staging and outcomes. Not all T1 laryngeal carcinomas are the same. Not all T2 laryngeal carcinomas are the same. So it's very uh, easy to get carried away by one particular paper or publication. So we must be very critical on the appraisal of the data that is available and also critical of our own abilities in performing such uh, you know, uh, surgeries, which require a lot of technical finesse. And so we have to uh, remember this fact before we go in and start assessing literature. So early glottic cancers, as you all know, there's no lymphatic metastasis. Uh, uh, there is no involvement of the paraglottic space. But when you come to a T2 and a T3 lesion, the differences are always very subjective. And as we go to the higher forms of uh, glottic cancers, they become relatively radio resistant to organ preservation. Uh, supraglottic cancers, as uh, uh, Devendra sir had mentioned, higher chances of occult metastasis, higher uh, chances of involvement of the marginal zone and the piriform sinus, uh, occult preepiglottic space involvement, and easily upstaged to stage three by nodal status, and hence patients would require adjuvant treatment. Now, the important thing that uh, you should remember is that if radiotherapy is employed as the primary treatment for an early uh, laryngeal cancer, further surgical salvage is left to a total laryngectomy. That is in more than 70% of patients. Whereas if TLM is employed, deeper resections lead to an inferior uh, voice and potential areas of pre-malignant lesions are missed in the surgical excision. So the first logic is what is given by surgeons who propose TLM. And the second logic is what is given by patient oncologists who propose radiation for early uh, tumors. So there's always a trade-off between which uh, treatment modality uh, that we select. Uh, but you should remember that the anterior commissure is still a negative prognostic factor for radiation. And always remember that a T1 TLM and a T2 TLM have totally different voice outcomes. So what are the, the uh, risk factors for failure of early glottic cancers after radiation? Uh, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis published in uh, 2016 by Ferris's group. Uh, there was a higher risk of failure after radiation in male patients. Uh, patients who had T2 glottic tumors, uh, patients who had anterior commissure involvement, patients who had bulky tumors, and patients who had a poorly differentiated tumor. So not all uh, early laryngeal carcinomas or early glottic carcinomas will respond favorably towards uh, radiation. These are some of the risk factors that a meta-analysis has thrown out, which indicate that these patients might, do, uh, might not do so well uh, following radiation. So what are the questions that we need to ask ourselves? Uh, the T1 lesions, what is the results between RT versus TLM? T2 uh, lesions, RT versus TLM. Anterior commissure lesions, radiation versus TLM. What do we do for radio resistant tumors? And what are the measurable oncological and voice outcomes? And when are which, and which ones are uh, relevant uh, for measurement? So the current endpoints which are important are local control, disease specific survival, laryngeal preservation rate, and as a functional assessment of the patient's voice after treatment, we always look at the voice handicap index. And what is the trade-off here? The general consensus is that there is better voice with radiation, and by literature we know now that there is better organ preservation with surgery. So uh, you have to remember these points before you venture out and try and treat the patient. Now, this was the, uh, the types of codectomy as Devendra sir had pointed out earlier. It was uh, updated in 2007. And as we go down the types of codectomy, you're going to end up obviously with poorer voice outcomes. So when don't you consider uh, TLM in a T1 uh, glottic or laryngeal lesion? Obviously, when there is inadequate laryngeal exposure, when there is significant anterior commissure involvement in the craniocaudal direction, when there's infiltration of the paraglottic space with arytenoid fixation, meaning the posterior paraglottis is involved, 
or when there is massive involvement of the pre-epiglottic space and there are signs of laryngeal framework erosion. So uh, Shamit uh, showed this slide and I'm just repeating uh, what has been published. There have been several meta-analyses for treatment outcomes and most of them have shown that the, the survival and control rates are quite similar between uh, radiation versus TLM. Uh, but TLM probably has better laryngeal preservation rates in the, in the long term. But these are all heterogeneous group of patients. You have different types of T1s, you have different types of T2s. So it's very difficult to make uh, you know, uh, a, a right choice by looking at all of these meta-analyses that have been published. So this is one of the most uh, recent meta-analyses that was published for T1 glottis. Um, uh, by Rigby from Canada is most recent, most comprehensive probably. 16 studies were included. And when you treat a patient with T1 glottis, with TLM, uh, they are six times more likely to preserve their larynx than patients who are treated with radiation. So if you have a T1 glottic tumor, your laryngeal preservation rates are very high compared to patients who are treated with radiation for T1 glottic tumors. And this was another SEER database analysis, which had propensity matching. And uh, they looked specifically at T1 uh, uh, tumors. They found out that patients who had T1A tumors, patients who had well-differentiated tumors, and patients who, had, uh, who were less than 60 years of age, they all did better with TLM. And this was done as a propensity matching for patients who are T1 to T2, N0, M0, laryngeal carcinomas. So again, uh, you have another you know, population-based analysis which says that younger patients uh, with T1A tumors do better with uh, TLM compared to radiation therapy. The anterior commissure is always an area of contention. You must remember that the cure rates with patients who have anterior commissure disease is poor even with radiation. And these are just some of the uh, papers that have been published looking specifically at anterior commission involvement uh, and being treated with radiation. And all of them have said that the anterior commission is a poor prognostic factor when you treat patients with early laryngeal carcinomas. And uh, if you look at the uh, endoscopic treatment uh, of patients who have early glottic cancers and who have anterior commission involvement, and this was 153 patients with anterior commission involvement, a paper published from Germany, from uh, Steiner's group, their ultimate local control rates were still quite good with patients who have uh, anterior commission involvement. Now, you must remember that these anterior commission tumors are contained anterior commissions. That is, they don't have significant cranial or caudal extension. Uh, there is no measurement or there is no number that has been added to it. I think it just comes by experience to decide which is significant or not. But looking at this uh, paper and the subsequent other papers that I will show you, uh, if you have the expertise and if you have a, a patient who's got a limited anterior commissure uh, tumor, uh, you might well venture out into TLM and you might get good ultimate local control uh, rates, whether the anterior commissure has been involved or not. And this is another paper by, by Hoffman, uh, where they found that the patients, and this was a, a big group as well, a big study group, and they found that the laryngeal preservation rate in patients that didn't have uh, anterior commission involvement was 100% at five years, and it dropped to 91% at five years. So it is slightly less, but this number is better than the other retrospective series that have been presented and published uh, with patients treated by radiation for anterior commission tumors. So one of the largest uh, uh, papers or series that have been published is by Prof uh, Professor Peretti's group, uh, where they had looked at over 500, close to 600 patients. And in their group as well, if you look at the uh, patients who had anterior commission involvement, uh, they had really good uh, local regional control rates. They had uh, good uh, five-year organ preservation and uh, they, are, they, they were able to control the disease with anterior commission involvement as well. But again, this requ requires a lot of expertise and finesse. And I guess this is not something that a beginner should do. But uh, it makes a strong point for trying to push for uh, TLM uh, for anterior commissure disease compared to that for radiotherapy. So uh, what do you, uh, when you have a, a radiation failure versus a TLM failure, uh, it's not just a question of uh, whether you're able to preserve the larynx or not. Uh, we know that if you have a TLM failure, 
you can always go back and redo a laser for the patient and still preserve the larynx. But if you have a radiation failure, it also affects the overall survival of the patient. And this was published in Laryngoscope in 2019. Uh, so the RT fail group showed worse post uh, recurrence overall survival and disease specific survival compared to the TLM uh, patients. And they also had a higher rate of complications following the surgery. And they also had a higher rate of second local regional recurrences. So we're not talking only about preserving the larynx by redoing a TLM. We're also talking about patients who develop a recurrence after uh, treatment with uh, radiation. They have a worse uh, overall survival, uh, you know, disease prognosis compared to patients who have failed prior TLMs. Now, this is all for T1 tumors, but uh, T1B is a different category altogether. So do they behave any differently compared to the T1A and T1B tumors? Is there any difference between T1A and T1B tumors? So this is a systematic review uh, published by O'Hara in, in uh, JLO. And they looked at 36 publications. And it's very difficult to specifically study T1B because most of the papers include T1A and T1B together uh, in their entire publication. So this was the paper that I had seen or found out that where they had specifically looked at T1B tumors and they uh, had analyzed 36 publications and they only found that there was a trend towards better control by radiation. And this was not statistically significant because of the fewer events that were reported. So a T1B tumor may not behave the same way as a T1A tumor, but we need more comparisons and more robust data uh, to be sure of that. Now, T2 glottis is a difficult site to treat. Uh, there are unfavorable uh, T2 glottic tumors, uh, which are usually endophytic, uh, clinically without subglottic extension, the ones which have impaired cord mobility, uh, and that suggests subtle lateral paraglottic sp uh, spread. T2 uh, glottic tumors can be understaged, and that can be a, a potential problem. And ASCO has actually given a criteria for unfavorable T2 tumors. And this is basically you have an un, uh, impaired, the same thing what I mentioned in the previous slide. If you have impaired cord mobility or an endophytic tumor, and uh, if you have tumors which have extensive involvement of the area epiglottic space or occult invasion into the pre epiglottic space, all of them become unfavorable T2 tumors. So, clinical and radiological assessment of a T2 tumor is important before you venture out. Uh, into you know, treating a T2 patient with an organ preservation surgical modality. Now, the cord mobility is a very important uh, prognostic factor in T2 glottic carcinoma. So if you have an impaired uh, vocal cord mobility, that is a T2B lesion, they have a you know, poorer five-year local control. And uh, the, the ultimate control after salvage surgeries showed better outcomes for T2A lesions versus T2B lesions. So Again, the importance of posterior paraglottic space involvement and vocal cord uh, impairment, uh, these are all uh, important adverse prognostic features for uh, you know, T2 glottic tumors. So um, the, if you give radiation for a T2 glottic tumor, uh, what are your results? So overall, the literature for you know, radiation for T2 glottic tumors isn't very great. I mean, the T2 glottic tumors generally have uh, less, uh, you know, the, their outcomes are less uh, uh, poorer compared to the T1 glottic tumors. They're in the ranges of 70 to 85 at five years. And the vertical involvement of the anterior commissure on imaging uh, was again a significant factor on the local control. Uh, but what happens if you try to treat a T2 glottic tumor uh, with uh, transoral laser microsurgery? And uh, this was a systematic review of literature. I think Shamit already had shown that. And patients who had T2A lesions uh, had you know, better, uh, uh, you know, better cure rates and better laryngeal preservation uh, compared to patients who had, uh, had radiation treatment. Again, um, this, is, this paper is quite nice because it separates T2A and, uh, in, and uh, T2B. Uh, so TLM does overall for a T2 tumor uh, function uh, give better uh, laryngeal preservation rates compared to patients who've been treated by radiation uh, for these tumors. Now, the important thing is you have done the TLM or you've given the patient radiotherapy, you have to have an objective assessment of how the patient functions following your 
uh, treatment, uh, you know, your treatment uh, decision. It could be radiation, it could be laser. And treat voice analysis is a multi-dimensional uh, uh, concept. So you've got acoustic analysis, you have perceptual analysis, you have patient reported outcomes, and you have the voice handicap index. And the most important aspect in the evaluation of treatment effects is the patient's own perspective. And that's what we need to remember. So the big question is, uh, what are the most relevant endpoints for voice? And when does the healing complete for you to make a, a good assessment of the voice? And uh, uh, what are the things that you evaluate uh, during that voice uh, assessment? So there have been meta-analysis of voice outcomes and uh, most of them have used you know, uh, jitter, shimmer and uh, maximum phonation times. And uh, the, the, probably the most significant one is the voice handicap index because it's a patient reported subjective, you know, subjective outcome uh, given by the patient itself. It has uh, different domains, has a physical domain, an emotional domain and a psychological domain. And Grolich uh, in his 2005 meta-analysis showed that there was no difference in voice handicap index uh, for T1 lesions. We don't know about the uh, T2 lesions specifically. And this is one of the most recent meta-analysis published in 2019. And again, they are all over the place about jitter, shimmer, uh, noise to harmonic ratios and things like that. And they concluded that RT might lead to superior voice quality than laser surgery in early glottic cancer. But unfortunately, there is no data on T1 or T2 or the site. There was no data on the type of cordectomy and there was no data on the type of radiation uh, doses. So uh, again, voice outcomes are difficult to, to you know, measure. But one thing that you should remember is that as you uh, give the patient time, as the, uh, the, the, the cordectomy or the laser resection heals, patients, uh, the voice generally tends to improve at the end of the year. So these are, this is a paper where they published uh, uh, the uh, voice outcomes after type three or bilateral type two for T1, T2 glottic carcinoma. So they're not small resections published in Head Neck in 2019. Uh, the lower the VHI score, the better the uh, patients had a mild impairment on their VHI. And the majority of the voice parameters showed an improvement in the mean score at one year post-op. So I guess when, uh, once you venture into doing TLM for a patient, you have to give it sufficient time for the, uh, for the resection to heal. And then a year would be the right time you can expect the patient's voice to come back to an acceptable level. And there are different reasons on factors which affect uh, uh, voice outcomes after TLM. And probably the most important is the depth of it and the extent of resection. Uh, if you obviously resect the vocal ligament or the vocalis, you're gonna have a worse voice outcome. Uh, patients who have very high expectations might have uh, you know, feel left uh, down after the operation or their voice might uh, seem inferior. And patients who have uh, an anterior web, if the anterior commissure has been resected, or if patients have a prominent ventricular movement following the resection, all of these factors contribute to an impaired voice outcome following uh, you know, transoral laser microsurgery. So if you have a T1 glottic tumor without anterior commissure, if the patient is young, a male patient with no habits, he has some degree of pretreatment voice change, it's a mid-cord lesion, there is limited mucosal or submucosal disease, you do a type 1 or type 2 cordectomy. And the rationale is that the oncological outcomes are better, voice outcomes are comparable, and you have better uh, laryngeal preservation rates. If you have a T1 glottic tumor with limited anterior commissure involvement uh, and you have sufficient expertise, a young patient, male gender, no significant cranial cordal extension of the anterior commissure, only one cord is involved, some degree of pretreatment voice change, then you can venture into doing a type 6 cordectomy. And the rationale would be the oncological outcomes are better with some of the papers that have been published. And scarring and web formation is the same with TLM or if you give the patient radiation. If you have a T1B glottis tumor without anterior commissure, the same factors, young male patient, no habits, some degree of pretreatment voice change, mid-cord lesion, limited mucosal or submucosal disease. Again, the uh, evidence is not very clear, uh, but you can either do a cordectomy or an EBRT, and that can be decided in the multidisciplinary tumor board and after discussing with the patient. 
if you have a T2 glottic, uh, uh, T2A glottic cancer, uh, and there is obviously no cord immobility, meaning there's no paraglottic spread. If it's a favorable tumor as per the ASCO criteria, then you can do a cordectomy because the systematic reviews indicate better oncological outcomes, voice outcomes are comparable and laryngeal preservation rates are better. If the cord is restricted, uh, you can do an extended cordectomy or EBRT, but there is no level one evidence, nor are there any head-to-head -head comparisons that uh, give you differing opinions. The outcomes are probably similar and these are bad tumors and may be understaged if you're not very careful. Uh, just a slide on the T1, T2 supraglottic tumors. If you have a young patient with good lung reserve and it has the ability to tolerate minimal aspiration, and if it's a favorable tumor, limited tumors, not involving the infrahyoid epiglottis or the arachnoids, and then there are no nodes, you can either do a, a TLM supraglottectomy or an open partial laryngectomy, a bilateral neck dissection, or you can give the patient radical RT. So uh, you have uh, systematic review data for both. But if the patient has an unfavorable uh, you know, uh, uh, presentation, that is, the arytenoids are involved, the infrahyoid epiglottis is involved, there are multiple nodes, uh, then there's really no clear answer. Most of these patients will undergo an open partial laryngectomy. They might undergo bilateral neck dissection if surgery is considered, and it's very difficult to avoid adjuvant treatment, or the patients might just go in for organ preservation, chemo radiation. So in conclusion, unfortunately, there is no level one evidence to suggest one modality is better over the other. As more research is being published, it is clear that T1A, T2A tumors can be treated safely with TLM. T1B tumors and T2B tumors may also benefit from TLM because failures can be managed with further organ preservation modalities. Supraglottic tumors have to be favorable for excision. TLM increases organ preservation and survival when used as the initial treatment modality. Voice analysis with the VHI shows comparable outcomes if measured at the end of a year. And voice outcomes depend on multitude of factors and cannot be generalized to all patients treated. Uh, thank you for your time. And, uh, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions now or later at the end of the session. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Deepak. We will be taking the questions to the end. Uh, now move on to the next talk uh, by uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Novakovic. Uh, laryngologist and he'll be talking on the principles of rehabilitation after the transoral laser microsurgery for early glottic carcinoma. What to you, Sam? Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak, uh, Professor Akshay and Dr. Anand and the rest of the faculty. Um, so I think it's quite clear uh, that we see some advantages uh, when we're using transoral laser microsurgery and uh, I think the, the last speaker the excellent talk outlining uh, the pros and cons of each compared to radiotherapy. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is not whether you should do radiotherapy or surgery, but how do we optimize uh, outcomes, voice outcomes, and how do we rehabilitate the functions that may be lost uh, after transoral laser microsurgery for specifically for early glottic cancer. And I'd like to uh, also thank my fellow, Dr. Meet Chetan Sheth, uh, who's from Christian Medical College in Valor for helping me prepare the talk. So uh, this is a quick overview of the talk. I won't keep you too late. It's been a, a long day and an excellent meeting. Uh, but basically uh, the primary cure, as we know, for treatment of laryngeal cancer is cure. And the secondary goals are to minimise the morbidity of treatment, maximise quality of life and preserve normal functions. Uh, what are these functions that we want to preserve? Well, the larynx transmits air to the lungs, protects the airway during swallow, produces voice, and, and also helps with cough and valsalva. Just a quick review of laryngeal function. The vocal folds are V-shaped. They open and let air in, close to protect the airway and vibrate. And we already got an excellent talk on the anatomy uh, that talked about uh, the mucosal wave, which relies on the pliable superficial layer of the lamina propria. We also need glottal closure, so the vocal folds must come together in the midline. Once again, a cartoon, uh, once again, looking at the mucosal wave and the glottal cycle. So what are the potential effects of transoral laser microsurgery? Uh, number one, 
we can have impaired vibration uh, physiologically with anything above a type one cordectomy or including. Number two, impaired closure. Uh, so we can have a volume defect uh, with a, usually not with the type one, but a type two to three cordectomy plus. Uh, airway stenosis is a risk with bilateral disease or what, what we know now as a type six cordectomy. Uh, we only really see dysphagia when there are large defects um, uh, when we're dealing with early glottic cancer. So how do we assess voice? Uh, there are a number of ways to do it, uh, both objectively. Uh, the problem with the objective assessments is the assessor severity does not always agree with the patient perception of voice problems. Um, acoustic analysis, jitter and shimmer, uh, they're quite useless if we don't have a type one signal. And a lot of the time uh, when we've got loss of vibration or, or glottal gap, uh, it's not relevant to an analysed jitter and shimmer uh, because we don't have a, a type one or two signal uh, and they're little relation to real world outcomes. Um, there's some newer measures such as Keptral peak, peak prominence, uh, CPP, that's more relevant and certainly harmonic noise ratio is a robust measure. Uh, but the functional assessment is always patient specific. Uh, we ask, can the patient perform the desired vocal tasks? Uh, are the vocal capabilities meeting the vocal demands? And this depends on the patient expectations. Uh, and for this, we can use voice specific quality life outcomes. Uh, I, we tend to use the VHI or the shortened VHI. Uh, what are the red flags for glottal insufficiency? Uh, is the larynx safe? So has the patient got an ineffectual cough? Is there aspiration, repeated chest infections? Can they have valsalva? All of these things would would mean that we may need to rehabilitate the laryngeal functions earlier rather than later and take an active intervention. Uh, so let's talk about vocal fold vibration. Uh, this is not a massive problem if the contralateral side is normal. So if we have one vibrating vocal fold and Professor Palm very beautifully just, uh, uh, demonstrated uh, where a neo cord can be formed on the resected tie, uh, side, uh, vibration is desirable, but it's not essential for normal voice. Uh, but if the contralateral side is abnormal, so if we've got bilateral disease, if we have contralateral scar, uh, if there are radiotherapy effects, uh, or if there's sulcus vocalis. And there was one interesting study uh, by Nakayama in 1994 that looked at laryngeal cancer specimens and 48% of them had some evidence of sulcus. So I think it, we need to be aware that the contralateral cord has to be normal. Um, otherwise, if we take out the normal vibratory cord, we won't have a normal voice. Uh, so when we look at surgical considerations about mucosal wave, once again, how deep is the lesion? Uh, we, I like to use stroboscopy uh, for early lesions to, to predict how deep we will have to resect. We still float the lesion prior to resection and palpate as was previously described. And, and thinking about how much tissue do we need to take, uh, depth versus margins. And our margins can be narrow in the glottis and elsewhere, uh, cure versus function, and what, what tools are best for the job. Um, Postoperatively, we can think about how do we modulate wound healing to prevent scar tissue and treat developing scar. And in my experience, if we're going to try and modulate this wound healing, uh, especially for a type one cordectomy, we have to do it within three months. Otherwise it's too late. Uh, choice of tool. We've been speaking about the CO2 laser here, which is a direct fire, fire or fiber laser, which is microscope coupled and absorbed by H2O. But we've also got um, here at, at our unit a significant experience in using angiolytic laser, uh, initially the green light, but now the blue light laser, which has uh, just been released in Europe and Australia, which is delivered by fiber and absorbed by hemoglobin uh, with, with some, some benefits over selective vascular ablation. Um, there's some evidence that it may improve healing. And certainly um, I personally have been using it for margin control, uh, uh, sometimes even after the use of uh, CO2 laser. Uh, so if we're using narrower margins and then using the angiolytic laser for margin control, uh, certainly some people are using it as a primary tool, especially on the east coast of the, the USA. Um, and there's some evidence that it can decrease fibroblast um, uh, deposition and, and, and improve um, wound healing outcomes. Let's talk about wound healing after phonosurgery. Uh, at three to five days, we have mucosalization. Seven days, we have new lamina propria being deposited. And at two months, we have this disorganized loss of collagen architecture. 
uh, and increasing collagen deposition and mature scar, which is irreversible by the three to six month mark. So when we're thinking about post-op wound healing, we want to think about how do we optimise the regeneration of the lamina propria and minimise scar tissue. Do we give voice rest and if so, how much? Do we give speech therapy? Uh, when do we start? How much do we give? And is there anything that we can give to modify the wound healing uh, in the post-operative period? Uh, and this is not just for malignant disease, but also as uh, 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 Professor Rafat was talking about, when you're using the laser uh, or, or any phono surgery in benign disease. Uh, so there's good evidence now that voice rest, uh, too much voice rest is bad, uh, but we think you do need some voice rest. Uh, three days is usually uh, to, to ensure enough mucosalization. And there was a nice paper comparing three days of voice rest plus speech therapy, showing it to have better uh, voice outcomes than seven days of voice rest. Um, at our unit, early referral for voice therapy uh, we think helps optimise wound healing. We get them to see the speech pathologist prior to the surgery so they can start on voice exercises approximately five to seven days uh, after we, we've done our surgery. Uh, one month is too late to start uh, uh, mucosal stretching exercises. Uh, there is some literature out of Japan on the use of um, antioxidants uh, to improve lamina propria regeneration in a... Um, uh, in a uh, uh, animal model, uh, so things like uh, uh, astaxanthin and there's some new antioxidants that uh, Harana's group is looking at. Um, I'll talk about steroids and certainly growth factors to look at lamina appropriate regeneration and treatment of scar tissue. And there are other methods uh, which we, with which we can treat scar tissue, including a Gray's mini thyrotomy. Um, and there's some work on angiolytic lasers in helping break up and soften scar tissue. And certainly we have some uh, personal experience uh, with that. Uh, so what's the role of vocal pulse steroid injections for wound healing? I think it's contra controversial intraoperatively, especially in cancer surgery. Uh, but it looks like there's possibly some positive effects, um, certainly in phono surgery, having some steroid around. Uh, there is uh, some evolving evidence for post-operative steroid injection um, and with some evidence that it can modulate wound healing and decrease collagen deposition in the post-operative period. And we've certainly been doing a lot more of this um, with the advent of office-based uh, procedural laryngology, uh, where we can give a, a transcutaneous steroid injection in the office. Uh, this is a little example of a patient who's um, a post-T1 resection, and we can see here, listen to see the voice. We've got quite a steep mucosal wave there. This is six weeks after surgery. This person's had speech therapy. Voice is not bad. One side's vibrating, uh, but I'm not happy with the stiffness here. We want to get that better. And this is an example of what we do in the office to improve that stiffness. Uh, this is an awake patient, trans thyrohyoid approach. We do lots of these um, for various reasons, for delivering drugs into the larynx, probably uh, do uh, you know three or four a week. Um, and this is an example of how we can expand the lamina propria with steroid. And this is the patient two or three weeks later with improvement in mucosal wave. So I think more data needs to be uh, collected, but uh, obviously, this can be a powerful and useful tool if we've got post-operative fibrosis. You can see nice there, the inspiratory maneuver. Um, so we'll move on to glottal insufficiency. For small defects, loss of vibration can cause glottal insufficiency. Uh, and the bigger the resection, the bigger the defect. Uh, and this can either be anteriorly in the vocal fold or posteriorly in the rhinoid region. Uh, vocal fold injection augmentation laryngoplasty is good for anterior gaps. Um, this is a paralysis, not a patient. Uh, there's different methods. Uh, we can either use hyaluronic acid, which is short term and resolvable, can be done under local. This is a calcium hydroxyl apatate injection, uh, and that's a medium term product, uh, but does cause a local reaction, uh, and it can be done under local anaesthetic. And I'll move on to talk about fat, uh, which is a medium term uh, res uh, agent. Um, which must be done under GA. Um, I think fat injection is a useful workhorse in laryngeal cancer surgery. 
uh, and there are different theories on when to when to inject. Certainly, uh, Dr. Paredes' uh, group has published a nice paper on injection of fat during uh, a transmuscular cordectomy. Um, and uh, another group of media has published on waiting for six months before injecting fat. Um, there are questions on if you use fat, how do you harvest it? Liposuction versus open harvest. How do you process it? Do we do we centrifuge or not? Which injection system do we use? And where do we inject? Um, certainly we, we're harvesting via low pressure liposuction uh, from the abdomen uh, using a very large, the largest bore um, liposuction cannula uh, is probably about four millimetres that we're using and using a 20 mil syringe uh, under low pressure, not a high pressure system. Uh, certainly not centrifuging. Um, I think it, it potentially can kill the cells, so we're just washing gently. Um, and this is the injection system that we like to use, which is a three mil syringe um, coupled to an injector system uh, to a needle. Uh, and we can get very accurate uh, low volume injections in multiple places to improve the uh, viability and survival of the fat rather than injecting into one place. Um, how much to inject? Generally about 30% uh, over injection um, is deemed uh, about right. And how long will it last? Well, that's a problem with fat is that it's anyone's guess. In some people we'll get three months, in some people we'll get one year, in some people it'll last forever and, uh, and we'll need to take some out. Uh, so the problem with fat is it's very, very variable, uh, but you can always put more in. For more complex reconstructions, certainly a framework surgery is a workhorse, so a type 1 thyroplasty anteriorly. Uh, for keystone defects, there's a nice paper out of Boston that um, talks about anterior commissure laryngoplasty and stepping back the thyroid cartilage. Uh, and certainly, uh, I think that's a useful tool to have. Uh, thinking about arytenoid uh, surgery posteriorly, I won't get into detail. Uh, and then thinking about alternative and novel reconstructions, depending upon the defect, and this should be um, should be custom made for the patient. Uh, what's the timing of a type 1 thyroplasty? Uh, normally we'd recommend 6 to 12 months uh, before considering a, a type 1 for a number of reasons. One, in that first six months we want to monitor recurrence. Uh, we want to allow for healing and assess the final defect. Uh, and also to minimise the extrusion risk and make sure we've got an adequate cover before putting an implant in there. Um, my preference is Gore-Tex for laryngeal cancer because it's more pliable uh, and less stiff and less likely to cause um, uh, a, a tear of the overlying mucosa. If we're going to use silicon, there's very soft ones that are, are better than the hard ones. Uh, we tend to prefer to uh, avoid titanium unless there's adequate tissue cover. Um, and I think you need to be aware that you need soft tissue cover um, for the implant to work. Uh, and if we don't have soft tissue cover, we can't put a foreign material such as Gore-Tex or silicon in there. And we need to create soft tissue cover by either putting fat in there earlier uh, or using local or regional flaps uh, under which we can do a final adjustment. This is an example of a complex case, something you may see after a vocal cord uh, extent, uh, type three cordectomy. We've got some severe scar tissue uh, and it's all stuck down to the uh, laterally to the uh, thyroid cartilage. Uh, here we've got a big issue because we can't put an implant in there. People have tried and it's failed, it's been spat. Uh, so we've gone on to do an external temporary parietal flap and we've brought this in, lifted the uh, mucosa and brought in a free flap via an external approach. And that's given us a, a nice uh, tissue cover um, to work with uh, so we can get better voice. Uh, this will shrink over time, we'll need to adjust it. Um, uh, this is a lady who had a, a, a non-typical um, laryngeal cancer, which was a spindle cell rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, which needed to be surgically uh, resected. And you see it's uh, the uh, arytenoid uh, unit that needs to be resected. Uh, she managed with a local resection, but obviously now we're dealing with a fairly large posterior uh, gap here. And that, that's very, very difficult to reconstruct. Um, uh, to reconstruct the voice uh, in that case. Uh, so we have to think about that on an individual basis. Um, so when do we refer for voice rehab? Uh, I think for voice, we should get the speech pathologist involved, preoperative voice assessment with recordings, uh, VHI and possibly stroboscopy if it's available. Um, 
try to do voice sparing treatment uh, and reassess if we're cured, um, we can go forward. If they're, if they're healed, uh, we can look, is the voice okay? And if not, look at uh, intervening. If they haven't healed yet, keep the speech therapy going until they've healed, because I think there is some benefit in doing that for the smaller defects uh, and get them involved early for um, to, to improve mucosal wave vibration. Um, we've, someone's briefly spoken about airway stenosis, and I think the risk here is when we're dealing with bilateral disease, extensive dysplasia and extensive resections across the anterior commissure. Uh, how do we prevent? We can either stage treatment, um, um, we can think about radiotherapy, um, uh, think about aggressive debridement in the post-operative period, uh, or putting a stent in at the time of surgery, as it was suggested. Uh, and every unit's got different opinions on endoscopic or open treatment. This is just an example of a case who had quite extensive T1B uh, and very, very superficial disease, but predictably uh, post-operatively uh, developed a web. Um, doesn't always happen. Um, and sometimes we can debride it in, in, in the office um, during the development. Uh, but this one developed a web. Uh, we went ahead and just uh, put a keel in. We we're going to have another look anyway at six weeks. We went back at six weeks. That was all granulation tissue. Here you can see the endoscopic uh, stent put in. And here we are uh, down the track with uh, what I think is a reasonable outcome after, after that type of extensive surgery and a reasonable mucosal wave. Let's see, go forward. Um, so I think in summary, there are many aspects of voice rehabilitation in transoral laser microsurgery. Um, we need to think about pre-treatment pre assessment and measurements, surgical planning, uh, careful tissue handling, optimization of wound healing, uh, with all of those tools that we have at our disposal and knowledge of the reconstructive options. I think that especially voice rehab needs to be considered in the treatment plan prior to surgery uh, and the aims uh, as part of our treatment is not just to cure the disease, but to think about preserving mucosal wave on at least one side, maintaining glottal competence and preventing airway stenosis. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, hope you can visit our beautiful city at some stage. Oh, thanks, uh, Professor. Thanks, Professor Novakovic. Sorry for keeping you waiting for such a long time. Now, I, I know it's almost like 9.50, 9.30 there. Uh, but it was, okay. uh, it was a wonderful talk uh, with some really good uh, principles uh, post-operative for rehabilitation. So just a couple of questions. Uh, one regarding the steroid injection. Do you recommend uh, to use steroid injection to all patient intraoperative after the uh, type 1 to type 3 cordectomy? Uh, that's one. I, I, think, I think the jury's still out on that. Um, I think you have to be careful about... Uh, you know, immunosuppression in locally with cancer and especially with papilloma. I think you have to be really be, a little bit careful about uh, the concept of immunosuppression. It probably doesn't have any negative effect in cancer. I'm a little bit more careful in papilloma about putting steroid in. Um, look, it's, I think it's a personal decision. I don't think we have enough data to suggest that it's the way to go, but there's certainly some animal data, I think in the dog, in the canine model, that shows uh, that having steroid around can have beneficial effects uh, in the shorter term. I think that the best time to give steroid is sort of at that six week mark, uh, if we're not healing on track. And if we're developing, you know, we've got it, we've probably got about 20 or 30 patients now where we've given them, you know, they're, they're struggling with the VHI's plateaued uh, at six weeks and we're, they're sort of struggling. We'll give them a steroid shot. And within, within three days, the voice just accelerates. And I think if you can modulate that wound healing, I think there's, there's certainly a potential role for thinking about a, a steroid injection at that at the second post-operative visit, which is normally around six weeks for us. Obviously, it, it's not going to be useful if... Yeah. Sorry? No, no, go ahead, Daniel. Um, so there's a question... Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll give that uh, just dexamethasone into the lamina propria, but not for it, it's not going to work for for more than a type two cordectomy. Right. 
So, Pai sir, you wanted to make some comment? Yeah, uh, Daniel, I wanted to know for the anterior commercial lesions after having undergone a type 5A or a type 6 cordectomy, how do you reduce the, the scar formation and web, webbing? Do you actually inject steroids in these conditions and uh, or is there any other way? Uh, can we actually remove the fibrin? Can we put in uh, any other tissue there? So there's a few things we can do. Um, uh, number one, uh, once again, I use the KCP laser extensively. So if we've done that sort of resection, I'll, I'll clean it up with the KCP laser. And, and anecdotally, I think we get less fibrosis. It, it doesn't prevent it, but I, anecdotally, I think we get less, it does modulate the fibroblast moving in. And certainly there's some work um, in the skin literature looking at angiolytic lasers and the way they affect wound healing. Uh, that's one thing. Certainly that, that's already in there not just acutely but we'll normally see them one to two weeks afterwards and see them more regularly than normal and if there's fibrin there at the anterior commissure we'll try and pick that off in the office um, under local anesthesia using a um, using some topical uh, and so you know transoral forceps or uh, we'll try to pick that off with the flexible forceps that's a nice way to do it or, or staging it uh, is the other consideration if we're dealing with sort of superficial disease but obviously that can't be done if we're dealing with you know, bulky anterior commissure disease. Um, but they're, they're options or, or going in and treating the web. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not a massive fan of putting a stent in there at the time of surgery uh, because I can't watch it afterwards. Um, I think if you plan to get it out at two weeks and have another look under GA, it's fair enough. Uh, but I do like to watch how it's healing. Um, but they're, they're the main ways and, and to sort of keep going with... Um, uh, trans thyroid steroid injections. I think it's a valuable way to sort of modulate wound healing and, and, and modulate the fibrotic process. But if you see the, if you see the uh, fibrin forming there, it, that's a good sign that you're going to get a web and, and either take them back to theatre to debride them or, or debride them in the office if you, if, you, if you have those skills. So I'll just share with you uh, our experience. Uh, where we have done these extensive resections and we have sort of bared, almost bared the cartilage at the anterior commissure. Uh, we do find very extensive uh, fibrosis developing, especially subglottis. And uh, over the last two years, we have taken the patients back in within seven to 10 days and removed the fibrin that has developed. And uh, we are in process of seeing how that will do, but off the top of my head, we find that the five, the, the scarring is very minimal, very flimsy. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that's the principle. If you can remove the fibrin, it's a great idea. Um, so, uh, I think that I think that's the, the exact same principle. Remove the fibrin, otherwise it'll it'll the far, the scarring will form. It's just a matter of accessibility to theatres and whether you do it in the theatres or the OR. But I think that's the way to go. Right. Um, Someone's asked here, do I have a protocol while planning voice rehabilitation prior to surgery? The protocol is finding out the patient needs, really talking them through when, when will they be able to get back to work? I mean, you, we know what type of surgery we're going to do. Um, what do we ascertain baseline voice prior to rehab? Once again, VHI, we do a standardized voice recording. Uh, we've got a standardized passage that we take, uh, take a recording of. Um, we do, um, We'll do a uh, maximal phonation time. We will do a harmonics to noise ratio. Uh, Capsule peak prominence is the main one we're doing now in terms of um, uh, voice analysis. Uh, so they're, they're the main the main three key things that our, our speech pathologists uh, have advised. Um, and a stroboscopy uh, is I always do as, as a baseline. And then we, we we're getting them to see the speech pathologist once before. Um, we'll get to see them one week later. This is for a type one or two cordectomy. Uh, and then they see them now by, they're doing it via Skype now, via Zoom remotely uh, on a weekly basis, uh, three or four times. And, and so that, that's the early protocol uh, to get uh, it stretching and to get mucosal pliability happening. Because there's some good evidence out of Wisconsin that you know getting, the, getting them moving with the right exercises can improve um, mucosal wave. And like I said, it's not super important um, if it's a person that doesn't need their voice professionally, but we deal with a lot of professional voice users 
um, and and we like to get both cords vibrating if we can. Right. So just an extension to the question of the anterior commissure defect. So if you place a silicone sheet or a stent in the anterior commissure, when do you recommend uh, to remove the stent? Uh, so to remove the stent, what do we do to it? Sorry, you just cut out the question. Sorry, what is the timing, timing to remove the silicone sheet if you place it at the uh, first time in the surgery? So if, if it's placed at the time of the surgery, um, so it depends when you need to go back tolerate stents well and they cough and splutter. Waiting more than two weeks is the granulation tissue then start managed as well. Uh, but there's an easy way to manage that and that's just with steroid injections. So that, um, but once again, to place the stent um, down the track, um, So I think Hello? Uh, I think Dan was facing some issues with his internet connection which he had mentioned earlier. Oh, is it? Okay. okay. Is he there with us, uh, Anand? Um, yeah, he's back now. Yeah. He's back. It's muted. Uh, yeah. Dan, you're muted. Apologies, I lost connection. The internet's bad here. Have we got? <laughs> have you got me now? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I lost connection. It's very bad internet here. Um, so there was a question about how long to leave the stent. Mucosalization is not complete by three days. It start. It's three to five days. So. You got to really leave it in there one to two weeks as a as a as a minimum. Right. So one more. There's and then it's a matter of a time. When do you take them back? And you know, uh, that's the hard part as well. Right. So you showed one interesting case where you used a temporoparietal free flap to augment the uh, paraglottis and the vocal cord. So yep. I mean, it's very interesting. So uh, what what was the uh, what made you to make that decision process of a free flap to augment the OP cord? Is it documented in literature of using a free flap to augment the uh, OP cord? We, so, I mean, we tend to, when we look at these patients, this is a patient that had had someone had had multiple goes at, at sort of reconstructing a defect. Uh, she'd had that tried to put Gore-Tex silicon, et cetera. And because there was no cover, uh, it was spat. And so when we, when we assess people, we assess them on a functional basis, not, not um, so what can we do there? We need to bring soft tissue in uh, or a free flap in. She, she actually um, had, uh, because of previous extrusion, had erosion of the thyroid cartilage. So we needed to bring a free flap down and then put, um, put a free rib graft on there. So it was a more complex reconstruction. Uh, but the, the theory there is that we need to, whether you bring a, a strap muscle in or, or something, you need to bring a tissue in before we can put an implant in there. Otherwise the implant will fail. Uh, and the free flaps seemed to work fairly well in her. Um, and uh, it did settle over time. She needed a further procedure over time, but um, you know, these things, uh, there's different options that we need to think about and it needs to be customized to the patient. Um, and we need to be happy that, that, that they, they're under control in terms of their cancer as well. I mean, this one was way down the track. Right. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Dan, for uh, staying so late and uh, contributing. It no, was no, my pleasure. Yeah. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Farooq. Uh, thanks, Karsten. I think Karsten is not there. Thanks, uh, uh, Professor Peretti, Francisco, and of course, uh, Pfizer, Chauka, sir, uh, Deepak Parikh, Rakesh Srivatsu, sir, Deepak, uh, uh, Shamit Chopra, sir. Everyone, it was a very, uh, a very uh, educative event for us. Uh, we have a lot of learnings, and it, this is definitely going to uh, encourage more postgraduates, more head and neck surgeons to take up uh, this uh, transoral laser surgery uh, and help our patients. Uh, any Dan, your final comments before we conclude? 
Uh, thank you for having us, and uh, it's been congratulations. Yeah, perfect. So thanks everyone. Uh, like Anand did a wonderful job uh, as usual, like just like the last time. So beautiful moderation. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, Bargo, uh, uh, who had uh, hosted this event, always in the back seat, uh, uh, doing job for us, uh, the, and the whole team, uh, our fellows, Shalini, and the whole team. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pai, sir. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Akshay, and uh, best wishes for the next one. Yeah, thank you. So we have a robotic, yeah. So before we finish, uh, just a reminder uh, about our robotic conference, uh, which is on the 19th of July and the 26th of July. So we have got uh, speakers from across the globe uh, to, uh, to uh, stick on to the ti uh, time zone variation. We have divided the session into two, two halves, that is morning between 10 to 12. We'll have speakers from Asia, Australia, <coughs> and India. And uh, the second half of the session that is between uh, uh, between uh, six to eight, uh, that will have speakers from uh, Canada, from uh, UK and the USA. So I would like to thank uh, Vidya Dharan uh, to really uh, my colleague and good friend during training. Uh, he is currently the, uh, the head and surgeon at Apollo Proton Cancer Center. And he has helped me a great way in uh, organizing this event along with our organizing team at uh, HCG. So thank you, uh, delegates. Please mark the calendar, uh, the 19th and the 26th, uh, two consecutive Sunday, end of the July. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, all the participants for uh, participating. And of course, uh, uh, my uh, my senior colleague, uh, Dr. Vishal Rao, Ravi Nair, uh, without this, without their support and encouragement, again, these events, events like this is not possible. I would uh, like to finally acknowledge uh, uh, Professor Vishal Rao and Professor Ravi Nair uh, and finally concluded. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, bye.